Well, Great. good afternoon and welcome to our 12.30 p.m. public portion of closed session of the September 10th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, council members will move to the courtyard <coughs> conference room for our closed session. I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Um, Myers is absent today. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to items on closed session? I see um, at least maybe one, if not more. Okay, so you'll have up to two minutes. Yeah, and we're also hoping that Alicia will uh, come from the Union of the Homeless, but we're plaintiffs in the case that you'll be discussing. Um, and uh, the Susie O'Hara and other city officials testified under oath in federal court that there was plenty of shelter for the people at Ross Camp to, uh, when there was a vote here to evict the people from Ross Camp. And I think everybody here would um, agree that those people did not have adequate shelter and are in fact found living in the doorways and the bushes and now it, um, on the main beach in Santa Cruz. So um, we are here to continue to offer the settlements that we've been attempting to uh, settle with the city. And um, uh, we've provided, and you have this uh, points here that we've given to the city attorney. These are similar to the same arguments we attempted to make twice at um, in settlement hearings at federal court. And, um, and we hope that you will enact on, on these uh, um, provisions here. And um, one of them is a city would provide a comprehensive list of all vacant city owned and city controlled and tax delinquent properties. And uh, this would be useful for finding uh, ways to house people. That, um, that the city will designate a transitional homeless encampment and safe RV and vehicle lot to be open no later than the start of the new year. And you can go through and read the rest of them. And, and, uh, and Alicia wanted me to make sure that, you know, when Justin voted to shut down um, Ross Camp, he wanted to see if the city staff was actually being honest about all the potential shelter spaces. And as we know, there are 60 spaces ultimately at um, 1220 River Street, which are desperately in need of showers and fresh water. And so that was the only, uh, ultimately the only space that was provided was for 60 of the up. several hundred residents of Ross Camp. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, other speakers? Council members, yeah, you have a copy of this, which I encourage you to look at closely. Uh, we've not been able to get the city attorney until, what, yesterday to even agree to any kind of meeting. But what I present to you is on behalf of a Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. Uh, we can no longer reach some of our members after the destruction of the Ross Camp, and I join with Food Not Bombs on these 13 points. They're fundamentally much needed reforms <coughs> long stalled here instead of damage claims for individual plaintiffs. I mean, if that's really what we want. We seek the obvious, fair treatment until shelter is available. Shelter, storage, potable water, laundry access. Your city attorney first went to court with false claims about available shelter. This drove Ross Camp residents out into the neighborhoods, the Greenbelt, the downtown, and as you just heard and have you seen, the main beach away from the sanitary facilities, away from community support, away from public visibility. This settlement is intended to forestall this problem in the future, and the future is upon us. Main beach encampments are now proposed for the whack-a-mole homeless removal plan tonight. Ross Camp refugees being back on the beach, and they are back on the beach, this is where some of them were last year at this time with nowhere to go. Lead plaintiff Desiree Quintero was there on the beach last week. Are you looking for a future lawsuit as this wretched process repeats itself? I don't think so. When you don't negotiate reasonably with people in serious need, they do what they need to do. In Santa Cruz, this means they sleep where they must, they shit where they must, and they sue when they must. We've given you 13 concerns Present yours, and let's talk. Are there any other members of the community who want to address the council? Okay. 
Just a question, what, what, yes, which one on our closed session agenda are they speaking to? Um, I think it's the Quintero mm -hmm. case. That's right, it's yep. Quintero pending remember. litigation. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so we'll, um, seeing no additional public comment, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting to our courtyard conference room. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 2.30 p.m. session of the September 10th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Crone. Here. Glover. Present. Myers will be absent. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cumming. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. If I could have our clerk please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. So we, before we begin our uh, meeting today, I'm going to ask that I um, call on our colleagues and those in attendance here with us to join me in observing a moment of silence to honor the victims of the Conception boat fire that occurred in Santa Barbara on September 2nd, as well as the innocent victims of the senseless attacks on September 11th in 2001. As I'm sure all of you know, the Conception boat fire hits close to our home in Santa Cruz and in our community. As we know, there were multiple residents from Santa Cruz on board. And so we will fly the flags at half staff today, tomorrow and Thursday to symbolize our community's care for the victims. And this moment of silence will be time for us to come together in thought, prayer, or reflection in an effort to keep the victims and their families in our thoughts and in our hearts. Thank you. All right. Yeah. It's been a difficult couple of weeks for our community in this way. So um, I appreciate those joining the moment of silence. At this time, we'll go ahead and move um, on to our agenda and we'll start with the introduction of new employees. And we have our director of libraries here with us, I believe, Susan Nimitz, to introduce her new employee. Hi, I'm Susan Nimitz, the director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. And I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Eric Howard. Eric is our new deputy director. He comes to us as, a, as an assistant director from Palo Alto and Salinas Public Libraries. So he has lots and lots of experience. Um, he's moving to Scotts Valley, we hope soon, because he's commuting from Pacific Grove and um, with his lovely wife and two four-year-old daughters. So we're so happy to have him on board. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to invite up now our Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel, to introduce his new employee. Good afternoon, come on up guys. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce three new employees. Um, to my left is Yurik Hines. Uh, he's a new parking attendant and actually was a part-time um, temporary employee that's, that has now an um, existing position. Uh, born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, and spent most of his late teens in New York City, 
until he joined the military. He currently lives in Scotts Valley for the last five years. Um, he's married and has a seven-year-old son and almost 11-year-old tuxedo cat. Um, uh, his past work experience includes he's uh, he's been with the city a bit over three years, and before that he was in finance, but banking, marketing, and advertising. Um, he's attended Carrillo College, has an AA, and he also has a bachelor's uh, in business from the University of Texas, uh, San Antonio. And let's see, when he's not working, he does mainly kid-related activities, uh, bike riding, treasure hunting on the beach with his son, with a metal detector, playing Minecraft, and also kids gym class, uh, lifting weights, and that type of thing. Um, any fun facts? Um, it's very possible many of you may have heard him on the radio or TV as he's done some voiceover work for the NBA and one of our local radio stations. So um, please join me in welcoming Yurik. Uh, next to Yurik is Daniel Gomez. Uh, Daniel's also a parking attendant, and um, he also was a temporary parking attendant and is now a regular employee. Uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz, uh, currently lives in Santa Cruz. He, he's single uh, with no kids. Um, what, what his um, past work experience, he used to be a co-owner with the Tampico Kitchen. So, um, so you may have recognized Daniel. I went to SoCal High. Uh, when he's not working, he enjoys golf and playing darts. And so yeah, the fun fact is grandparents actually started the Tampico Kitchen in the 50s by the boardwalk before they moved actually on Pacific Avenue. So um, it was handed down um, through generations and he, he and his sister were co-owners before um, it's, you know, before he sold, they sold the business. So um, please join me and welcome Daniel. <laughs> and next to Daniel is uh, Ryan Mong Monganetti. Okay. Um, he's actually, he's a, a new, let's see, wastewater operator three. Um, and he comes to us, um, he was born in Monterey, grew up in Hollister, and he currently lives in Prunedale. Uh, his girlfriend and he are expecting a baby girl in November, so he's gonna be a father. And they also have a house cat. Um, from, from 09 to 14, he worked in a small family-owned uh, wastewater treatment plant. And then from 2014 to 2019, he worked for the city of Soledad at their water reclamation treatment facility, which is great because we're getting ready to do tertiary water and recycled water at our wastewater plant. He attended San Benito High School in Hollister. And when he's not working, he enjoys eating out at restaurants and enjoying winter camping. And a fun fact is he enjoys reading Zen Buddhism books. So please meet, please join me in, in welcoming Ryan as well. Welcome everybody. Yurik, I feel like we need to hear something from you if we're gonna recognize your voice. I don't know, say hello maybe. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is, I did sound smart. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Okay, but last but certainly not least, we have, um, I think, okay, we have Miguel uh, Valencia to introduce his new employee from uh, the water distribution, superintendent of water distribution, welcome. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Miguel Valencia, Water Distribution Superintendent. I'm here to uh, introduce uh, David Tanashi. Um, he was hired as a water distribution operator in the water department. Uh, David was raised in Watsonville. He studied zoology at UCSB and then community ecology at SFSU. After his years of schooling and working, he's happy to call Santa Cruz home. He has always looked for a way to contribute to his local community and has worked in two connected yet different fields, biology and construction. His work experience has been in biology, education and construction. David utilizes his time in the splendor of natural surroundings, the forest, ocean and the beach. He spends his free time with his family, his friends outdoors in the garden or in the sand likes teaching his nieces and nephews and enjoying time with his wife who is a nurse at Dominican Hospital. Welcome David. Welcome David. Thank you. Well, welcome to all the new employees. So we're 
going to go ahead and switch now um, to our presentations. And our first presentation is going to be on the Sanctuary Exploration Center. And we'll invite up our presenters to uh, share with us. <laughs> Great. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chelsea Prindle. I'm the manager of the Sanctuary Exploration Center. I'm just going to go ahead and get my slides up as I present. Here we go. Great. Uh, so you, I, I know you all are aware, and at least I know I've personally uh, introduced most of you to the Sanctuary Exploration Center in the past. Uh, we're right across the street from the wharf. Um, we kind of like to explain that we are a kind of like a visitor center if you were go to, to go to a national park or a national forest, except our park is out underwater. It's the whole Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is a federally protected area of ocean that encompasses our entire Monterey Bay. We are the visitor center for that place. Uh, because of that, we are funded through the federal government, through NOAA. We um, are free admission, open Wednesday through Sunday. And I just wanted to kind of give you guys a heads up about what we've been up to, or a review of what we've been up to in the last seven years and what we're looking at doing um, coming this, this coming year. So just a reminder that um, the city of Santa Cruz did donate the land and still owns the building. We rent it for a dollar a year. It's a great deal. Um, and they originally, for the conception and design of the project, co-managed our grants and our projects to get it done. Um, there was a capital campaign with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation to fundraise $3 million to get all of the interior and the exhibits built. And currently, I mentioned it's funded through NOAA partially, basically for facility funds um, to kind of pay for our uh, utilities, if you will, as well as two full-time equivalent staff members. Everything else we do, we fundraise ourselves through our gift shop, our donations, grants, uh, facility rentals, um, in partnership with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation to do all the programming that I'm about to get to. Uh, so I mentioned we are one full-time and five part-time staff, so we're a very small staff, but that's uh, very productive. <laughs> um, and we really get everything done because we have 65 volunteer docents. So I, anytime I speak in front of anybody, I have to mention that our volunteers really carry the center um, from everything from working the front desk, working the gift shop, assisting with our field trips, and interpreting our exhibits to the roughly 78,000 visitors that we have a year. Um, we are almost, this year, we're going to pass <coughs> half a million visitors, which is pretty exciting. Uh, you can guess that most of our visitorship is in the months of July and August, and mostly is from people out of the area. Um, almost, this isn't a scientific study, but it seems like eight times out of ten when I'm talking to people in the community who are locals, they say, oh, I haven't been there yet. And we know that actually from our demographic surveys, that it is about 80% of the people that come in the summer have never been there before and are from out of the area. It's slightly less mm -hmm. in the off season because we have more locals. So what do we do? Um, we have a variety of public programs to help engage those local communities and get them down to the center across all age levels and varying interests. So we have a we weekly preschool story time that's very successful. Um, we do first Fridays. We do art, science, info nights and celebrations um, to try to Again, just get the local community involved in the center. We are just starting this year in partnership with the city, actually, a um, family science Saturday. So we're in the Parks and Rec Guide this fall for the first time, doing two of our field trip programs, which I'll talk about in a moment, for families or, or just general public who wants to sign up on Saturdays. So I'm, they're already at, not capacity, but they're going to run. They already have a minimum enrollment, and so I'm hoping that they're really successful and we can continue it year-round and add programs to it. Um, we also do deep-sea uh, discovery days. So whenever um, our researchers are out in the sanctuary <coughs> doing research and are able to have live interaction technology, we like to invite the community in and have them actually have an interaction with our researchers because we are a research organization as well as an education and resource protection agency. Um, so actually this fall we're doing that quite a bit in October and November. So if you get our newsletters, you'll get some information about ways that you can come and actually live chat with a scientist doing research in the canyon or doing research at Davis Museum. And then finally, really quickly, um, we do seasonal beach interpretive pop-ups. So basically where we bring <laughs> our exhibits out onto the wharf, onto the beach, or this summer we did it at weekly at the Dream Inn, which is really fun, to engage people um, when they're actually out enjoying the sanctuary. All right, finally, our education programs. Um, 
we've been building on this for the last couple years and this last school year, the 2018-2019 school year was, um, it wasn't our launch, but it was definitely our most successful full uh, array of programming that we've run so far. Um, you can see on the slides that we have various uh, different thematic field trip programs that are grade specific and aligned to California state standards. Last year, we um, reached approximately 50 classes or just under 1,500 students, which was really fantastic. Uh, those students get an overall overview of the sanctuary, they tour the Exploration Center, and then they do hands-on <coughs> field experience using real scientific tools, either on the beach or on the wharf. Um, and so we've had great feedback from our teachers. This last year, I've worked with um, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education to make that partnership with the teachers more formalized and make sure it's meeting their grade specific standards. And this next year we hope that um, we're able to expand that even more and, and get those classes and numbers up. Um, this is our one program, well not our one program, but it's our main program that really is reliant on outside grants and funding to help support the program coordination. And this last year, one of the reasons we were so successful is because we were able to get a $30,000 grant through the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, which um, Janae is gonna talk about in a second, and we hope to be able to continue partnerships, expand partnerships, and expand funding so that we can reach more local and regional students. That's it, do I have a minute for questions before I pass it off to Janae, or do you have any questions at the end? Uh, maybe we'll sit here from uh, Janae, sure. and then we'll say, see if there's any questions. Sure. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to be in front of you. Let me get my slide show up. And my name's Janae. <laughs> Janae Kelly, I'm the director of the new Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. So we are a new chapter. Nope. Um, yeah. And we are the nonprofit partner of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And, right, my job is to raise funds for the programs of the sanctuary and to create awareness and support for those protections that the sanctuary provides. You know, essentially, I'm, we're dedicated to preserving the long-term health of the National Marine Sanctuary. And what makes me excited about, you know, this local sanctuary is that we're on par with the Grand Canyon, with Yosemite, with Yellowstone. We have the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's as spectacular to this community <coughs> and to the country as any of those other parks. It's just less visible, right, because most of it's underwater. But I think it's yet another thing that our community gets to hold dear and be very proud of. Um, the reason we were able to get this sanctuary designated status is because it is such a special entity. And a lot of, for example, a lot of people don't know how large it is, right? So the sanctuary actually spans from Marin County all the way down to Cambria. So it spans five counties, two million residences, or residents. It has San Luis Obispo County, Monterey County, Santa Cruz, San Mateo, and Marin County. So it spans 276 miles of coastline. Uh, it, it averages out about 30 miles from the coast, and at its deepest, it goes down two miles. So that's part of what makes uh, this area so unique and why we got the sanctuary designation, is we have one of the largest underwater canyons on the planet, certainly in the, in the nation, um, right here in Monterey and in, in, in between Santa Cruz and Monterey County. And because of that, it's created all of this biodiversity. We call us the Serengeti of the sea. Uh, there are 36 species of marine mammals that call this place home, uh, 525 species of fish. We have extensive kelp forests, uh, ruggy rocket shores, sandy beaches, estuaries. It's a spectacular place. <laughs> And the reason we are, uh, the, the, the protections the sanctuary affords us is resource protections, research, education, and public use, which includes commercial fishing and recreation. And the journey, I'm sure many of you know, the journey to sanctuary protection started back in the 1970s. And this is a picture of our former US Congressman Sam Farr. Uh, there was a threat of oil drilling off of our shores, and in the 70s, Sam Farr, Dan Hafley, a group of very committed community members fought that tooth and nail and were able to uh, prevent oil derricks from, or oil dr drilling from happening off of our shores. And while they were very successful in the short term, it didn't, it didn't guarantee long-term protection. 
right? And so in 1992, uh, under the tutelage or the leadership of Secretary Leon Panetta, Sam Farr, Fred Keeley, Dan Hafley, they were able to ensure and get this sanctuary designation for this area, which means in perpetuity, there can be no oil drilling, no ocean dumping, no seabed mining in this area. So it's a fantastic accomplishment. And what's really exciting to me as the foundation is that all four of those gentlemen I just mentioned are on our board of directors now, along with Ted Balistrieri, who owns Cannery Row, um, and Hillary Bryant, our former Santa Cruz City Mayor, and Nova Covington. So we just have an all-star you know, board of directors who are very committed to the long-term health and welfare of our um, sanctuary. Oh, and one, one thing that, one story I like to Oops. to um, mention is this is an oil derrick off the coast of Santa Barbara. And I went to undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, as I'm sure there are many people here. And before we were allowed to go into the dorms, there was a bottle of paint thinner and some rags and a bucket. And we were instructed to use those to clear the tar off of our feet before we went into the dorms so we wouldn't stick that tar into the carpet. So it was just expected that when we walked up and down the beaches, those little blobs of oil and tar that got in your hair and your clothes on your feet was just a natural occurrence. And so, but for the sanctuary protection, we might be looking at that same sort of an environment. Um, Ted has the great quote about, we all love and look out at our shoreline and we all love the beauty and the splendor of it. And as he says, it's not that way by accident, right? It's that way because it's a sanctuary. Um, protected area. So some of the ways that the sanctuary <coughs> likes to protect, educate, and engage the public is through many of the programs that Chelsea just mentioned. We have education programs through the Sanctuary Exploration Center. Uh, we have two docent programs that right now we're kind of focused on raising funds for. Team Ocean, Baynet, they put docents out to greet the public, talk about the sanctuary, make sure they don't interfere with wildlife. Um, we also are raising funds very specifically for whale rescue, which is disentangling whales who get caught in the crab pot fishing lines and all the other fishing gear that's left in the waters. So we're doing a lot to train the rescuers, but also look at preventative me measures. Many, many programs that um, the, the sanctuary puts on that we're raising funds for. And we talked about fundraising. So there are many ways that the sanctuary, that the community can support the foundation to support the sanctuary. Um, you know, one of the ways is to volunteer. You can volunteer for to be a docent for one of the programs or volunteer for the foundation and help us put on events and it's a fun way to volunteer. Another way, way is to serve on our board of directors or on a committee. Um, to donate, we always like donations, that's great. And go to our website, there's easy ways to do that. You can host an event for us, make us a beneficiary. And then speaking of events, you can attend events. So I think you all have an invitation on your desk. We are starting with our first, our inaugural Sea Stars brunch. We're going to be, or the secretary and Miss Hillary Bryant will be providing um, awards for people and businesses in five different categories who have given back substantially to our, our sanctuary in the last year. It is on September 22nd at 10 in the morning in Marina at the Sanctuary Beach Resort. You'll have invitations there. We would love to have your uh, participation and attendance and please spread the word. Um, and there's another event that you might be interested in. It came about very quickly, but on our um, board, Sam Farr has a piece of property in Big Sur called Point 16, which may, maybe some of you have been to. It is one of the most beautiful places on the planet, overlooking the sanctuary. And we have a concert this Sunday um, with Alex Degrassi, who is a Grammy-nominated acoustic guitarist. So if you're interested, uh, go to the website, reach out, and I can get you more details. But we'd love your attendance, participation, and spread the word. And you know, we're so grateful to be a part of this community and to have this sanctuary. So thank you for your time. Do you have any questions for either one of us?
Well, I'll just say thank you so much for your presentation, but more importantly, thank you for all your work in protecting our incredible um, resource here in our, in our Monterey Bay. Um, wonderful opportunities ahead. We don't have a whole bunch of time for questions, but if there are any pressing questions from the council, I'll go ahead and see if we can have a few of those, but definitely encourage my colleagues and others to look into following up offline as well. Sure. Council Member Crone? Just wondering, um, I'm glad you're reaching out to the Dream Inn. Is there any... Um, reaching out to the boardwalk as well because there's such a presence down there. Have you been able to work with them on anything? Yeah, we have a bit. We um, Opportunistically, we will sometimes host their education program. Sometimes their schools have an education requirement for uh, schools in the spring who come to do basically a boardwalk trip and they have to have an education component. Uh, so occasionally we'll do that. They have a pretty strong partnership with the Marine Mammal Center who's currently doing that for them. But we have been working to um, to either have kids come visit the exploration center when they're at the boardwalk or have us come educate them a bit, not as much as we'd like. Yeah. Lots of opportunity. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful. So our next presentation is an Outstanding Recycling Program Award, and I'll go ahead and invite up Les Leslie O'Malley, who's going to be a uh, presenting and she's our interim wastewater reduction program manager. Hi, Leslie. Hi, thank you for having us. L really quick presentation, but I just had to show off this beautiful <laughs> nice award that we just um, received from the California Resource Recovery Association or CRRA. I'm here on behalf of our team from Waste Recovery and Outreach and Education. Um, as you recall, we've been upgrading and um, updating our outreach material over the last three years, even ahead of the national sword crisis. And so part of the recognition is that new outreach material, but also our um, recent Master Recycler Volunteer <laughs> Training Program. And um, I have a few members here. Raise your hands if you're here. Um, so we have quite an active um, group of volunteers volunteers that are stepping up and um, leveraging our team's ability to be out in the field and conduct outreach. Um, we've been tabling uh, on the weekends at the West Side Farmers Market in downtown. Um, so it's really helping our small staff to uh, leverage and get that message out there. And we are seeing a difference in um, waste reduction and a lessening of the contamination in our recycling stream. So we, we appreciate and we encourage your ongoing support. We'll be recruiting soon for the next cycle of the Master Recycler Volunteer Training Program to start February of 2020. Um, but I think we've moved beyond pilot and we're showing that it's a successful program. So beautiful award. So thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you to all the volunteers. I just want to personally uh, commend the department and all the volunteers. I have several friends who have gone through Master Recycling. They get into it like religious fervor. <laughs> Seriously. So you are making a big imprint. Good work. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we have our last presentation, which is um, our Health in All Policies Evaluation Quarterly Report. And uh, Dr. Tiffany West is here to lead us in this presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council Members. Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager, and the point staff person on the Health in All Policies Initiative. Um, I think we're bringing it up here in just a moment. I'm here today to give you uh, the quarterly report that we called out in our work plan. Uh, just to refresh your memory on this, uh, Health in All Policies is an initiative that touches upon the three pillars of equity, public health, and sustainability, and really recognizes that no one agency can do it alone, that local government decisions do indeed impact community well-being. And this is, this is a, a slide that you've seen previously. Um, there are five key elements to health and all policies, and I'm not gonna read these all, but they really, uh, it supports collaboration across sectors, it benefits multiple partners, um, and engages different stakeholders and helps us to break out of the silos that we often uh, work in. 
In terms of the work plan goal for the committee, uh, it's to develop a collaborative and coordinated process, both internally and externally, uh, for using these three pillars as lenses uh, in decision making, as well as in design of projects, programs, and uh, policies. That will ultimately result in improved community well being. So, really, here we're looking at what are the opportunities to institutionalize these concepts within cities day, the city's day to day business. So just to refresh you on the timeline, um, you did give direction uh, to the committee and staff uh, in October of last year to return with recommendations. In April of this year, you approved uh, the committee's work plan. Uh, over the summer, we began executing that work plan, which consisted of uh, conducting the mayor's listening session, which I'll tell you a bit more about, conducting research and having discussions with other jurisdictions, beginning to make uh, some of those partnerships and build relationships. Of course, today I'm giving you the quarterly update that was called out in the work plan. And what's ahead, we are working on the policy and implementation recommendations uh, with the committee. Uh, that will be in a report format that we will bring back to City Council in November. That will also include um, recommendations for staff training as well as metrics for us to monitor going forward. So in terms of the mayor's listening tour, the mayor has been busy this summer out and about uh, talking to folks. We've had two uh, community meetings uh, and we have two more in September. One of those meetings was in the Beach Flats community. Um, we'll be meeting with teens and seniors uh, later this month. We've also had four other uh, community, uh, I'm sorry, stakeholder meetings. Uh, we do have three more in September. We have a uh, community survey that is active through uh, September 18th, both in English and in Spanish, and have worked very closely with Beach Flats leaders in pumping that out to that community to ensure that we have um, a good diversity in responses. Um, and all in all, uh, and, and a city staff survey in which uh, about 18% of those that um, that were asked to respond responded. All in all, um, aside from the surveys through the meetings that we've had, we've reached close to 100 folks so far. And we are really checking back in with those folks by summarizing what we're hearing and making sure that we heard them correctly. And if we missed anything, we're giving them an opportunity to correct that. And if you're interested in what that looks like, we actually have summaries of all these meetings at the Health and All Policies website, which is under the city manager's office department. Okay, um, when we're in these meetings, we're really, uh, the mayor is talking about what is health and all policies, um, really opening that up, giving examples of how other jurisdictions have operationalized this. And she asked several questions about what is and what isn't working with respect to the three pillars, and also what's possible. So what things that are working, we're hearing back, so this is the majority of the groups have, have um, discussed or have highlighted these as things that are working as positive contributions to community well-being, and those include citywide jump bikes, as well as other active transportation, particularly bike uh, infrastructure, the green lanes, and so forth, access to organic, fresh produce as well as the health consciousness of the community is something that's working. And also a sense of innovation and open-mindedness, not only throughout the community, but with our community's leadership um, that leads to a better understanding of the three pillars. We also asked what's missing and what's possible. And really, we found that the themes that emerged from the uh, outreach so far really overlap in the answer to these questions. Folks said that obviously affordable housing uh, as, well, as well as childcare along with the lack of a living wage hinders our vision of community well-being. The, the uh, folks from downtown also perceive that there uh, is a lack of support of, of the businesses with respect to understanding what to do in the case of disasters, as well as active shooter situations, which is the first time that we had heard this. Um, they also are confused about enforcement of illicit activity in the downtown area. Um, we also are missing, and, and what's possible, is mental illness support systems and community support for immigration populations. 
Um, and then uh, we also heard that there is uh, a perceived lack of awareness of the severity of climate change and how the actions of the community are exacerbating and can help uh, our situation with climate change. Um, so again, these overlap in terms of what's missing and what's possible. Um, the most popular pr response in terms of what's possible is affordable housing, uh, followed by mental health outreach, increasing diversity awareness, and providing facilities for childcare. Um, it's also been mentioned that there are so many opportunities with UC Santa Cruz and other uh, institution, education institutions in terms of um, increasing our community well-being. So one, qu one question that we ask also is, in one word, what does successful community well-being look like? And some of the themes that have already come out in the other questions you see here, fed, thriving, resilient, uh, and resilient was given in the context of both climate change, but, but other uh, contexts as well. Safe, safety is a big theme that we're hearing. Participating, equitable, healthy, happy was something that was cited across all of the stakeholder groups and housed. Let's look at what uh, the staff survey said. I'm just really giving you a snapshot here. We have collected so much data, uh, but these were some things that stood out. We asked staff that responded, um, how, does the, how much uh, does the city focus on addressing equity, public health, and sustainability? The blue bar is, are the folks that responded the right amount or too much. The light green bar is not enough or no focus, and the dark green bar is no focus. So you can see it's, it's fairly close between the right amount and not enough of focus. So that tells us that there's really some opportunity here, as well as with respect to training. It was interested, interesting that only 76 folks of 125 employees who participated in the survey, so about 60%, actually answered this question. So those that answered the question, you see about 39% have been trained in equity, uh, about 41% in public health, and about 23% uh, in sustainability. So again, lots of opportunities that we're seeing uh, with our employees. There are also a number of free responses that, sh that were shared with us where we see that there's a lack of actually understanding about the framework and the three pillars. And in fact, employees who have responded to the free response questions are also confused the concept of fairness, treating people fairly and equally with equity. So we do see that also as an opportunity for training. Those are obviously not the same thing. Um, we are also preparing a gap analysis of policies, projects, and programs aligned with three, the three pillars. We have drawn from a number of policy documents, the employee survey, work plans, and so forth, and we're beginning to categorize those by city functions, uh, those efforts that align with the three pillars, and that's really gonna show us throughout our day-to-day uh, -day business, where are we, where do we have gaps in our use of these lenses? And something that you will be very interested in when we bring this back is we're starting to evaluate implementation options, policy, process, and training opportunities. So along the left-hand side, this is of course in progress, you'll see a number of things that have been mentioned in previous uh, times that we've been in front of you, uh, City Council, as well as other best practices that we're seeing in other communities in terms of how we can operationalize uh, health and all policies here at the city. And you see some criteria across the top, and so we're beginning to work with the committee on how do we evaluate evaluate these opportunities and then rank them so that we can come to you with some recommendations that are based on data. With that, uh, this is the last slide. Um, we also have spoken to a number of folks in the communities who are really excited to partner us with us on this endeavor. Uh, for example, the County Health Services Agency Director has indicated her support and commitment to facilitate and convene around health and all policies issues, which is 
um, a movement forward for the county. And indeed, the city of Watsonville is watching what we're doing and are about they are about ready to pursue development of high up at their city as well. And they're looking at this process that we're in right now to try to replicate it. The last thing I'll say is that in the state of California, uh, just this fiscal year, uh, Governor Newsom in a historic decision, uh, the California state budget, in the California state budget has established three health and all policies positions at the cabinet level and has provided funding to the California Strategic Growth Council to promote healthy communities, uh, racial equity and environmental sustainability across state government and within the programs that uh, the uh, Strategic Growth Council funds. And with that, um, we are finishing listening tour this month, completing the evaluation report. Again, we're gonna come to you with policy and process recommendations in November, and then we'll start training and implementation in the new year. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have on this presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> this makes me really happy, and I just wanna applaud and recognize just the incredible work that's coming out of your division and under your leadership, Tiffany. Thank you so much, this is exceptional. I think it's a bit of a teaser for what's to come in November, um, but just anecdotally I'll add, without kind of going too far, that it's been really well received by the community, by the partners. There's a lot of interest in intuitively feeling how they can work with the city, but also look at incorporating these pillars into their work and moving us in a direction that I think really leads us towards a path of community well-being. So, so I'm very optimistic and hopeful, and I look forward to having a more complete conversation in November. And thank you again for all your work and for this uh, update. Um, unless there's any questions from the council. No, thank you again, and we'll see you soon. You're welcome, thank you. Okay. So that um, will then conclude our presentations uh, for today's meeting. I have just a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it in the rest of the agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and the city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have any sensitive or private information that you do not wish to have made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left, and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our council chambers. At this time, I'll go ahead and ask if any of our council members have any statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. Um, City Clerk, do we have any additions or deletion? We have none. Okay, seeing none. I have a quick announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to address us and speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur um, at or around 7 p.m. this evening. I'll look to our city attorney to report out on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Wat uh, Watkins, members of the city council. Uh, this afternoon, the council convened at 12.30 p.m. in the courtyard conference room to discuss uh, the following closed session items. First was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, uh, the claims of Sharon Lee Garner and the claim of Sentinel Insurance Company um, representing WUN Property Management LLC. Uh, the Garner item is also listed as item 11 on your consent agenda this afternoon. Council also received a report from and gave direction to its negotiator, real property negotiator, uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, concerning the property at 125 Coral Street, owned by James P. Gillespie and Jean Gillespie trustees, and Harley F. and Sandra I. Gillespie co-trustees. Uh, council item C uh, considered an item of anticipated litigation involving significant exposure to litigation. There was one item discussed under that category. 
there were two pending litigation matters that the council received a report from legal counsel and gave direction. Uh, th those were Hatch Pomerantz versus the city of Santa Cruz, a case pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court, and Desiree Quintero et al. versus the city of Santa Cruz, a case pending in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. Finally, the council met with its la labor negotiator um, to discuss uh, negotiations with the fire um, IAFF local 1716. Uh, there was no reportable action on any of those items uh, discussed in closed session today. Thank you, Mr. Kandati. And then we'll go ahead and um, move on to our city manager report. And I think we have a report today from city manager. Yes, a uh, brief, uh, just a presentation on an exciting new program that uh, the, we've launched recently, uh, really uh, with the leadership of our Parks and Recreation Department uh, and our director, Tony Elliott, who, who had this idea of initiating this uh, Citizens uh, Academy and got it organized and uh, started. Uh, so just wanted to give you a brief overview of that. There we go. So the Santa Cruz City Government Academy. So this is a uh, essentially a program that's being offered uh, that is really a behind the scenes exploration of local government. And it's really about introducing to residents to all the various services that are provided in the city in the various departments. It's an eight week course um, with participants uh, in the end, you know, having a, just a greater understanding of how the city works, city government works and what we do for the residents of the city, which is a lot, we're a full service city. So we do a lot more than most people I think even realize. And uh, so it, uh, it started uh, last week on Thursday, September 5th, uh, and it's due to end in October the, tw the 24th, and it's, uh, it's in the evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. Yeah, it's, uh, as I mentioned, the Parks and Recreation uh, staff is really who's uh, taking the leadership here. Uh, they serve as a liaison for each week, and uh, they really help to organize and plan the, the whole, the whole uh, course, um, again, under uh, uh, Director uh, Elliott's uh, leadership. And uh, there's a uh, experience and presentation that's uh, prepared every week uh, and the department head team was really uh, enthusiastic about moving forward with this and really got into the spirit of creating some really great programs and presentations for, for each, of the, each, each week. And Council Bajan, if you're interested in attending and coming, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and uh, we, there's you know, tours as well as other sort of hands-on experiences, like for example, the one that happened recently with respect to our office, uh, uh, and we introduced them to the city council as well. As far as uh, what you do, we had the, the actual participants sit up here and pretend to be the council and mayor, and, and it was a very interesting uh, experience for them. And uh, it's a free to attend. Participants uh, have to uh, register the Parks and Recreation Department like they would any other uh, parks program. And at the end of the program, uh, we hope to have them here before you to recognize them for their participation. We have about, uh, uh, the minimum is 10, the maximum is 30, but I think we have about tw a little over 20 participants signed up uh, thus far. So this is a schedule, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the city manager one was uh, uh, on September 5th. We also did an overview of the budget. Uh, a lot of people just, again, don't understand the basics of our city budget, the difference between the general fund and enterprise funds and so on and so forth. Um, the whole budget process, uh, Tracy from the finance department did a very nice presentation on that. Um, and then there'll be another seven sessions starting uh, uh, this week uh, with the public works, followed by police, fire, and as you can see here, you know, development and planning will be together, water, library, and then parks and recreation at the end of, of October. Uh, and that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Also, Tony's here if, uh, if you any questions he can answer as well. Thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation and thank you, Tony, and to your team for putting this on. It's a really fantastic new program that the city's offering and um, very similar to what I think is exceptional with Leadership Santa Cruz, Inside Education, and other jurisdictions showing light into what the work is of the city. is It's great. So I look forward to meet, meeting the first cohort in uh, October and appreciate the, um, the drive to make this happen. Questions, Vice Mayor Cummings. One question, and I uh, want to thank you for the work that you all did on this. I think it's pretty cool. And um, but just wondering how frequent this is going to be offered to the public moving forward. Good question. 
I mean, Tony can answer this, but I think it is, if it's successful, which it looks like it is, we'll, we'll continue to offer it on an ongoing basis, but mm -hmm. go ahead, Tony. Yeah, we plan to offer the next uh, semester, if you will, next fall uh, in a year, but depending on the feedback that we get this fall, we may do uh, another one as soon as this coming spring. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. All right. We'll go ahead and now move on to our city council memberships in city groups and outside agencies. So this is a time for our council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. Um, and just if you want to share a brief update on anything that you think um, is important for the council and community to know in terms of your work, uh, please do so at this time. I generally start to my left, but I'll entertain the opportunity to maybe start to my right today. And we'll start with you, Councilmember Crone. Thank you, yes. I um, attended the uh, Integrated Waste Management Task Force uh, this past week. And um, the crisis of plastics continues um, really uh, sort of unabated. Uh, I think there's some things we're kind of working at the edges of, you know, with plastic bags and plastic straws and the elimination of those. Um, but I think really where the um, the real heft in that whole uh, struggle would be are a couple of bills that are winding, wending their ways through um, through Sacramento and really putting some pressure on the, the, the folks who produce the plastic and that they be responsible uh, for what they produce. Uh, and I think that we'll see some real changes um, coming down in California. And I think California, of course, leading the way in a lot of areas, hopefully will take this on. I, I'm, I'm really hoping the governor will see this as, as one of those um, California leadership uh, uh, tasks that he um, takes on. Um, the other uh, group that I'm a part of is the, um, the community uh, advisory group, which um, is made up of about 22 different uh, community members, uh, elected officials, um, folks who are part of uh, different groups. Um, we met with the chancellor, the new chancellor for the first time uh, this past week. And um, it, it, was a, it was the beginning of a meeting. We, are, we put together, we put forward some principles that we want the university to agree with before we enter into this new LRDP, um, Long Range Development Plan process. Uh, and I think they're still mulling those principles over because what it's trying to do is put us more on, on an equal footing um, and that we have some real teeth in, in, in what this group decides. Um, and that the university be bound by some principles uh, that we all can agree on. And that's led to difficulties in the past without having principles um, where the community and the university agree upon. Um, and I think the, the big thing that, that I noticed came out of this is that they're shooting for 2021 with a draft LRDP before it was 2020. So essentially we've been given a, another one year reprieve, which means they will not go over 19,500 students which is the current um, long range development plan uh, limit cap on, on the university. So that was for me <laughs> really good news um, and hopefully we'll continue um, in that vein and make Santa Cruz, you know, I think that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a sort of the Santa Cruz exception because we are exceptional here and that we do care about education and that's the reason we don't want the university to grow without Sacramento providing resources, which they, they have not for the number of students that are up on campus now. Um, the, the last one I'll say is the Public Safety Committee meeting is next, um, it's on the 23rd, 5.30. So that's, that's our next meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Crum. Council Member Clifford? Thanks, well, I thought he was gonna save at least some for me, but uh, what I was going to let people know about is the Public Safety Committee meeting, which is scheduled for uh, next Monday, the 23rd mm -hmm. at 5 p.m. Uh, we'll be discussing issues of gun safety as well as a variety of other issues that impact public safety here in the city of Santa Cruz. So I encourage everyone to come. Other than that, nothing to report. Thank you. I'll just... I'll just briefly report, um, we had an update on the health and all policies work that's happening um, within the city. There's a city select committee meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, we haven't met since the last time I reported out on that. 
The one thing I do want to share that I think is interest to the council and the community is the Criminal Justice Council is having a gang violence prevention symposium focused on the role of women and girls in gangs. And that will take place on September 27th um, from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Twin Lakes Church. And I encourage you all, if you're available, to look at the flyer and if interested, attend that and to share that with any networks that you have that might be interested as well. And I just forwarded that flyer and information on to you at this time. Um, and I guess briefly, I will just uh, also share out that the two by two met um, uh, briefly in August to um, have a presentation on fire season updates from our uh, police, our fire chief, uh, Chief Hyduk, as well as um, discuss some shelter program updates from the county um, and then uh, some systems improvement work that they uh, apprised us of as well. Um, and I think that briefly summarizes the work that we have. Yeah. Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, in August, was able to attend the LAFCO meeting. Uh, it was really brief. Um, Edward Banks was selected to be the new special districts alternate on LAFCO. Uh, we also adopted to, um, uh, voted to adopt the service and sphere of influence review for the Santa Cruz Port District. And Jim Anderson will be the voting delegate for the Cal LAFCO annual conference, which is coming up in October. And um, aside from that, just briefly, because I know it's of interest of folks in the community, the uh, library subcommittee has been meeting fairly regularly. We've been having um, presentations by transportation, uh, economic development. We've selected Jason Architects um, to look at what our current funding would be able to get us in terms of renovations at the current library, and we'll be doing um, a more formal update in the near future. Thank you. Councilman Matthews. Uh, many of the uh, programs have already been covered um, by previous reports. Um, I will say um, Metro um, has concluded labor negotiations on most of its units, has one outstanding still, and um, is um, continuing to work on the Pacific Station um, uh, groundwork uh, with, with the city, which is encouraging. Um, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, we had a presentation from Rosemary on that recently, so they will be having their um, public hearing on the sustainability plan uh, on uh, Thursday, um, this, I think it's the 16th, I don't have a calendar right in front of me, um, but that will be a uh, public comment period on the um, two years worth of work that's been undertaken by the agency, and that will ultimately result in um, the adoption of a sustainability plan for that mid-county groundwater aquifer um, by 2020. Um, and then other than that, the Downtown Management Corporation um, has been involved with the um, consulting, which is one of the assessment districts in our downtown area, has been involved with the uh, consulting by Puma, the Progressive Urban Management Association that's been brought in uh, collaboration between the Downtown Association and the city um, and just to review uh, the overall um, management opportunities and future for downtown. Exciting process. Oh, I got one more. And then visit, <laughs> excuse me, Please, <laughs> visit Santa curious. Cruz, we're on together. <laughs> um, um, I they, they continue to, um, to do good work on marketing. Uh, one of the things they do is um, collaborate with Visit California, uh, which is a statewide tourism agency which operates nationwide and internationally. And Visit California um, is uh, this month uh, celebrating California Surfing Day, one of their big promotions. So uh, I gave you one. I'll pass these on. And so... Um, Visit California is promoting California Surfing Day, and uh, I just am passing out some of the work that Visit Santa Cruz County is doing, building on collaborating with the work of Visit California. So it, it's an active marketing and promotion district right here in our local agency that leverages what the state and national groups are doing. Yeah, thank you. Councilmember Brown. All right. <laughs> Um, let's see, I will start with the Regional Transportation Commission. We um, had our monthly meeting on this past Thursday, and um, at that time, one highlight, or actually two highlights, 
Um, one was a decision to approve a process for the regional distribution of surface transportation funding, which is kind of um, the state and federal funding that comes to each of the jurisdictions within the county. And um, in the past, that has all been competitive. We have finally, with the help of staff from the respective jurisdictions and RTC staff, uh, decided upon a distribution, a formula distribution that allow, will, uh, according to our public works department, allow for the programming out of projects in a more clear, a clearer, uh, more coherent way. So that was good news. We also, in that process, did leave some funding aside for um, Metro and uh, some of our community partners, nonprofits, who uh, work on sustainable transportation and active transportation projects. Um, so that was good. We also had a really cool presentation by a, a company out of Southern California that ha is going to be bringing a hydrogen uh, train. It's a possible um, higher capacity, but not super high capacity, uh, uh, rail transit uh, program that we could kind of look to in the future. And um, I won't give a lot of details, but um, you can find out more about it at the RTC website and stay tuned for the actual demonstration, which will be occurring probably on one of the segments of the rail corridor that in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and we're not exactly sure when, but it'll probably be sometime in uh, either the fall or the spring, depending on the weather. So stay tuned and um, it, it'll be really fun. Get on the, get on the train. Um, in terms, so um, Vice Mayor Cummings reported on the library subcommittee. I would just add that um, for those who are interested in uh, more information about what that subcommittee is, you know, that work program, we do have a dedicated site uh, or page on our city website, which you can go to. And there you can also find a link to sign up for office hours if uh, for folks who want to communicate with us in addition to our publicly noticed meetings, programmed meetings, we have set aside time to meet with uh, groups and members of the public. So um, you can check the website and sign up if you'd like to talk with us um, directly in that setting. Um, I think I gave my, pres I think I've already talked about age-friendly cities and the um, Area Agency on Aging. Uh, so I'll, uh, Skip that one. The last item that I would mention is um, in addition to the CAG, which is the university sponsored community advisory group that we um, have representation on, uh, I am on, along with Councilmember Matthews, a uh, city county task force uh, or committee to um, respond to UC growth and to um, kind of guide our advocacy efforts around the advisory measure of uh, measure U uh, that was adopt passed by city voters. So we uh, have, and at our city budget, uh, at budget time we did allocate funding for an advocate position. There's an RFP out now, um, and we are currently looking for uh, someone to fill that role. And so you can find the RFP at the city's website at our, on the planning department's page. Is that where it's located? Business, business and bidding. Thank you. <laughs> it's at the business and bidding, um, site, uh, uh page on our website. Um, we are uh, also, as part of that process, establishing a community uh, advisory group for that committee um, so that we can uh, and further engage uh, stakeholders in that process. And um, so we'll be reporting back on that uh, once they uh, convene and start meeting. All right, thanks. Well, thank you. And City Manager Martin Pagan. Yeah, just a couple of items. Uh, first, with respect to the library uh, joint powers authority, we had a special meeting last week to uh, approve their response to, there was a grand jury report on uh, the use of patron data and data analytics uh, 
And so the uh, staff uh, working with the board prepare responses to that. So that was approved last week. Um, it's long and detailed, I won't go over it, but so if you're interested, you can find the report and the analysis on the library's webpage. Um, and then secondly, with respect to the 911, uh, which is the Emergency Communication Center, I serve on that board as well. Uh, the big news there is that we are moving forward with the acquisition of a new records management system, which is something we've been really looking forward to, particularly at the police department, in order to get uh, better data, data and, and do more analysis. And so that will be actually before this council at your next meeting to approve the agreement, and then we'll move forward with uh, starting the implementation of that uh, early next year. So just wanted to give you an update on that, that that is moving forward. Well, thank you, and thanks to all of you for your work in our community and behalf of our city council. Um, we'll go ahead and move along then now to our council meeting calendar, and I'll see if there's been any revisions or updates from our city clerk. There have not. Okay. So that takes us to our consent agenda portion of today's meeting, and um, those are items 6 through 15 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. I will ask my uh, colleagues if they are interested in pulling any items today. Mm -hmm. I had a question okay. on number 12, but question. I don't need to pull it. Okay. Question for number 12? Okay. I just have one comment on 10. Okay. Comment for 10. Any items pulled? Council Member Matthews. I'm looking for my agenda, but I want to briefly comment on the earthquake item. Yeah. Okay. What's that number? Eight. That item of eight. A comment? Okay. We have no agenda. Items pulled from our consent agenda. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move then through. Um, we'll just maybe go ahead and start as opposed to going chronologically. I'll go uh, to my right, Councilmember Crone, for your question or comment. Yeah, this is for, um, uh, I guess, for Laura Schmidt. Um, just wanted to, uh, I talked with a, a, a groups, two groups of people this week and uh, who are sort of like active and local, you know, they follow Santa Cruz uh, City Council. And the site that we go to, it's really, it's really an important site, right? I mean, because that's where we get all our information. People might go to it several times during the week or in a meeting even. Um, and I know we're, we're thinking about changing over and I'm just, uh, my question would be, uh, I'm concerned about the process of that changeover and how it might affect uh, not only the council but the general public who use the, the, the site uh, often. So the impetus for the changeover is Highland is a company that acquired Sire and Sire is our current software that handles the agendas and the production of the agendas and all of the document management. So we have about 2.3 million files in SIRE related to meetings and their attachments. And then it also does the um, video overlay and the marrying of the documents with the video that re get, gets recorded through magic in that back room and also gets broadcast through CTV. So that's the entirety of this scope. Highland purchased Sire and Highland already had an existing set of systems for all of the solution and it's called OnBase and that happened several years ago. So when a company acquires this in the software market, they tend to eventually go with one set of flagship products. In this case, Highland is going with OnBase. So our product, Sire, is at end of life, so we need to replace it. So it is um, not necessarily a voluntary process. It is a thing that is driven through the acquisition and the merger and acquisition. However, the team um, and the team we went through a process last fiscal year of mapping the current SIRE processes and into OnBase and would they go well. And the team's conclusion was very complimentary and OnBase's consultant and they actually have teams that are focused of moving agencies seamlessly from SIRE to OnBase. So if you will, they have these conversion teams that have been going around with their existing company um, customer base, helping them do this move. And we had a, a consultant on site last fiscal year who worked with a team here to do that mapping. And the team's conclusion was very um, 
positive and that not only could we make the move relatively seamlessly, but that we would also get key back office functionality that we're missing today. And, and some of that is kind of not apparent to our end user community, but if you look at some of our agenda reports, the formatting of them aren't, isn't very sophisticated, so something like a word editor, which you're used to using at your computer, when we use Sire right now, it's very a text editor, it's not very robust. So the readability and consumability of our agenda reports will improve as far as the end user goes, and then our staff will have more capability to be able to produce reports that are, I think, more engaging and able to be understood easily by the public. In the interest of time, just my simple question is, when the public interfaces with our system, how, will there be much of a change? Will they be like, oh my God, what's going on here? Or will it be pretty, um, you know? I, I think it'll be pretty seamless. seamless uh, yeah. the, the technology that OnBase has, has a capability. And when I looked at it, it it's cleaner, it's more modern. Um, I think the font itself that you're able to choose from, it's, it's, it's more open, there's more white space, so I think the readability is improved. And, but the basic navigation doesn't change. Okay, thank, thank you, appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Kimmings. Uh, not on this item, and, okay, <laughs> forgive me. Is there he's anybody like, else like, who would like to address <laughs> or have any questions Excuse. on this topic? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Laura. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Vice Mayor Cummings. So um, with item number 10, one of the objectives is to um, commit to 1,000 new job placements in 2020. And I just wanted to make the comment and emphasize that these job placements should really focus on um, placing people who are currently residing in Santa Cruz County in these jobs so that we're really providing jobs for people who are um, within our current unemployment market. And so that's, that's all I had to say on that item. I'll just say here, here to that, and I think there's a lot of potential, and hopefully we'll um, be successful in our efforts to try to receive this um, potential funding source to really support the next um, kind of generation and pathway for these uh, kind of high wage type jobs that we need here in, in our community. So, good luck, and um, thank you for pointing that out. Question, comment, uh, Councilmember Matthews. Just want to briefly um, re remark and, and bring to the attention of the public, um, October 17th is the 30th anniversary of the Loma Prieta earthquake and there are a number of observances happening in the community. The city has reached out to connect with um, other entities that are planning things and we're involved in several of them. Our, our emergency services departments are doing some emergency preparation uh, workshops, uh, one on the um, 13, Sunday the 13th at the Civic uh, in collaboration with other um, preparedness organizations. The library is collecting oral histories of people who were here uh, during the earthquake and what their experiences were. And at the Museum of Natural History, there's a lecture on the um, science of earthquakes and um, there will be a moment of silence um, at 5.04 on the anniversary date. And things are, things are just coming forward now. So um, these will be on our, I think on our website um, for people to um, access. And for those who are here, it was embedded in your memory. And for those who were not, and particularly younger people, they're thinking, what is the big deal? But um, in fact, it did affect the community profoundly in many ways. Sure did. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we'll maybe continue to provide any updates on any yeah, we'll additional do, events. We'll, that we'll do the updates. This is what we knew when we went to press. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think we all remember where we were on that day if we were here. So I appreciate that. Was there any other questions or comments on any of the consent agenda items from the council at this time? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the community who would like to address this on our consent agenda. That's items number six through 15 in our agenda packet. Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back for uh, council action. Oh, forgive me, please come right up. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and have you reserve your comments until we hear that item. We're on six through 15 That's at this time. 19, I believe. Okay, that will be on item number 19. And I will announce that item when it's time. 
Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and see if there's a motion on the floor. I'll make a motion. Okay, second, okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead and second that a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by myself to move the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. With Council Member Meyer's absent. With Council Member Meyer's absent, thank you. I'll remember to do that from here on out. Okay. So, Next on our agenda is our consent public hearing. And this is item number 16 on our agenda. Is there any council member who would like to poll, comment, or um, uh, discuss item number 16 on our agenda? Okay, seeing none, is there any member of the community who would like to address us on item number 16? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if there's a motion. I'll move item number 16. Okay. Second. Motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by uh, Council Member Glover. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously with Council Member Meyer's absent. All right. So we'll move right along to our general business portion of our um, meeting. And next is the um, opportunity for us to have a sister cities committee appointment. And with the term expiration of January 1st, 2001, um, in the order, there will be a brief uh, sort of discussion if, if applicable for this item. Um, but in general for our uh, general business items, we'll have a presentation, questions, public comment, and then we'll return back for council action. Um, my understanding is we'll go ahead and take nominations and our clerks lead us through this. Council we do Matthew. have someone here. Yeah, someone's to, here, um, public an applicant. Oh, okay, before we go ahead and move that, then we'll go ahead maybe and have public comment before we um, hear any um, decisions on this. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. My name is Douglas Hall and I'm here to essentially uh, ask for your um, vote to be appointed uh, for, to the vacancy and to present my qualifications. One is I already have some experience uh, with local government, both in the city where I live for 14 years as a chair for a task force or as commissioner for Parks and Rec, but also here in uh, Santa Cruz <coughs> where I put in some time with the um, Measure K committee, where essentially nothing happened for two years, um, and then one year on the Arts Commission. But more importantly, uh, I'm already active with the uh, sister committee as a member of the exploratory committee that's driving the initiative to um, establish a former relationship with Biarritz, which is a really, really significant and potentially important relationship for both cities and particularly Santa Cruz with economic and intellectual um, benefits. And that's it. If you have any questions, I have 48 seconds left. <laughs> we're, we're okay, but thank you for being here and thank you for your interest in serving in this capacity. Okay. So we'll go ahead and see if we want to um, have our city clerk maybe run us through this process. And my understanding is we'll take nominations um, and then given who's nominated, decide if, and then we'll take the vote after the nominations. Okay. Can you nominate one person? Okay. So um, I'll start to my left. Councilmember Brown, do you have a nomination? Well, I'll nominate Dennis Adler. Councilmember Matthews? Yes, um, I'd like to nominate Douglas Hull because he is already involved with the um, commission activities, has some experience with them. Are there any other names um, for nominations? Okay. Seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and have the vote on the two potential nominees. Um, do we start to my right this time, Council Member Crone? Are you able to vote for both nominees? Sadly, no. No, we only have, <laughs> we one, have one opening. We only have one opening. Okay. Uh, I vote for uh, Douglas Hall. Hall. Oh. Douglas Hall. Douglas Hall. Hall. Okay. With uh, Douglas Hall, with all uh, council members present support and council member Myers absent. Okay, congratulations, Mr. Hall. Thank you for your service, and we look forward to what's uh, possible with the new exploration of uh, partnership with France. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on um, to our next agenda item, which is our De La Viega golf course operations plan. And um, I believe Tony Elliott is going to present. Not quite here yet. Why don't we, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. We'll take a five minute break and let Tony uh, come back and we'll go ahead and, and start when he gets here on this, on this item. All right, are we ready? Changed. Okay, so we'll go ahead and call this session back into order. And so uh, for those at home and those in the, in the public here, we're on item number 18 of our general business um, agenda items. This is our De La Viega golf course operations plan. And uh, as a reminder, we'll have a presentation from our staff. We'll have an opportunity for council to ask any clarifying questions, open it up to the community for public comment, and then return back for council action and deliberation. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to our parks director, right. Tony Elliott. All right, thanks very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, we'll jump right in here to the golf uh, presentation. This is a follow-up from our budget hearings uh, back in this spring. So a little bit of context on where we've been and, and the reason that we're here today. Um, back during the budget hearings, the golf course was um, a hot topic as we looked at this, um, I'll call it an enterprise in air quotes. It's not a true enterprise, but uh, one of the, the kind of, uh, one of the operations within the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, the City Council, uh, back during the budget hearings, directed staff to explore a variety of strategies and develop a plan for the golf course to break even. Uh, the goal really was uh, financial sustainability in a, in a break even. Uh, staff has explored uh, and presented options to reduce costs uh, as well as increase revenues, which we'll look at uh, here this afternoon. Uh, the council also directed staff to explore options to open Harvey West Pool year round um, and look at different uh, options or models there. And we'll discuss that as a actually as this, the next agenda item after this one. I mentioned that here because they both connect in a way because obviously they're, they're both um, uh, financial impacts to the Parks and Recreation Department uh, and both general fund um, uh, funded uh, operations within the city and within Parks and Rec. So they do tie together just from a, a budget standpoint. So a little bit of the background uh, here. So again, this is a follow-up from our fiscal year 2020 budget hearings. Um, a little bit of context, again, from the, the budget standpoint. So the Parks and Recreation approved budget uh, for fiscal year 20 is approximately 17.3 million. Uh, we reduced our supplies and services budget uh, going into fiscal year 20 uh, by about $650,000, uh, $650,000 reduction. 115,000 of that included the golf course. So we've already made through the uh, process leading up until our discussion tonight, we've reduced our budget at the golf course by over $100,000. Annually, Parks and Recreation brings in approximately $5 million in revenue. Um, so the net annual expenditure from the general fund is around $12 million. So another way to look at that is the uh, Santa Cruz taxpayer, really uh, the net um, is paying uh, into a budget of about $12 million uh, for the Parks and Recreation Department to operate. So that's all parks, open spaces, beaches, golf course, recreation programs, summer camps, on and on. So a lot of our Parks and Recreation services uh, have low or no cost or no fee uh, to the public. Um, the department, for example, spends uh, approximately $6 million a year um, on parks and open space maintenance. Um, and our parks are free. They're free and open. We're not charging a gate fee uh, to get into our parks. And so I share this a little bit in terms of how we fund things and where we collect revenue or where we don't collect revenue uh, within parks and recreation. So $6 million a year we spend uh, to provide neighborhood parks, regional parks and open spaces to our community. And we don't collect revenue off of that. We're not, uh, there's no, again, no fee, for example. Uh, special events such as Woody's on the Wharf, uh, Family Fun Day that we had at Harvey West a few weeks ago, um, and many other events are free to the public. So again, not charging fees for those. Um, and then operations such as our Civic Auditorium, the Municipal Wharf, um, between those two, 
Those cost approximately three and a half million dollars per year combined uh, between the Civic and the Wharf uh, and bring in a combined two and a half million back to the city. So even the Civic Auditorium and the Wharf uh, are not self-sustaining. So we spend three and a half, we bring in two and a half. So again, some of the context on uh, how general fund dollars, parks and rec budget dollars, and uh, taxpayer dollars go to fund the amenities and services within parks and recreation. So back to the golf course. So the golf course um, in, in this context, in the budget context, um, over the past several years, we spend approximately $2 million per year at the golf course, uh, and it brings in approximately $1.5 million per year. And we'll get into specific uh, numbers here in just a moment. I mentioned the pool, and we'll bring this up again uh, in just a little bit, but the Harvey West pool specifically uh, budgets about $175,000 per year, so it costs us about $175,000 per year to run the pool, uh, and we bring in revenue of approximately $75,000. Uh, so a net uh, support or subsidy, if you will, uh, from the general fund of about $100,000 per year. And I just wanted to mention that, again, uh, the general fund it doesn't just fund parks and recreation, uh, but funds the police department, the fire department, as you all know. Um, and so as we're having these discussions and similar to the budget conversation, where we um, uh, kind of play the shell game within the parks and recreation to fund different areas, to save money in different areas, uh, increase revenues in areas, reduce expenditures, all of this is within the broader context, of course, within the, the general fund budget. So I just wanted to put that in context that uh, the golf course isn't in a silo, Parks and Rec isn't in the silo, but there are a lot of impacts uh, there as well. So talk a little bit about uh, the park itself, uh, De La Viega Park. Uh, as you all know, it's a multi-use park. We have the golf course, and on the golf course itself, uh, we have multiple uses. We have the paved uh, cart paths on the golf course uh, that are often used for dog walking, things like that. We host a number of events and weddings at the golf course. Uh, the golf course also uh, intersects with a disc golf course, a paid disc golf course, uh, where uh, a fee can be paid uh, to play disc golf on the actual ball golf course. But also in the park we have Santa Cruz Shakespeare. We have um, in the lower park uh, another disc golf course that's ranked in the top five or 10 in the world. Uh, we have a, a kind of a secret hidden uh, archery course, uh, which is amazing. Playgrounds, ball diamonds, uh, and so forth. So De La Viega really is a multi-use park, um, a really incredible property with a variety of uses. Um, and again, most of those uses do not bring in any revenue. The golf course does. Um, and we have an opportunity, I think, long-term to look at revenue generation through some of these operations, but wanted to share a little bit of that context on the multi-use nature of the park. So we'll get into some of the numbers here of the golf course. So this is our operational analysis. So I've got two slides here to dig into this. So um, the, really the bottom line here uh, is the most uh, probably important to look at the number of rounds that we're offering um, and booking uh, to, for the community per year. Uh, so you'll see in fiscal year 19, uh, we hosted just shy of 44,000 rounds of golf at the golf course. Uh, for context, um, about 50, almost 5,700 of those were free. So we gave those to nonprofit organizations, we gave those to school groups. Um, those are free rounds uh, that we gave back to the community. 2018, uh, about 45,000 rounds uh, with about 6,500 of those uh, uh, given away um, uh, non-revenue rounds to community members. So I share this and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but De La Viega is a, of course, a public course uh, and really is sort of the, the, the people's course, if you will, um, in Santa Cruz. We have a, another golf course near to us at Pasa Tiempo. Uh, but it's a private course and it's a very uh, expen uh, expensive course, frankly, about $250 a round uh, compared to our approximately $50 a round. So this is a course really multi-use and really the idea is uh, that it can serve the community, not just for golf, uh, but in a number of ways. And so here are some of the numbers that reflect uh, the type of use that we have at the golf course. In terms of expenses and revenues, here is a snapshot. So. Um, as you can see uh, on the bottom line, the trend, uh, we, we do run a deficit every year at the golf course. Um, and again, this is not uncommon uh, compared with other 
uh, functions within the Parks and Recreation Department. So we're running deficits at the auditorium and the wharf and, and virtually everywhere else. So, um, but as you can see from the, the golf business, if you will, um, here is the uh, amount, the negative amount in the bottom line uh, is the annual um, net impact to the general fund through the Parks and Recreation budget. One thing that I'll note, uh, a couple of the big fees, a couple of the big dollar amounts that you will see here. Um, one is water, um, and water you can see over time where the new water rates went into effect. Uh, so in the past two years, we pay approximately $570,000 a year in water um, at the golf course. For some context, we budget uh, three quarters of a million. We budget 750,000 in water. Um, so there is a water savings. If you go up to the golf course right now, the course is pretty well browned out. Uh, there's a lot of dry areas. We're not watering uh, the, the course everywhere. Um, and we uh, make it a point um, uh, for water conservation as much as we can. Um, and so you can see even though we budget 750, we're spending about $200,000 less than that almost. Another big expense for us is personnel. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in just a moment. Um, we have nine FTEs um, at the golf course. It's a skeleton crew. Uh, in 20, um, 2010, um, w after the Kaiser Marston report that's included as part of your packet, one of the recommendations was to reduce the number of staff following that 2010 uh, report. Uh, so, the, so we did reduce staff at that point down to a skeleton crew, which we're really um, operating with uh, to this day. So it's a minimal number of staff to run the golf course. Nevertheless, our personnel budget is almost a million dollars a year, and it was over a million dollars a year a few years ago. Um, but I mention this because a lot of municipal courses and I'll go to this next slide here. A lot of municipal courses in the Bay Area in the past two years in particular um, have started to privatize their maintenance. So our maintenance is done in-house. It's done by city employees. It's done by uh, Parks and Recreation staff. Um, a lot of other muni courses in the same situation that we're in, in the same spirit to save money uh, and break even, have privatized uh, their maintenance. We recognize that in a uh, sort of a, a business mindset that that is a potential option. Uh, but we believe that uh, it's not within the values of our uh, city and our parks department um, to, to lay off our people uh, and, and to privatize labor. So that's just kind of our viewpoint on it. Um, we don't see that as an option, so we did not put that forth um, in the operations plan. But certainly if the city council wants to review or consider uh, privatization of the maintenance side. There could be cost savings there, uh, but it would mean potential layoffs to, uh, to the staff at the golf course. So I just wanted to put that out there in some context. We have not put that forth as, put, as part of our recommendations. So the near-term strategy. So we have put forth in the operations plan a three-part sustainability strategy. So this starts with uh, our annual expenditures. So we uh, aim to minimize our annual expenditures um, as much as we possibly can while maintaining the quality of the course. So we are putting forth um, in the proposal to reduce our annual water budget by 20% down to $600,000 per year. We th it's a hedge. Uh, if we need that extra water, uh, we wouldn't necessarily have it available unless we came back to the city council for uh, additional appropriation. But that is $150,000 savings in the budget that we could implement uh, in this next budget cycle um, by reducing that down to $600,000 per year. Um, other expenditures, I think that we could potentially minimize. Um, again, it's very difficult uh, with staff, with personnel, uh, with a skeleton crew, but there are other ways that we could reduce. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more, but one that's coming soon is a, a well. So an installation of a well, uh, that well has a one year payback uh, on it until we start to um, see the benefits of, uh, of installing that, uh, that well. So we'll bring that to the city council in the coming uh, couple months um, as a proposal. So minimizing expenditures, but maintaining that course quality. The second one, uh, is increasing our revenues. We have to increase our revenues. And so we have approached this uh, in two different ways through the proposal. Number one is a proposal to uh, increase the rates at the golf course. We have not increased rates uh, in about a decade. And so we've proposed increasing rates, which we'll get into in just a moment. Those range from a 6% increase uh, to the walk-up rate to a 20% increase 
uh, to the annual membership, um, which are a lot of local users, kind of the most dedicated users and, and heaviest users at the golf course. Um, the other way that we can increase revenues is by getting more people to the golf course to play golf, to go to the restaurant, uh, to, to have events up there. And so this is an area that we can work with our operator and plan to work with our operator, and this is in the operations plan. Uh, but we need a we need a marketing plan. Uh, we've got to go out to the community. We've got to get more people to the golf course. Um, and we'll discuss that uh, again here in just a uh, second. Um, and I allude to that here in the third point. Again, it's getting more um, getting more people to the golf course, and that uh, again gets to the marketing side of things. So I'll go ahead and move on. Um, so right now, our users at the golf course, it's about two thirds uh, community member or two thirds um, residents of Santa Cruz County and one third uh, non-residents of Santa Cruz County. This ratio used to be flipped. So when we had uh, higher rounds in the 90s, uh, for example, this ratio was flipped. Two thirds of our users were from out of town, one third were local. And so we know uh, from this number that there's something that we're doing now that we, that we didn't used to do, and so that has kind of changed, uh, changed our numbers. Bay Area golf in general, uh, virtually all of the municipal courses in the Bay Area uh, have more annual rounds at their golf course per year than what we have. In some cases, it's 50% more rounds. We, uh, De La Viega used to have probably 60 to 70,000 rounds per year. And as we saw uh, here, we have about 44,000 rounds per year. So there's a huge opportunity, we believe, um, seeing that most of our users are local and we don't have a large out-of-town user base. And also in comparison to other muni courses, we know that we're not capturing the, the visitor. Uh, Santa Cruz County is a $1 billion tourism industry just in our county. And so if we can capture just a couple people out of that and start to start to turn this uh, around, I think there's a lot of opportunity and upside uh, for increasing revenues um, at the golf course. So I, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of potential there. And that'll get down to marketing, <laughs> I think, in terms of outreach. Here's some national statistics I wanted to put in here um, in terms of, so this is across the country, uh, total rounds of golf across the country, just kind of big picture. And this has gone back and forth over the past uh, five years, uh, uh, almost 2% uh, decrease to an almost 2% increase, um, down to almost a 5% decrease in 2018. Um, and this is across the country. Um, on the right-hand side, the pie chart you see here, the number of rounds played, uh, the 434 million rounds of golf played in 2018, about 80% of those are at public courses. Um, so just for a little bit of context, I think on the importance of our public uh, course. Now this is a little, we're a little bit different uh, in California and on the West Coast. Um, as you can see across the country, the decline in golf and the decline in golf across the country is in the aggregate. But if you look at the West Coast, uh, we are increasing. So we've got about a 3% uh, growth uh, in golf um, uh, within this timeline. This is from the National Golf Foundation. So on the West Coast and, and the, kind of the mountain uh, region, if you will, um, there continues to be an increase despite the downward trend across the country. So getting back to our rates. So these are the rates that we have proposed as part of the operations plan. Um, and these, for some context, uh, have been recommended by our operator. So our operator uh, has a long history in the business of golf, uh, and these recommendations really come from them as the subject matter expert. Uh, they believe that if we increase rates too dramatically, we're gonna, people are gonna stop playing golf. Um, it, it'll price people out uh, and they'll stop playing golf. So in terms of the general public, we've proposed a pretty modest increase, which is 6%. But as we go down, you can see the discount card holders, the annual member programs, a pretty significant increase uh, to those. Again, those are the people who are golfing almost every day uh, and would like, very likely be willing to pay a higher fee um, uh, just based on, that, based on that use. And this is based on some, um, I, I wanna say non-scientific surveying, but from our operator discussions they've had with their, the regular golfers, this is the feedback that we've gotten that, the, that our market uh, could bear these increases, um, but not a lot more without uh, affecting the, the number of rounds played.
So here are a couple other key steps that we have in place. Uh, uh, reduction of water consumption. Uh, we're seeking options for, uh, for a well, at least one well that we discuss, um, or other types of detention or retention uh, if possible. Uh, we are in ongoing discussions with the water department to look at tertiary treated water to get recycled water to the golf course rather than using potable water. Uh, utilization of variable rate pricing. So this is a new thing actually that we've put in place since our budget hearing back in the spring, but we have variable uh, rate pricing based on demand at the golf course. So for example, when the US Open was at Pebble Beach uh, this summer, a lot of people were in the area for the golf tournament. And so our rate to play golf was about $98 a round. So we knew there was increased demand. So that price point went up based on that variable rate pricing. But right now in the winter, when it's cold and, and rainy, we could, uh, through the variable rate pricing, lower those fees. So in a time of year where we're very slow, we don't have a whole lot of golf play, we could lower those rates significantly uh, to incentivize people to get out to the golf course and better balance our schedule throughout the year uh, to bring in revenue. Uh, De La Viega Grill, the restaurant at the golf course is still under construction and we hope to open that uh, yet this fall. Um, as of uh, today, I think they are, this is our operator that's doing this work at this point. They're looking at November, December to open up uh, the grill. And then I mentioned a little bit marketing uh, for special events uh, into the travel industry. Again, I think we're a very uniquely situated golf course. We're in a tourist uh, hub here in Santa Cruz. Um, a lot of really marketable assets that, that we have at this golf course, but we have to get out to uh, the expos. We have to get out to these different opportunities um, uh, that uh, organizations like Visit Santa Cruz provide or that they engage in. We've got to get out to, to a broader community and market uh, to encourage people to play golf when they come to visit uh, our city. So sustainability in the plan, uh, we talk about, um, I, I'll just touch on this briefly, but there's a lot of detail in the operations plan. Uh, when we talk about sustainability, we look at it from a triple bottom line approach. So financial sustainability, environmental, and social. And so we've talked a little bit about the environmental, the wells, the tertiary treated water, um, things along those lines. It would be a goal of ours if we could to be the most environmentally efficient golf course uh, in the state. That would take some significant investment uh, to get to that point, upgraded irrigation, um, alternative uh, energy sources potentially, and a much more uh, comprehensive approach toward um, water conservation uh, and uh, stormwater capture potentially. On the social side, social sustainability to us means proactively going out to our community to make sure that all members of our community know about the golf course and have access to play golf. And so we can do that by connecting with the schools, uh, but with elementary schools, we can work through programs uh, like the First Tee program. Uh, and we at the golf course have done this historically, but at some point we sort of got away from doing some of these things. So there's a lot of opportunity to get underserved uh, individuals or communities up to the golf course to learn the game of golf or the business of golf um, or disc golf or Shakespeare for that matter. So. There are a lot of different tactics and those are articulated in the operations plan on different strategies for a, a social sustainability approach to get more people to the golf course um, and give that opportunity at, at ideally no cost uh, to um, especially underserved communities to, to provide access. So the staff recommendation uh, for the city council today um, is that the council support the draft operations plan that we have before you, uh, which includes the, the near-term and long-term strategies that we've talked about. Um, for some context as well, we at the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, last night, the commission voted six to one to uphold um, uh, to uphold this recommendation uh, on the draft operations plan. The one addition that they had to their motion was a request uh, to get the financials from our operator. Uh, so just kind of a, a detail there. Um, so this would be staff recommendation to adopt the draft operations plan. Um, I'd be happy to open it up to any questions the council has. Great, Councilmember Matthews. Um, I do have a question on the, uh, and you don't have to go back to the slide, but um, this year the revenues were down. Um, and I think you allude in your report that that was significantly due to the closure of the, the shop uh, or the, um, the cafe, restaurant. Restaurant, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, grill. <laughs> um, and um, you also refer to the fact that when that is up and running, it will be uh, much more attractive. You expect more than a bounce back, a real yeah. improvement. Um, 
Do you have any uh, refle reflection on how that might help you accelerate the um, closing the gap? I would say we don't at this point. I would love our operator to chime in on that. They are not here today, unfortunately. Um, the Going back to your first question, the decrease in revenue and play uh, for this past year was in large part due to the rain. We had a really rainy season. Um, and so you saw, um, to some degree, our water consumption was lower this year. Um, our water bill was a bit lower, uh, but our play was a bit lower. And so when the rains come, we save in one area, but we, we lose revenue in another. Okay. Well, I, I was just really impressed and you know when the time comes i'd be happy to make a motion yeah thank you any other questions from the council at this time for the staff meeting you get a question mm -hmm. Councilman i'm really disappointed that the uh the vendor isn't here um i don't know it's kind of like a an oral you know that you take for a dissertation or or something you know that your thing is coming up and He's, he's, he or she's not here to represent the, uh, the group. That's, uh, I don't know what to say, because uh, there's a lot of questions that we might have um, for, for the vendor. I was wondering from you maybe, do you know other cities? I didn't see any, um, I saw some comps on what other cities charge for green fees, but have you seen any um, general fund expenditures from those cities? and? How does that compare with ours? What what we're because so, so far this the last since 2013 from the information you gave us there's a little over 3.5 million dollar deficit we're running at the golf course and it looks like we're on track to have a 750 thousand dollar one although you said that maybe a hundred thousand we could back off on for the for the water uh, but do we have any information like that from other other cities? We, we did some research on that um, as part of uh, this effort to put the operations plan together to look at other golf courses, what their fees and rates are um, in comparison. Some of that data is in the pro forma report uh, from 2017 as well. Um, I don't think we have specific data in terms of what other cities are uh, funding, that sort of net general fund um, uh, impact from other cities, but we, we did compare the rates uh, only. We could certainly get that information though. What was the member discounts program? Uh, this is our membership card, and I, I'll lean on these guys if they want to describe it a little bit more, but it's basically um, basically a card that you purchase. It's uh, 100 or $150 uh, to buy the card, and with that card, you get a, a discount uh, on the daily rate uh, of playing golf. So it's kind of like getting a, a Safeway card or something. And why not raise that card? What was the idea behind that, not, not raising that fee? I'm Miles Six. I'm the golf course superintendent. Uh, that fee was just something that was established at the time that the program was started, and, and much like our rates, it's not changed, and probably should. So, Pro probably should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could recommend it. There are but, two, but yeah. it's not recommended on our thing. It's that's the one that didn't change. I don't think. Was it was it recommended? So there are two different ones here. There's the annual pass, and that's the one where we recommended increasing it by yeah, right 20%. There, right there, member, membership, member discount, discount programs, no change. Yeah, that one, I don't recall exactly from our operator. This is another great question for the operator. I believe that, I, I don't know, I, I think they felt there wasn't a whole lot of flexibility there. I think the price of that card is relatively low, 100 or 150 per year. And so we talked about bumping that up. Do we bump it up 100 bucks or so? Um, but I think that one in particular, they felt um, they felt that, that there's not that elasticity there, if you will, in, in raising that fee. So they recommended no change. You talked about the the drilling for water and you and I have talked offline about kind of like not using potable water to water the golf course. Um, have we checked in with the water department and what the, the, the water situation, the water table there at the golf course, how that might affect, uh, you know, just overall water capacity or, or availability in Santa Cruz? Yeah, we have with the water department in, in quite a, a great amount of detail. I can't probably speak to this in uh, the best detail. My understanding is there's sort of an isolated layer of groundwater uh, where we would propose digging this well, and so it would not affect um, would not affect the water department um, uh, generally. Again, I, uh, I'm sort of out of uh, out of my uh, realm of expertise here in terms of speaking to that. But when we bring the well item to the city council, um, the water department has done a, a lot of uh, research into that um, in terms of the uh, in terms of 
uh, what the environmental impact would be, and they would present that as part of the proposal uh, for council. Um, you, you did quite a bit of um, talking on how uh, all these different programs cost the city. Um, and I'm sorry about that because I don't see uh, the golf course necessarily on a par with programs at Loudon Nelson or, or the basketball programs that the city has or softball leagues. Um, to you know, take our water department, I think that's a better, um, uh, you know, apples to apples kind of comparison. They are raising fees and have been raising fees because that's what it takes to um, uh, have a product that, that that's that's clean and good and gets it distributes it to the people in Santa Cruz and so I think that would be a better way of like the golf course it, it doesn't make it still doesn't make sense to me so much and I know you and I have talked about it um, and you know I think there's some room here too uh, of raising you know green fees I think the vendor probably cautions against that because it could affect a lot of things but it seems to me he might have some leeway to like, okay, merchandise, restaurant, alcohol, all those other things that he, he that we get a certain percentage of, but uh, there is, you know, he, if he doesn't want the green fees to go up um, too dramatically, it seems like we need to negotiate a better uh, agreement with him. Um, I'm understanding that we, we negotiated a 10 year agreement just recently with, with um, I guess the Laustalot family. That's correct. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers here just to provide yeah, the no, best okay. information. So we have uh, two two leases with the Lauslot family. Uh, one is for the restaurant, uh, and that is uh, that's the one that was updated most recently. That's a 10-year term for the restaurant. Um, and then they, the other lease that we have with the Lauslot family is for the what we just call the pro shop, and that's really for the business or the operations uh, of the golf course. So I'm uh, happy to go into those numbers um, in terms of what that looks like. Um, but um, let's see, generally on the pro shop side of things, so let me see here. The lease on the pro shop or the operation goes through 2026, so we still have seven years um, uh, on that lease. Uh, and to some of the details here, the concessionaire paid 6% of all greens fees and green fee discount cards, uh, golf carts, 7%, and I might have Travis Beck, our park superintendent, come explain this a little bit better. 7% of gross revenue on golf courts, 7% of sales at the pro shop. Um, these are the items that come back to the city. So 7%, they get 93%. Driving range, 15% up to 325,000 uh, and 14% over 325,000. Golf lessons, 5% of gross revenue. Disc golf concession, 7% uh, of gross sales. On the restaurant, 6% uh, of food, 8% of alcohol, 10% of merchandise at the restaurant. So just a, there's a lot of numbers really quickly, but just a, a snapshot on, on that lease. On an environmental question I had was, does the, um, does the, Gal does the De La Vega Park, does it currently have a management plan in place and when was that adopted? On the park as a whole, we have a master plan that was adopted in 1960 and has not been updated since then. Uh, we don't have a management plan of the golf course, um, but that's really what this operations plan is intended to do, is serve as a management plan for the golf course specifically. You mean that what's in front of us? Correct. Is supposed to serve for as a the, management plan? For the golf course, yeah. Just for the golf course. Yeah. And to your question about, about revenues overall, I think it, it's a really good question. And so we talked about kind of the multi-use nature um, of De La Viega, and we could look at this across the entire Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, but a best practice for a Parks and Recreation Department is to have a revenue policy in place. So uh, what type of operations, it, what that would really guide us on is what type of operations do we seek full cost recovery? Where are we willing to subsidize? and everywhere in between. We do not have a revenue policy in place um, as a department. And so that's something that long-term uh, and really separate from the golf course, we could look at all aspects of our operation within Parks and Rec to say, where do we, similar to the water department example, where do we want to capture um, that user fee and, and what are we willing to subsidize? Thank you, Mayor. I, I have a motion also, um, and I, but I'd like to hear from other council members and what, what kind of issues or questions they might have. Great. I have Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember mm -hmm. Matthews. And then Councilmember Glover. So typically do most city run golf courses, you know, do they generally run in a deficit because the idea being that they're gonna, you know, 
offer um, and supplement some of the funding that it costs to run the golf course so that people have more ability to have access. And as a result, they end up running in a deficit. But that's also similar to, for example, um, based on some of what you said, many of our parks, the maintenance of those open spaces so that they're free for people to go to comes at a cost of, you know, um, not generating revenue off that. So just maybe wondering if you could speak to that with regards to golf courses in general. Yeah, I think you hit perfectly on kind of the, the core of the whole discussion among excuse me, municipal golf courses. And uh, that is, you know, in the 80s and 90s, all these golf courses were making money and giving money back to their general funds uh, and supporting other functions in Parks and Rec. And so I think the general decrease uh, in, in golf play, um, but I think more importantly in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, um, the number of golf courses, especially in the Bay Area, exploded. I think, if I recall, it was about a 44% increase in the number of golf courses in the Bay Area over over 10 years or so. I think that was in the in the in the 90s. And so all of a sudden, um, you know, golf was booming. Everybody built golf courses, and then it kind of started to trend downward, but with a huge supply of golf courses. So muni courses, municipal courses, uh, really were all in the same situation where. Uh, really we're all kind of facing the same thing. We have declining number of rounds. Um, and so that values judgment is very similar to the discussion we're having of what do you do with a golf course? Can you make it multi-use? Do you privatize uh, aspects of it? Uh, do you close it? Um, what's, what's the right thing to do? And I think in the case of our golf course, we see a lot of upside, a lot of opportunity just based on past trends and, and kind of how our trends are now. Um, which is why this operations plan and recommendation is structured uh, as such. Okay. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Gloves. Thank you for the presentation and um, thank you for thinking about how to proceed and make the golf course operations more sustainable financially and um, also kind of, I think we talked about uh, at our meeting, uh, thinking about the the value of having a one a public golf course but one also one that is green it's um it is greener than a lot of golf courses and um so i think that's <coughs> something that i'd also like to see um us pursue in terms of our outreach and marketing or the the operator to the extent they're doing um any of that um outreach and marketing question is so in the so 10 years ago nine years ago and a half we um received the city received uh this report uh about the um golf course operations and the feasibility of um uh, doing a range of things to try to make it self-supporting and one of the items that is listed in the gap um, um, this is page nine, section eight, potential options for reducing the gap in golf, the golf course enterprise fund. Number two was related to debt service. And so I'm wondering, and there was an expectation that, um, the, those, that debt <coughs> service would decline and which it has, um, but we still have a similarly sized gap. So, um, that didn't happen. I'm just wondering if um if you have any thoughts on that if there's you know if there's something more that i'm missing here about why that did not come to fruition as a way to close our gap and um if there's anything that can be done um i you know i guess i'm just kind of overall um kind of it's a little frustrating to see 10 years later a uh, um similar gap and um you know, fees have not gone up. Um, another question that I have, just it's kind of a, just a, kind of your sense of kind of question. Um, we were, um, where we're at with in, com in compared to other muni courses, um, I mean, we're kind of, we're pretty competitive, right? So, I'm just wondering about that, how that fits into the thinking about raising rates and, and the, how that might be off-putting for consumers or golfers. Well, if I could offer your 
your point about the debt service being retired, that's true. We still carry some debt service on a 30-year bond that we took out in 04 and 05, which was a $3 million renovation project. So we still hold that debt service. But in conjunction with retiring some of the other debt service and also refinancing our current debt service, the unfortunate uh, coincidence was that the water rates skyrocketed and also pensions went up for employees. So everything that we stood to gain from retiring those debt services was lost to these increases. And yes, we are competitive and that's <coughs> with our pricing, which is also what gives us reservation and nervousness about raising our rates too much to cover that gap because Unlike our colleagues in the water department, people have choices when it comes to golf courses and they can go somewhere else to play for cheaper or better quality, so. Just a quick follow-up question in that regard. Um, in terms of our, what is our competition? Because when I, it's hard for me to understand um, the, the nature of that competition because we are in a community that doesn't have very proximate golf courses of the same caliber at the same cost. Um, so it's not like being in San Jose and deciding I'm gonna go to Campbell instead of Sunnyvale, you know, because the course there is cheaper. So if you could talk about that a little bit from your perspective, that would be helpful for me. I would just say, as Tony mentioned earlier in his presentation, that uh, currently two thirds of our players are local and one third is out of town, which was, the you know, conversely, um, in our heyday, um, and because we've lost that that group of, of Bay Area folks coming over, they have so many choices that unless they have a reason to come over to us, they don't have to go that far to find golf. So one of our challenges is, is in enticing them to come over through good quality and good pricing, and that's part of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, as we go forward, and especially with developing a marketing plan. Yeah, I think kind of building on that, um, during the budget hearings, I uh, mistakenly compared our golf course in terms of competition to Pasa Tiempo, and it's really not a, a great comparison. Um, so, but I think that, to Miles' point, I think a great competitive advantage that we have is that we are the affordable course here in Santa Cruz. Uh, and again, with all these people coming over the hill, visiting here, um, there's an opportunity to capture that uh, segment of, of the market uh, that we're not doing at the moment. So locally, um, the locals are, are playing golf. Uh, the locals, um, obviously we're seeing, you know, two thirds of our users are, are uh, locals, um, but it's that out of town, the people visiting here who we're not, not capturing. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Glover. Um, I, I did want to also ask about uh, the increase in rates over time. Uh, you talked about um, doing it uh, stepped over a period of time. I think, did you say five years? Was that your, in, r rather than in one fell swoop and a shock to the system, uh, let people adjust to it? Yeah, that's a great point. We propose, uh, if I recall, uh, three years, so phasing these increases over th the next three years. Oh, and I, like I said, one of the, um, you did mention also development of a revenue policy for the department overall, uh, which I think is probably overdue. <laughs> um, what sort of a time frame work program do you see? I mean, I, obviously that's not immediate, but it's something you'd want to, you know, get on the list. Yeah, that's a great question. We have uh, strategic planning meetings um, this fall. Um, we've got a, a new team, a uh, new management team in Parks and Recreation. So actually beginning at the end of this month will be the first phase of multiple phases of st uh, strategic planning. Uh, and in that we'll talk about a revenue policy. So I'm hopeful, um, I don't wanna overpromise uh, these guys are gonna uh, uh, you know, roll their eyes back here or something. Uh, but I, I'm hopeful by uh, next spring or summer, we can have a revenue policy in place. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Elliott, and for the rest of the parks group for being here to talk about the, the golf course. I know this is important to a lot of people, and even before it was on this agenda, when we were talking about before, I had a chance to meet with some different people in the community that really believe golf is a really important uh, sport to be able to have access to, especially for people from a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that as we enter into this conversation. Um, 
I, I notice that there, we're talk, doing a lot of talk about the cost of the city and all that kind of stuff, and I, it's important. Uh, I'd really love to understand the operator, and that's why I'm really disappointed they're not here today, because there are some specific things that I would be curious about, but maybe you can answer it. Is, uh, how long have we been working with this operator? Uh, the, the current golf professional's father was the, was the original pro in, at conception of the course. So since 1969, 1970. Oh wow, okay, so 30, 40 years, okay. somewhere in there, thank you. Um, and then uh, I, when you were listing off those numbers as far as the profit sharing that was going, you know, 5%, 4%, 7%, 10%, is there a reason why those are so low? Yeah, I, I can't speak to that exactly. We could get that information. Um, I don't know offhand. Uh, the economic development department may have uh, likely been involved in that. Um, we, for reference, what we could follow up with as well uh, is kind of a comparison of some of uh, our lease rates at, uh, our, at the wharf, for example, some of the wharf tenants, but we did a lot of that research going into it. I'm, I'm not sure why these numbers are the way they are though. And do you, uh do you know the general report of the profit for the operator every year that they're making off of the municipal golf course? Uh, no, no, I do not. Oh, so it's a lot of unknowns, okay. Because um, that's, that's just a little con disconcerting to me, you know, a group that's been running a golf course for 40 years with unknown amounts of profit and we're subsidizing that for the community, but if we're having a private entity generating a profit off of a municipal golf course, and we're talking about increasing fees uh, that would make it less accessible for low-income people to be able to participate in a sport that should be open to everyone, um, I'm kind of concerned about potentially perceived regressive price modifications that would make it so it would become less accessible. I know that in other, you know, areas of whether it be sports or access to things for admission, there are tiered uh, tiered rates for people based off of their income uh, or stuff like that. So I'm not sure if that's anything that y'all have had a chance to potentially dive into where if someone can prove that they have an income of below a certain level, then they would be given one of either the member discount cards or uh, potentially a pass for low income golf or however you want to frame it, accessible golf, <laughs> yep. a little bit less stigmatizing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so stuff like that, and then having a tiered set of uh, potential things, because uh, you know, if I, was, if I was able to talk with the operator here and ask them questions and get that kind of perspective, but right now, I would be much more inclined to figuring out how we can rebalance the revenue sharing between the operator and the city so that we can start seeing some of that uh, coming back to us, especially you know, we just spent a so like million dollars or so on renovating the restaurant, but we're seeing 5% come back to us on food, I think was the number you gave me, five, seven, and 10. So that's, there's a lot of red flags there for me with that, and I hope that we can continue this conversation as we move forward. Please, Council for Crone and then Council Member Matthews. Thank you. Um, I just want to put forward this uh, motion. I have a copy for we're you. Gonna go ahead, maybe go ahead and pause for a second on the motion um, until we take public comment. Okay. Do you have any additional questions from the council at this time? Councilmember Matthews. It's not a question, but uh, I want to give just a little perspective on the operator. The, oper the previous operator was uh, interested in retiring, um, and you are going to know a whole lot more about this than uh, I can recall, but um, it did come to the city at the time of um, renewal of the agreement, and the younger generation was interested in coming in and making very significant, very significant private investment of their own in the facilities, um, which is why the decision was made. I'm, I'm thinking of the um, the grill um, for not just a one year or a, a short term, but a longer term because they were prepared to put in both the uh, financial commitment and the vision to uh, make a significant improvement and market and expansion of activities and so forth. So uh, it was not just an arbitrary same old, same old. It was, it was a, um, uh, a very thoughtful decision which involved both Parks and Rec and um, economic development and um, as I think um, has been mentioned, um, the rates return to the city as on the wharf. It's different percentages for different amounts, but they're they're hardly arbitrary. So uh, I would just like to say, again, um, I'm very impressed with the 
um, how the staff and the commission heard the concern of the council um, about dealing which it has been a dynamic uh, uh, situation in the golf industry, uh, what's out there with the prices, play, and so forth. And I think there's been an interest over time in uh, keeping our course accessible, making improvements in um, the uh, environmental water and so forth, the expenses. But I believe the staff has truly heard what the council directed and has given a lot of good, careful thought to not just a quick fix, but a, a plan that can be implemented <coughs> over a relatively near term, three to five years, that will make significant improvements in all of these areas and give us um, a course that we can be proud of and is an asset to our community. So uh, for that reason, I favor uh, uh, adopting the staff report before us. We'll go ahead and, I, yeah, and we'll go ahead I and just want to I, I recognize on that the floor. we're we're going to I'll just sort of reorient this. We're still at the time for questions. We'll have an opportunity for comments after we hear public comment. Um, did you have an additional question? Uh, it was just uh, I'll wait till the next the next round. portion was to respond okay. to something that was said. But yeah, absolutely. I think you know my questions were were primarily answered already. I, I did have a question about the local discount, but I kind of understand the dynamic in regards to trying to increase um, out of towners. So that was sort of by default responded to. Um, okay, so at this point, we'll go ahead. Do you have additional questions? I do have one more. Um, during that transition from <clears throat> the older generation to the younger generation, was there an open <coughs> request for proposals for a new operator for the golf course, or was it just a uh, family handoff? I believe the term is just a typical municipal lease where this, the the son and uh, took over for the retiring father, and the and the lease perpetuated through time. Great, thank you. Option to renew, I think. Right. Is what it is. Yeah. Yes, right, the but the, one. I just want to add that when the lease expired, that question came before the city council as far as what approach the council wanted to take. Whether you want to do an open RFP or do you want to negotiate with the existing um, operator. So that question was brought before the council, and the council decided to pursue negotiations with the current operator. Do you, to, do you know what year that was? Uh, it was several years ago. I'm trying to recall when the when the. Uh, I'm not mistaken. It's happened more than once over the last 15 years. Where this been brought in front of this council and. Uh, it was about, I mean, four or five years ago, maybe, maybe a little longer. I think 2010, and then again around roughly 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking of 2015, probably. Great, thank you. Okay, so now's the time for us to hear any members of the community who want to address us on this item. This is item number 18 of our general business um, agenda. Please step forward and you'll have up to two minutes. <coughs> Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, as the SoCal Water District puts the pipeline in for the uh, reclaimed water, we should put a T somewhere, which would be the optimal point to send some reclaimed water up to the golf course, to water the golf course with reclaimed water, or lay a secondary pipe coming from that point to their secondary re, uh, uh, treatment plant so that we can use some of what they call pure water to water the golf course um, instead of using you know potable water I mean it's quite a bit of water that they're using up there and eventually you know the city's gonna have to like limit the number of hookups for new water supply so if we can take that potable water and then save it for uh, new hookups that would be really great as far as um, Maintaining the golf course, I'd like to know whether or not other municipal courses are maintained by the cities and their parks departments, or are they maintained by the vendor that they've leased the course to? Because that, that could be quite a bit of savings too if the vendor was responsible for you know, mowing the lawns and cleaning bathrooms and doing stuff like that instead of the city, and then having, uh, them take take that over, um, and as far as fees go, I think that the, you know you could raise them probably six to twelve dollars on a sliding scale, and most people would continue to play. I don't think 
You know, I mean, our nearest competition really is Boulder Creek Country Club um, because Paso Tiempo is just way too costly. And then there's another, uh, you know, lower. Anyway, thank you. Jason, you'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Thank you. Good afternoon, council. I actually came to speak about the, the next item, the pool. We'll go but, ahead and pause your but as a, um, But I'm going to speak on this. But I have this something. This is for this item. I so understand that. Up. But okay. there's something relevant because there are two recreation programs. And I've been swimming at Simpkins. I'm not a, because I'm on a city resident, I have to pay a higher fee than if I didn't live in the city of Santa Cruz. So it strikes me that, I mean, it, that in the rate structure, the city would be justified in charging um, out of city residents, even if they were local, higher fees. They don't have to be 50% higher, but I mean, unless the county wants to give us a break at Simpkins and other programs, I mean, why don't we do the same? That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other members of the community who would like to address us on this item? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back for council uh, deliberation and action. Mm -hmm. I'll just make a few comments before we get started. Um, I just wanna thank the staff for this really thoughtful and comprehensive plan. And I think um, clearly there's been areas where um, we've been able to kind of, I mean, we, absent being able to sort of fix the past, I think there's things that we can learn from the past to move forward. And I appreciate the aspiration of having, you know, the most eco-friendly golf course in the nation. I think that's really in line with our values. I like the elements around the social access piece, sort of similar to Councilmember Glover around sort of an equity fee scale rate, I think really is about, um, the principles that you alluded to around this being the people's golf course, right? And so um, I think golf is often thought of as for the elite and it's nice to know that our community is still um, committed to providing this as an opportunity for those who couldn't afford that. Um, I think that there are aspects that I think there are areas where we would like to learn more, but absent kind of knowing that this is fluid, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to take what you've proposed here and move forward um, with potential uh, solutions and next steps. So that being said, I'll go ahead and um, return back to my colleagues. I know we had Councilmember Glover who um, I stopped originally. It's okay, I'll pass for now. Okay, you'll go ahead and pass. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and then uh, Councilmember Brown and then um, I think we have two potential motions. We'll go ahead and hear comments and then we'll go ahead and see. I have two potential motions that were brought to my attention. So I'd start by saying thank you for bringing this forward because I think that it's incorporated a lot of some of the concerns that folks up here have had over the past year and probably longer. Um, I think that one thing that's been reiterated and I'll just say for myself, I think it would be really good to understand, you know, what are the cost expenditures and revenue that's being generated by on the operator's end because it's really transparent for us on the city's end, but kind of better understanding that on the operator's side would be useful for us. Um, and really happy and excited that you all are going to be working on a marketing plan. Um, it would be good to, I think one thing that will be interesting if it's not, if y'all don't have it already, but learning more about the demographics of who is coming to the golf course that way, you know, through, through that marketing plan, um, kind of identifying where there might be gaps and then shifting sometimes advertisement or marketing to draw in more people who might not be typically using, uh, the golf course. And, um, and also, I think it would be good to understand the investments that have been made by the operators so we can understand how much is the city investing into this, how much is the operator investing in, and kind of where um, where all the, the money is kind of penciling out. Um, but thank you. Councilman Brown? Yeah, I also want to thank you, uh, to thank you, Mr. Elliott, and also the folks who have kept the De La Viega golf course well maintained for so long. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just really nice to be up there and, and I appreciate the other uh, kind of benefits of, of having that space in addition to um, being able to golf on it. Um, so the park aspect. Um, I also wanna mention because I was not aware until recently, um, or I, I guess I hadn't really um, had it presented to me in that manner that Yes, the city has made a, a, bit, a large contribution to improvements for the um, the clubhouse, the lodge, the grill, um, that facility. And but the the 
operator has as well. And, and so I want to recognize that and um, not suggest that any of my comments or, or interests here want to suggest that um, we don't, aren't aware of that, don't appreciate that, and um, are not, I'm not suggesting that we kind of renege on, you know, negotiations that we've made and, and the contract is established. But I do think it's important to ha um, have some additional information about that. Um, so I don't really feel comfortable. And I, I also wanted to say I appreciate the the pl planning that's gone in. I, you know, I want to support the staff recommendation in terms of the near-term strategy and long-term planning. Um, I don't feel comfortable making a decision about, you know, three years out on rate, the rate structure without having a better understanding and um, you know some kind of business plan presented to us. I'd like the Parks and Rec Commission, I, apparently they were interested in this and I'd like for them to be able to look at that as well. Um, and I also want to say that I am very happy to hear our Parks Director uh, suggest that the, the, the department is not interested in um, contracting out the maintenance um, because while I it, it could certainly save uh, a significant amount. I think there's uh, there was big loss there. Um, I, I don't generally don't support contracting out public services as a public course. It is the, if it's going to be the people's golf course, um, and we should be the people of Santa Cruz should um, be be able to um, have maintain those um, you know better paid, uh, benefited positions, union jobs. So um, I wouldn't support contracting that out to say as a way to save money. Um, I know it's not on the table right now, but I just wanted to say that since you brought it up. Thank you for that. Um, and I think I'll leave it there um, for now, but that's aside from the rate structure. Um, I appreciate where you're going, you know, making a definitive decision today about that. I'm not comfortable with, but um, the rest of it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if we can get the recommendations put back up. At this point, I think we have two potential folks interested in the motion, and I'm wondering, I think, if I uh, could see, uh, you have one written out, is that correct? Maybe Councilmember Cohen, we can have uh, us all look at that, and you can see if there's alignment potentially with your direction, and if not, we can... Mine, mine was going to be very straightforward, frankly. Okay. Well, but why don't we pass, pass it out? It why don't you? you, so you I'm, gonna ma I'm gonna make a motion, uh, and I'm just gonna pass it out. Um, if if folks would, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna make a substitute motion. If you want, um, I'll make a substitute motion. If if Councilmember Matthews wants to go forward, or we just talk about this one first, and maybe see what see what happens. Well, I just, um, Councilmember Matthews, I'm, I'm sort of stuck here because Councilmember Matthews brought to my attention an interest in making a motion uh, prior to, to Councilmember Crone. So why don't we go ahead and um, honor that? Uh, why don't you make your motion? If it's required that we do a substitute motion, we'll do that. Um, but I uh, just want to acknowledge the fact that that was brought to my attention. Go right ahead. Could I take just a minute to look at this? Why don't you, yeah, that would be, that would be ideal. I think maybe, given what I think I'm seeing here, why don't we go ahead and have Councilmember Crone make the motion? We can divide the question if necessary to areas where there might be alignment. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm disappointed because I was very honest that I wanted to make my motion and I feel like I've been preempted. Okay, what, I, I, I will honor that, I agree. Okay, go right ahead, make your motion. My motion was simply going to be to um, um, 
accept and uh, adopt the proposed draft operations plan for De La, De La Viega Golf Course. Um, and I would be happy to um, add um, other elements to that, some of which are reflected here. I think many of the items re reflected in Council Member Crone's motion um, were implicit in the uh, presentation that was given to us and in the operations plan, so they don't need to be called out specifically. But my, uh, w the motion I'd like to put on the floor is um, um, accept and adopt the uh, draft operations plan for the Delaviega Golf Course. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. I'll go ahead, I'll second that for the purposes of discussion and maybe we can build on that from there. Um, I would just say what I see here that seems entirely uh, uh, consistent with the discussion that's been had, it would be to look at variable rate pricing. I, I believe if I could get feedback, that's something that you <coughs> could be incorporated in what you've laid out already, isn't it? Correct, yeah, what we've talked about today are the uh, kind of the base rates um, and around that base is where we have the variable rate pricing. So um, that is already in effect, uh, but with the current rates, so that would apply to these new updated rates as well. Yeah, um, certainly in consultation with the water department discussed and returned to the city council with details concerning drilling and installation of future wells and I would say, or use of recycled water. That's consistent with what you've already laid out in the plan. So I would be happy to incorporate that. It's it's uh, already in it. Um, um, work with a vendor and visit Santa Cruz developing uh, a marketing plan. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily intent of eliminating the current deficit. I would say achieving um, um, uh, uh, greater uh, uh, fiscal sustainability for the course. Um, but I think the intent is there. Um, vendor will provide a business plan in order to determine how much the agreement with the city may be worth. Well, to my mind, that that's number one in Council Member Crone's proposal and also examining the current vendor agreement with the city and discuss specifics. We have an existing agreement. And so that's what we have. Um, and this, I believe, um, is comparable to when we uh, make leases with the wharf merchants. That's, that's what I think of most. But we also make leases with our properties in the downtown garages. We have a number of commercial leases around the city. And when those come to us, my recollection is that the specifics of those are in closed session because there's some confidential information there. And we, uh, in none of those do we expect the business operator to, in a public session, reveal all their finances, but we depend on our staff to go over the business plan that they present and uh, what their, um, uh, the strength of their business plan, what they're putting into it, et cetera, et cetera. Why do we believe that they will be successful? And that's part of what they review in great detail and comes to us. So I'm not at all comfortable with uh, number one uh, or number four, because I think we have an existing agreement. Um, it's certainly legitimate that the council might want to, they're new council members, they might want to understand the thinking that went into that, but that to my mind would be a closed session discussion. So if I'm understanding you correctly, your motion is to uh, move the recommendation to incorporate um, two, three, five, five into your motion um, as elements that were brought forward by Councilmember Crone and then not incorporate the remainder? Is that the motion? Uh, yeah, the uh, and I, I'm still processing all future improvement expenses of the course, including irrigation, water, vendor agreement uh, and water use be covered by green fees, vendor agreements, and any grants. Again, I, I don't want to be absolute in that because I think we do make, um, uh, certainly we do subsidize currently virtually all our parks and rec facilities and activities, which I think is 100% appropriate. People expect good parks and rec programs from their city and they get them and they love them. Um, it, uh, it's already been discussed that the golf course particular has been a very 
fluid and dynamic uh, industry over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so of course we're looking at it. Um, but um, I, I think the uh, operations plan that we've been given anticipates all these elements, but it's not rigid. Okay. So, so we'll go ahead and maybe, so it seems like, again, I'm, 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 I'm pretty sympathetic to a lot of these, but I'm not comfortable with the uh, exact language. So anyway, okay, that's where we're going. So in the interest of hopefully coming in an area that we can see alignment, and um, it sounds to me that there is possibility for us to find commonality between mm -hmm. the uh, motion on the floor, elements that have been incorporated from the proposal by Councilmember Crone, and then I'll go ahead and hand it over to Councilmember Crone to, if you'd like to further discuss. Thank you. Your, can thank I just Mayor. clarify yeah. something really quick? Yep. Just the the minutes was to adopt the draft, including two, three, and five. At this time. That Council Member Crone hands. That's the motion at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then further discussion on. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, I think we can do this. I think we can erase this deficit. Um, and th this is, we're not talking about the overall De La Viega Park. We're talking about an enterprise known as the, 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 the De La Vieja Golf Course and Lodge. And, you know, if you look, just to respond to um, Councilmember Matthews, there's a line in our report here in front of us, 18.5, you, you said we're looking out and we're gonna erase this deficit or we're going to uh, improve the situation because the lines on the chart here on 18.14 of our packet even to 2022, we still have a $500,000 deficit. And in 2010, because I, I, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I sat through this in 98 to 2002. And, that, and, and I think when I came off the council, the golf course became from an enterprise fund, which our enterprise funds usually um, you know, are self-sustaining and, and, and generate something. Uh, it became a uh, part of the general fund, and I don't know what year that happened. Um, in 2010, just to follow up on what Councilmember Matthew said, Kaiser Marston Associates produced a report to the City of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation Department with data and trends of the De La Viega Golf Course in comparison to courses around the Bay Area. The purpose of the report was to evaluate the performance of the golf course and develop strategies to make it self-supporting. This was you know, almost 10 years ago. We were talking, we were 20 years ago when I was on the council, I think with you in 98, 99, we were talking about making the golf course self-sustaining. Um, my sense is that we can, that we can do this. We can, we can get it to be self-sustaining. I just think it needs the, the fact that the, uh, for example, the operator uh, not showing up today um, doesn't really help the situation. I, I don't, I don't understand that uh, at all. I'm looking for my motion. I had a, um, I want to speak to it. Uh, um, <laughs> I attended, the, uh, I, I think what's critical, and that will, the reason I'm gonna make a substitute motion, I think it's critical that we send this back to the Parks and Rec um, Commission. I know, I, would, I sat through their meeting yesterday. Um, I missed the last 10 or 15 minutes of their discussion on this item. This is the very last one on their agenda. Uh, but they're very interested in this. There was, there was lively discussion uh, from the Parks and Rec. And um, have, after having spoken with two commissioners, they would very much, you know, be, be in support of, the, of of a motion like this as well. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make a substitute motion. Do I have to make the motion first, um, Tony, or or just the fact that I'm making a substitute motion? The, my substitute motion would be a motion to direct staff to work with Parks and Recreation Commission and the vendor Lausalot family and return to the council at the first meeting in February with a two-year. It's, it's very important that we put some pressure right now. A two-year plan to balance the golf course budget, eliminate any future deficit, and move the business city relationship to solvency. In order to carry this out, out the solvency plan and avoid past losses, which range from 300,000 to 750,000 per year, over 3.5 million since 2013, according to our staff report, of the general fund expenditures over the several, past several years, the city council directs Parks and Rec Commission, the city staff, and the vendor to meet. Uh, and you've seen my, my motion, it's up on the screen, um, and, that's the, and, I, and I would add a number eight, and that would be to develop a revenue policy as uh, the Parks and Rec Director 
uh, said that they will be working on, um, which I think is a great idea. So that's, that's my motion. Okay, so there's a substitute motion by Council Member Crone. Is there a second up for the substitute motion? Second. Okay, seconded by Council Member Brown. So what we would do at this point is um, make a, uh, take a vote whether or not to adopt the substitute motion. If that fails, then we would go back to the original motion, correct? That's right. Uh, just a, a concern that occurred to me is um, to the extent we have existing agreements with the operators, I think part of that report back would be the constraints under which the city is currently operating given its current contractual obligations. But what I was thinking was is the lease agreement, and I know we spoke and you said you might get the council a copy of that. I haven't, I have not seen it yet, but I was hoping the group could also look at that lease agreement um, to, to find, to see if there's any room, not that they're gonna be negotiating for the city, but uh, the business evidently runs on, you know, green fees. You wanna keep them at a certain level to bring people to the park and then sell them, you know, um, uh, stuff from the, the, the pro shop as well as, you know, stay for dinner and, you know, buy drinks, whatever. And I thought there was some room for looking at that and that if the, the um, Tim Laustelot was involved in this, that we, we can get a better idea and we can get some good recommendations from our, our, um, from our commission. But if you're saying that possibly uh, you examine the vet current vendor agreement with the city and discuss specifics uh, with the vendor. That's what you don't, that's what the one you're not, not comfortable with. I, I have no problem with the discussions. I'm just, I just want this conversation to be in the context of existing contractual commitments, which may have a bearing on our ability to carry out all of these uh, directions. So I'm, I'm going to go forward with that motion, and I'm going to. I would really like to see the Parks and Rec Commission take this this issue up, and I would really love to see our golf course get a big, a burst of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. So in two years we can have we can zero out this this deficit. Okay, so we could, um, Vice Mayor, come here. I just have a, can I ask a question, the Parks and Rec directly, because my understanding <clears throat> is that ideally what we're trying to do overall is you know, get rid of our deficit. Um, and that, you know, the, the today is that we're adopting a draft of this and that based on the recommendations and all the information that you've heard today that um, we're gonna get another draft report coming forward to us, kind of really flush out some of the details around um, pricing and all the, the aspects we've spoken about today. Is that correct? Uh, that's a draft. We yeah. Would, we would be adopting it. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. But, Correct. And, Correct. I, and I'm saying, well. Okay. Okay. So Council Member Crona, then Council Member Matthews. Uh, I'm saying since there was so many missing, you know, and it's not our director's fault, it's just the, what's going on is that the, the, the vendor wasn't here and there's just like, a, I've heard of that, the, about six questions that were left unanswered, a couple of, uh, by, you, by yourself. And that's, that's, that's what I would think would come back to us after Parks and Recreation Commission takes another bite at it. Yeah, I, I think that's the side that we're missing, frankly. I think everything that's in the draft operations plan is um, is about our, our complete proposal for you. Um, so the adoption of that, I don't think there's anything much that would change uh, necessarily unless directed by the city council. But the piece that we would come back with uh, based on the direction uh, so far would be uh, the, essentially the financials from the operator um, and then the, the lease that we've talked about and as the city attorney said, within the within the context of the lease, what may be flexible and what's not flexible to have to have a broader discussion. Okay, Councilmember Matthews, and then I have a quick comment. Um, one one of the um, actually several concerns I have with the uh, current substitute motion is that um, by February there'd be a two-year plan to balance the golf's budget. That is a highly accelerated. I think what we're talking about here is some three-year projections, but the idea that those trends would continue out and we'd see resolution closer to five years. Am I, am I? Yeah, the, the challenge out? the challenge with the, the two years, and if that's the direction of council, we'll certainly bring it back in, in February. Um, a couple things, so the restaurant uh, likely will not open until late fall or early winter this year. Um, and so the timing of that will have a, maybe a couple months before we would review that with council in February. 
The other piece of it is the, the new rates that we've proposed, we could implement those upon the direction of city council, we could implement those at any time. Um, but the most appropriate time that we've discussed with uh, our operator would be to implement those in the spring. So that's kind of the beginning of the new golf season. So we would implement the new pricing effective probably around April 1. Um, and so a, a review in February, again, can do, certainly do that, um, but it would be uh, prior to those new uh, revenues. I, I'll just have a quick question, then we'll, we'll take a vote on the substitute Well, motion. I have one more question, very specific. To okay, this. why don't you finish your specific? And um, understanding, I think, a general interest in accelerating this, but my interest is, is being rational about it, and you've talked about some of the timing issues here, and also the pacing of them. Um, what direction, if, if we were to proceed with adopting the operating plan as presented, could there be further direction to look for opportunities to accelerate closing the gap without fatally damaging the overall underlying philosophy? Do you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. Um, in terms of rates, kind of setting the those rates, rates sooner? Or? The well, yeah. yeah. You know, all, the, all, the, <laughs> all the things that might uh, contribute to closing the gap. Mm -hmm. um, or is so, this about yeah. as fast as you see it being able to happen? In terms of, again, the restaurant implementation of pricing, I think that, th again, we can bump that up a little bit on the pricing anyway. Um, I would say, and I, I don't mean to speak on behalf of our operator, but it's in their best interest to get this right as soon as possible um, for no other reason than their own, than, than their own um, self-interest, frankly, um, since it's a for-profit for us, certainly. Um, uh, the same thing, you know, we wanna get this right. Um, we wanna make sure our staff feels comfortable the direction we're going. And so, yeah, the, the sooner we can um, turn this around and make it happen, certainly we will do everything we can. Well, thank you. I guess I'll just say before we take the vote to accept the substitute motion that there's elements that I agree here with. Um, I think one of the areas that I have concern about is sort of the, the pace and speed in which it's outlined here and kind of knowing how these sort of transitions work. I, I don't, at the cost of it not being the people's, you know, golf course, that seems like a risk to me. Um, I do think that there's areas where it's already sort of aligned with the existing um, plan that is being proposed to us at this time. I think that it's going to be a sort of somewhat fluid process. There's obviously an interest in have from, the, from the council to have this a bit accelerated. Um, but at the, um, for me, I just, I don't feel comfortable with this uh, specifically outlined to have a completely cost recovery process in place within two years. I think partially what we have here before us is an opportunity to kind of be in action, but to move us in the direction that we want to go. And so I am hopeful that um, regardless what the outcome is today, that there's this interest in maintaining this stewardship, this environmental stewardship, this social element of it, but this business model that's gonna work for our community that isn't gonna be jeopardized by um, a more accelerated pace. So it's sort of finding that balance. So I, um, I, I, I just, I recognize that there's elements that I agree with your proposal, Councilmember Member Crone, um, and I think I feel more comfortable with the integrated proposal that was brought forward with the original motion, but right now we're voting on the substitute motion, so we should go ahead and take a vote whether or not to accept that. Mr. Correct. Gondotti? Okay. And then we'll go to you, Vice Mayor. So, uh, um, you have a question? question around the this. substitute yeah, motion? The substitute motion. We'll have a further clarification around the substitute motion specifically then. I'm just wondering if there is an opportunity to incorporate you know, um, the timeline, well, having this go to the Parks and Rec Director, some of this information to be incorporated with providing us with the timeline. So rather than having um, the... Um, Why don't we go ahead and take the vote to whether or not to accept the substitute motion, and if there were amendments at that time, then we would go ahead and have that conversation around adjusting the changes. Does that seem accurate to how sure. we would flow? Okay. So though all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Okay, so that fails, um, that is, so we had three in favor, Councilmember Crone, Glover, and Brown, um, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself voting against. So we have a tie with Councilmember Myers absent. That's correct. So we'll go ahead and- uh, Motion fails. So the motion fails. Right. So we go back to the original motion then, is that correct? Correct. 
Okay, so by default, then that goes back to the original motion. So the original motion brought forward is now the motion for debate on the table, on the table, and that is to accept the staff recommendation and then to incorporate two, three, and five of Councilmember Crone's recommendation into the motion at this time. Is that feel accurate, Councilmember Matthews? Yeah, and I'm. Uh, I will see if I can find a way to in include a couple of the other elements as well. Um, so let's just go ahead and pause for the purposes of the clerk. So do you, are you uh, where you need to be with the motion that we're debating at the same? Okay. okay, so as we move forward, we can be very specific and clear about what we're trying to do. Um, clearly the um, council members are interested in the vendor agreement. Um, uh, I would be willing to uh, add, um, provide to council members uh, background information on the vendor agreement um, and business plan. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just leave it at that because of my concern about um, confidential information. So council member Brown and then uh, council member uh, Glover. And then vice mayor, did you? Yeah, I, um, you know, I wish I could support this because I um, I do feel like um, it's moving in the right direction, but I feel like right now we are at a place where um, we have not, there has been no pressure to do anything. And as a result, nothing has happened for a long, long time. And I do not want to spend any time hashing out or rehashing what has been come before, but I'm just saying that to provide the context for the sense of urgency that I feel about um, asking the you know the Parks and Rec Commission, the the staff, and the operator to put their heads together to see if we can move faster. And if we don't vote to say that we we are going to do that, then I don't see a whole lot changing. So. Um, that is is a challenge for me. I also think that with respect, and I appreciate Council Member uh, Matthews, your willingness to um, try to get some additional information from the vendor. But I think a, a business, you know, a business that has no business plan, and I'm not saying the operator doesn't. We just we don't have it, and so I feel like that is um, you know a, a way that we could um, get a better handle on the you know the possibilities and limits because I don't feel like we have that now and um, so I, I can't make decisions about that set in stone a very very small percentage increase in our rates um, and I understand and we've talked about not I'm not interested in um, just moving so rapidly that there's a major sticker shock but if we're talking about less than you know like maybe two percent a year increase for the next three years and we lock that in today um, without seeing that, having some of that additional conversation and, and access to information. I just don't feel comfortable with that. So um, I can't support this um, motion. We have Councilmember Glover, but uh, if I could be for, for clarification, my understanding is that there's sort of, there's the legal constraints possibly associated with some of the contractual requirements of our relationship with the vendor but also um, that there is the potential for us to get that information, to use that information to inform the strategies moving forward and potentially accelerate those. Does that preclude us from trying to get to where we want to be or if we adopt it as is today, in your opinion? I might look at the city attorney to help answer that. I don't think so. I mean, I think essentially what the council is asking for is additional information to help guide that decision making, if I understand. Uh, so we can, with the commission or with council, follow up with that information to help to help guide where we go. Um, but I think it's a matter of the, the actual lease in terms of what can we speed up? Can we look at those percentages differently? I think uh, I would pr uh, assume that we're limited on our ability to change those, but I think there could be information from those that could help guide the council. So if we were to adopt this, I guess we're more, sorry, for further clarification. Mm -hmm. So we were to adopt this plan tonight or today, then um, and then receive that information that could, that could potentially inform modifications to the plan essentially in the future, correct? Yeah, I think so. So I think it's kind of a both and if, if I'm hearing you correctly. Okay, I'm gonna go to Council Member Clever, uh, Glover and then back to Council Member Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings. 
Thank you. So very uh, disappointed that we didn't accept the substitute motion. Uh, and I'm also not feeling very supportive of this original motion for a variety of reasons. Uh, the possibility of legal restraints. So I hear that, but are there legal constraints? Do we know? Seems like we should explore the issues and then come back with these are the legal constraints before we decide or had I've been aware of this motion in advance of the meeting I would have had an opportunity to to Absolutely. review those documents yeah I mean but at, at this moment we don't know if there are any legal constraints um, so to uh, re require request or to direct the exploration into looking at the, <coughs> examining the current vendor agreement uh, as well as some of the other aspects I think is, uh, isn't something that should be stopping us personally. Um, also, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, I could use the term irresponsible, but I think it is problematic to use the term rational uh, when talking about a proposition or a suggestion being made by uh, people on this body, because that suggests that the suggestion that was made is irrational. And I don't think that it is an irrational statement or an irrational goal to possibly come back at an expedited t expedited timeline uh, with a potential way to solve a deficit, uh, especially when the staff said that if we gave that direction, there would be the possibility to come back. And even if, per se, you weren't able to come back on that first week of February, you could let us know and say, hey, I need another two weeks or whatever it is. Um, but it, again, creates that sense of pressure, as Councilmember Brown mentioned. Uh, also, it seems like there's a desire to have the conversation of lease agreements behind closed doors. Now, I don't know, is the lease confidential? The lease is not, but lease negotiations generally are. Right, but I mean, this is to uh, examine the current vendor agreements and then look at different aspects of it with regards, and then, and then having a business plan. It just seems like we need to especially with a uh, operator that's operated for such a long period of time. I have no idea how much their investments have been in the, this is the first time I've heard that they've made investments and they're not here to tell me about their investments. So I'm just really disconcerted about this and I, it makes me wonder like we want to close this deficit, right? So why are we doing it as Councilmember uh, Crone pointed out uh, on a timeline now, this is a no fault of yours st staff, so I wanna make sure that's very clear, but why are we as a policy making body okay with the possibility of even after uh, plenty of years not meeting that deficit goal and not taking a more aggressive or proactive stance on making sure that people are paying their fair share and we are not, again, balancing our budget on the back of the poor or low income of the community when they wanna access golf. So. Uh, I'm, again, really disappointed, and I will not be supporting this motion. I think we had Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor coming, so then we'll go ahead and take the vote. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment on the question about the contractual relationship. In no way am I suggesting that I would support doing something in violation of that or, or proposing something like that. I mean, this is a, an attempt to have a conversation uh, with the various parties that are involved to see if there's a way to accelerate our timeline here. And um, so it, if it turns out, you know, if the operator suggests that that appears to be in violation of their contra contract, then we can come back and ha revisit that and figure out what to do. There, it, there's nothing that, there's no violation to ask the question, can you provide us with this information? Can we have a conversation? So that's where I just I am at on that one. And that is um, the reason, if that's how you would support, you won't support the motion even if that's incorporated into the action moving forward as part of the recommendation so that we can still be in action but still use that information to inform potentially an accelerated route if that were incorporated into the motion in the interest of trying to get us maybe moving on this potentially. Um, I'm gonna defer to, I, I, I'll, I can answer your question in a moment but I'll, let people who are wanting to speak speak. Okay, just something to think on. And then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Members. So one thing, looking at what has been brought to us today, some of the other recommendations that have been made by Council Member Crone, um, I think that one of the things that we can do is move the item and then provide a motion <laughs> that I'm hopefully making as a separate motion. But, and I can, I don't wanna state it all now, but having this motion move forward and then having Parks and Rec, the vendor, the, par um, the Parks Department 
work on a business plan and to pr to bring back recommendations on a timeline for that business plan to close the gap. I think that these are two separate things, that we have an operations plan that we want to have for the golf course to move forward. There's also a desire for a marketing plan. There's also a desire for a business plan, neither of which have been fleshed out. And so if we can provide direction on that, I think that's a separate item than moving forward with the operations plan as it's been brought to us within the corporate, with the incorporation of um, the items that have been uh, suggested by Council Member uh, Crone. I follow your rationale. I follow your rationale. Okay, Council Member Crone. <coughs> Councilmember Matthews, and then back to Councilmember Brown. The whole reason I, mean, I, I consulted you before before this motion, even to get your input, was for there to be a little bit more democracy going on here. That the Parks and Rec Commission actually looks at all of this. We still can have this conversation. I was I was trying to get more input from Parks and Rec when I saw the dearth of of uh, responses because the absence of the vendor here today, we don't have that information. I don't think we have to move forward with the operations plan. It's not like, we're, it's not hinging, the operations plan, not hinge, you know, our vote today, there's not gonna be anything that different, I don't believe, that's gonna take place until we hear back from Parks and Rec uh, in February. In fact, the director said, we probably won't put fees up, green fees, up until um, April. So. There is some time here, and, and, and I was hoping to save time in this discussion so we'd have a future discussion, but instead we're having this discussion now, because there's a whole bunch more to say about the operations plan um, that hasn't been said as well, and I was hoping maybe Parks and Rec could look it over, give us their input. They had a brief look at it. They didn't really um, be able to go over it uh, super well. Again, I think it could be a both and, and we can mm -hmm. still be in action and still refine along the way. So I, I think at a certain, personally, I feel like at a certain point, we have to make decisions and with the information that we have to the best of our ability and we'll have an opportunity to refine it. So I prefer to move forward with something and then knowing that we'll refine it along the way. So we have Council Member Matthews Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then we'll go ahead and maybe see if we can get to uh, I am also happy to add, um, um, condition that um, directs um, uh, staff uh, working with the uh, vendor um, to come back with um, uh, or to explore immediate options to accelerate the revenue above the currently stated levels through both um, uh, um, vendor um, arrangements and uh, fee adjustments. So. So that's an added element that I'll accept that mm -hmm. as an additional, as the seconder of the motion. That, yeah. Uh huh. I think kind of gets at some of the areas that we want to discuss. Vice Mayor Kevin, oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Kevin. Well, I'm just going to reiterate I'm not comfortable setting the green fees for, because I, I don't think it's a both and. If we set those fees now, without the information, when I personally am saying, I'd like to have that information in order to make a decision about setting the fees, particularly given that we cannot interfere with the existing contract, if that is the only way to increase revenues for the city, that we are, we are just eliminating that um, leverage, that opportunity, that possibility for ourselves. So I don't, feel comfortable doing that today. I um, appreciate the language about uh, in consultation with the operator considering, uh, you know, revenue, uh, you know, other possibilities, but to leave it in the operator's hands. Not exclusively, ours as well. Okay. Um, so you're saying, you're suggesting then. What, what could well, we each okay, well, do? Okay, well, you clarify, you can go ahead. If you could sorry. clarify that for me, because I, I, again, I'm just, I, I want to try to be clear about my Basically, position here. I want staff Matthews. to go back, talk with the operator, our own staff, our own Parks and Rec staff, and what you know about the industry and the market. I mean, that's what's so important. What's out there? And what could we do to just accelerate a little bit? And, and I, I fully endorse the... the concept behind the initial proposal, we're not going to do a wholesale overnight, one, one big leap, that, that disrupts the, <laughs> the ecosystem. Um, but can we, can we do some more to increase 
our revenue and cut our, our costs in the shorter term so we can start closing that gap sooner. You've heard this loud and clear. Mm -hmm. yep. Does that get at what you were hoping to have addressed, Councilman Brown? Well, um, unfortunately, no, because um, without setting a time for this to return to us, um, as a like, I thought February was pretty reasonable, um, and uh, sending it to the Parks and Recreation Commission, which, as um, Councilmember Crone suggested, was a way to kind of try to flush that out before coming to us to hash these items out without, or you know, with only part of the information and speculation about it. I, no, I, I, it doesn't, unfortunately. So um, I'm, I can't support this motion. Thanks, Mayor Cummings, and then I just have one clarifying question. Take the vote. Just gonna. See if we can make a, if I can make a friendly amendment that we um, take the considerations that have been brought forward by Councilmember Matthews and the mayor, and send these back to the Parks and Rec Commission, and we bring this back for review after the council has had an opportunity to review the lease agreement and the Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, how does that fit in that a substitute motion? adopting the operations plan? It would be putting it all on hold until after that review. Until after we had that review. That's a different motion. <laughs> okay. Okay. I will yeah. second it if it's a motion. Well, okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and. Um, I would suggest that, I mean, it's pretty, pretty yep. clear the direction this is going. I'd recommend that you vote on the motion that's motion. on the floor that's right. and then make a follow up motion if the. Motion fails. Okay, let's go ahead and take the vote um, at this point. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. Okay, so that's a tie vote at this point. So with so that was uh, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself voting in favor, Councilmember Brown, Crone, and Councilmember Glover voting against, with Councilmember Myers absent. Okay. I, I would like to make a motion that I, I, we, I'm gonna go, we I do my I motion. Didn't acknowledge you. I didn't acknowledge you quite yet. Well, I, I realize that you, I will acknowledge you, but I saw Councilmember Matthews and then Vice Mayor Cummings, and I'll come back to you. So Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crown. What's typically done or sometimes done is to bring it back at the next meeting. We'll have seven people. Um, there will also be a week for people to think really hard on this. <laughs> so that's a suggestion. Vice Mayor Cummings? Yeah, I'm just going to stick with the friendly amendment that I had that we, you know. It is now a motion. Which is now a motion. <laughs> okay, to, <laughs> yeah, the motion will be to um, adopt the recommendations that were brought forward by um, Council Member Matthews and Vice Mayor Watkins um, with the, under, the understanding that they will come back to the Council and Parks and Rec Commission after each group has had a chance to review the um, agreements with the that the city made with the operator. So a motion to adopt the original motion, but have that temporarily um, under review for further suspended, suspended temporarily suspended until brought forward. On. Is that correct? Is it, to what the is the I, I'm not. I'm sure. I guess I'm not clear on the motion. No, it doesn't make any sense. So the motion would be that. We take what was agreed upon by Councilmember Matthews and, Council, and uh, Mayor Watkins. That would go to the Parks and Rec Commission for review, and it would come back to the City Council after both the Council and the Parks and Rec Commission have had a chance to review the agreement between the operator and the city. Okay, so there's a motion. I just interject that in the absence mm -hmm. of a of a majority vote on this item, the. Uh, council member guidelines require that the matter be brought back at the next meeting uh, if the tie vote is the result of an uh, of an absence. So it seems that that's already predetermined for us at this point. Is that correct? Uh, it's, I think it's not unlikely. So why don't we go ahead and just recognize that this is just going to come back to us for further discussion based on our city attorney's interpretation of the fact that the motion failed on a tie vote. Is that correct? Yeah, what the rule says specifically is that a tie vote during the absence of one of, or more council members um, shall cause the item to be automatically continued, typically to the next meeting, except as to matters on which action must be taken on a date prior to the next meeting. 
Okay, so I interpret that the same way that you do, which means that we'll go ahead and move this. I am concerned about it coming on the next meeting again, to be quite frank with you. So it might have to be. It's not required that you have it. Okay, the next so meeting. if we'll have some discretion over the timing. So there you have it. We have uh, no action at this point, tie vote. So we'll have it return at a future meeting in the future time. You can bring that proposal forward at a. We're going to go ahead and have that motion withdraw, withdrawn at this time because of the fact that that already predetermined the outcome. <laughs> Councilmember Matthews, uh, I just want to say, if it's not going to come back for a couple of weeks, that gives a, a good chunk of time for people to get a lot of information and maybe come up with some further suggestions. Sure. Vice yep. Mayor Cummings. There's a motion needs to be made for us to receive the contract to be able to review that because that's been the yeah. biggest concern. Cool. Today, so that'll be. I think yeah. that could be done. Just a request to staff. That's a request. Yeah, that, that, we'll that, that can be included in the packet for okay. the next Okay, Council Member Kern. Well, and also my interest is also uh, creating a culture of of when the Parks and Rec Commission. I, I I'm pretty sure the Parks and Rec Commission did not take up the the original lease, and I think that delegating responsibilities like that gives the council, you know, a broader input when it comes to us. And so that was my main thing of sending this stuff to the Parks and Rec was to develop a culture of folks reviewing really um, important, significant stuff that's within the realm of Parks and Recreation. Okay. 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 So we're going to go ahead and move on to item number 19. Tony. Hi. <laughs> All right, still here. Here we go. All right, this one will be short. Harvey West Pool. Okay, go right ahead. All right, uh, so this is regarding the Harvey West Pool. Um, and let me switch over. Is it coming? Okay, thank you. All right. The volume is up on this. We'll have a nice uh, audio in our transitions here. This should be exciting. I don't know if we'll have it. You can, can barely hear that. <laughs> Sorry. A park, little Parks and Rec uh, uh, addition there. Okay, so the background on the Harvey West Pool, so similar uh, in the context of the discussion in the uh, spring budget hearings, uh, the City Council directed staff to uh, look at different options to operate Harvey West Pool uh, on a more regular basis. So a little bit of background here. Um, beginning in the early 2000s, uh, the City Council directed Parks and Rec, uh, the Parks and Rec Department to make cuts to the Harvey West Pool uh, to reduce expenditures. So similar discussion to what we're having today. Uh, in 2008, the department ceased full-time operations of the pool uh, in an effort to reduce costs and increasing uh, contributions from the city's general fund to support operations. So again, very similar story. Since 2008, the department has leased pool programming operations to an external contractor, uh, uh, Jim Booth Swim School, uh, and the pool has remained open only from March uh, through November each year. Uh, during the 2020 budget hearings, um, the city council directed the department staff to explore operational options related to Harvey West Pool. Um, again, it's open seasonally, operated by Jim Booth Swim School for swim lessons. Uh, the parks division uh, maintains and manages the pool from an aquatics and facility uh, standpoint. The recreation division manages the contract with Jim Booth Swim School uh, and coordinates special events at the pool, such as Family Fun Day. Uh, so again, the background, the city council expressed interest um, back this spring uh, in evaluating strategies to open the pool year round. Um, so the purpose of the document that's part of your uh, agenda packet this evening, again, an operations plan of sorts, um, uh, the, the purpose of that is to present the operational and fiscal details related to the current operation and a couple different options uh, for future year-round operations. So we'll get into these. So this is pretty straightforward, hopefully, uh, on this one. <laughs> So option number one, I'm not sure if you're catching that sound effect there. Uh, so it's, it's a, a dive into a pool, I think is what that is. Um, the, so this is the current operation, as we uh, mentioned earlier, approximately $172,000 a year to operate the pool uh, with annual revenues in the ballpark of $74,000. So the net general fund impact each year is about $100,000, just shy. Um, under any of these options, option one, two, or three that we will discuss, we really need a capital investment um, at Harvey West Pool. Uh, the boiler and our heating system uh, is failing, um, and we've barely patched this together to keep it up and running. 
but we also need accessibility improvements from an ADA standpoint and facility upgrade. So any of these options, um, the recommendation from staff is that council um, approve or uh, consider approval for the fiscal year 21 budget, uh, capital funds uh, that could go to making these necessary upgrades at the pool. Uh, unfortunately, these are not um, available for Quimby funds or park tax funds since they're uh, maintenance related. So it would have to be essentially general fund um, CIP dollars for this. Option two, the estimated annual budget for a year round operation is approximately 1.2 million. The estimated annual revenue is 400,000. Uh, now the assumption there is that we could get to 400,000, but it's gonna take a little while. We've not operated the pool year round. Um, in almost 20 years. And so, um, I'm sorry, a little over 10 years, I suppose. Um, and uh, so we would need to get back up to this point of revenue, but we think once we get uh, to that point, uh, we could bring in $400,000 in annual revenue. So the net uh, general fund impact would be about eight, just about $800,000 a year. Another option would be the um, uh, a potential partnership. So we've had discussions uh, with Santa Cruz County uh, Parks that operates Simpkins Swim Center. Um, and there may be some economies of scale with Simpkins. They um, obviously know how to run an aquatics facility uh, down to they make their own chlorine. So uh, they, they know how to do this. So we have discussed with the county a potential opportunity uh, to work with them uh, such that the city, uh, city parks would still maintain the pool. Um, uh, from, from a maintenance standpoint, operation standpoint, but the county would oversee the day-to-day -day operations, the lifeguard uh, function, uh, the front desk uh, function as well. And so under that model, we estimate that we would have to um, upgrade our efforts um, in terms of maintenance. So that would be a new maintenance staff, new supplies and so forth. Um, so we estimate that our city annual budget would be about $427,000. Um, under this model though, county parks would recoup all of the revenue. So they would take on the cost of operating the pool, much like our operator at the golf course uh, in a way, uh, but they would capture all of the revenue. The key for the county, uh, county parks, is that um, they, they would have to break even. It would have to be a break even proposition for them to, to do this. Um, if they were to make profit, then that money could come back to the city or we could establish a profit sharing um, a model with the county. But the, the first order of business would be for them um, to know if they could break even uh, in this relationship. So we're right to the recommendation. So um, we, um, in the context of uh, the budget reductions that we made into fiscal year 20 and forecasted uh, budget constraints. Staff recommends that we stick with option one at this point, which is the, the uh, uh, existing operations at the pool um, with about $100,000 subsidy uh, annually. Uh, we also recommend that council uh, consider the, strongly consider the needed capital investment for fiscal year 21 uh, for the heating system and facility improvements. And the last bullet point that's up here, this really comes from the recommendation that the Parks and Rec Commission made uh, yesterday evening. So we had this idea, we have this idea that's floating around that uh, we've called our community access idea. And the idea is, is pretty simple. It's that if we were to open Harvey West Pool year round, um, uh, let's make that investment in a way to lend toward getting every youth to our pool to learn how to swim. Uh, we are a coastal community. Uh, water safety is a huge, uh, important priority. And so we've discussed internally this idea uh, that rather than focusing on revenue, so this would fall under revenue policy, rather than focusing on that revenue, what if we essentially subsidize swim lessons so that every kid in Santa Cruz uh, could learn how to swim? And if they want to do advanced swim lessons, they could go to Simpkins or elsewhere. But this would be a way to engage every, every youth, every member of the community to get them to the pool uh, to become water safe and, and get that baseline swim lesson. Um, to do that, there's obviously a cost to do that. And so what the commission recommended last night in discussing this idea 
uh, is that um, they uh, recommended, um, staff's recommendation here to choose option one, but they also recommended that we uh, make this effort to engage the community, for example, uh, a donor, a sponsor who could help support uh, community <coughs> access to swim lessons. So um, the recommendation before you um, is what the Parks and Rec Commission recommended uh, last night as well. So open it up to any questions. Well, thank you. Okay, um, I just have one question, which you kind of answered, which was the constraints of the Quimby funds. Um, but in terms of potential capital dollars to to seek, would um, solar or Monterey Bay Community Powers or something like that be, has that been floated around as a potential option for a more sort of sustainable system there? Yeah, it's a good question. We have looked at on-bill financing potentially. Um, uh, Travis, do you want to weigh in on any of this? Yeah, let me get a little bit more details. We've looked at options. I'm not sure the specifics. Okay. I think there are a couple of, of issues at play here. Good evening, uh, Council Travis Beck, Superintendent of Parks. Um, <clears throat> what uh, Tony was just referring to is we have been exploring with Public Works the option of paying for <clears throat> improvements to the heating system through an on-bill financing mechanism. If we were able to do that, it would not require the input of uh, capital funds, either from the general fund or from our, our parks taxes. Um, we've also explored the possibility of doing a low interest loan um, through the, uh, the AMBAG. The, neither of those would create a, the sort of solar or all, uh, all green approach. However, uh, we have put in place uh, existing variable speed um, pumping systems that we're not able to fully utilize without making these capital uh, investments. So were we to, through whatever mechanism, create the, uh, fix the boiler problems that we have, we'd be able to get the energy savings that come um, from the other technology that's already in place. Okay, great. Other questions at this time? Questions? Councilmember Matthews. Quick one. Um, it sounds as though we really need to budget for those capital improvements. How we pay for them is, we'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. That's. Correct, yeah. <laughs> Question? Could you remind us how this got back to us? Uh, this, this was an item we discussed during the budget process back in the spring, uh, and it was a, I think, a directive to bring it back, uh, similar to the golf discussion, to look at different options uh, to operate the pool year round. So we've brought it back. So basically, the option one is operating the pool how long? Uh, from each year from March through November. And through that, we could, um, there are different ways. I know there have been different ideas among council members and community members on different types of programming that we could do at the pool. Um, so adopting the, the, the status quo, if you will, in terms of operation, doesn't preclude us from still being creative in terms of new programs. So there are things we can do within that time frame. Um, uh, but again, it's March through November and largely working with uh, our contractor through Jim Booth Swim School. What I heard was a consensus from council at that time that they, we wanted the pool open year round. So I guess this is the only option, either we spend $800,000 uh, or, or not. That's, that's, that's our only option going forward. Or, or the third option, which would be a partnership. We look at this partnership with the county, uh, such that the county would run the, the daily operation. So it wouldn't be an $800,000, it'd be a, a $400 plus thousand dollar uh, net annual impact. I'd love to hear from other council members if that's at all, um, in, I mean, we've, we've been at this for many years. I know we all have, and we'd like to see the pool open. Um, and it's not serving that many people right now. Okay, I'm wondering if there's any more questions at this time for staff, and then before, then we can move into deliberation and action. Question? Yes. Uh, so why option one and not option three? Is there a reason you don't want to work with the county and do the revenue share? Or? Um, we. I, I think really we're looking at it from the from the budget context, but I mean really um, we're just seeking the direction from council on this. We're relatively objective uh, on it. I think the fight. Oops, I'm not sure what I just did there. I'm sorry, Bonnie. Um, so the uh, the final option, the recommendation anyway. Um, on option one, leaves the door open to find a way, a more creative way to open it year round. Thank you. Um, and that would be to find, uh, to find some sort of um, sponsorship or grantor, uh, an endowment in some way, if you will, to help run it year round. That's something that 
um, this, this idea of getting community access to the pool uh, at no cost is a relatively new, at least among staff, a new concept that's come up. So we haven't had time to pursue it leading to this presentation today for council. Okay. Um, and do you see a value from your perspective as staff to subsidize that, to allow for 24 access, 24 hour access to the, uh, to the pool considering that we're spending roughly twice that to subsidize the golf course? Yeah, I think there's a need. I think there's a lot of interest. Uh, in the operations plan that we put forth, there's a, a, a market, much like the golf course, we've got a pool market. Um, and we know that swim lessons are expensive. Uh, and so there, you know, that's kind of where we lean toward how do we get uh, affordable or free swim lessons uh, out to the public. So we see a lot of value in it. Um, and really, again, we're relatively objective on this in terms of um, what the council directs us to do. The county is enthusiastic about this. Um, we would need to work through an agreement with them uh, that we would bring back to city council um, if council directed us to pursue option three. And what's the time on it? I just, I just heard that transfer sound, so now I know what you're talking about. It sounds like a rain stick, but um, yeah, what, what, what's the timeline associated with option three? That's a good question. We would work with the county following direction, immediately following uh, the council meeting um, this week, getting into next week. Um, it's a good, we'd have to coordinate with them in terms of their budget cycle, what our budget cycle is. Um, we, I suspect, would bring a budget recommendation to the City Council uh, in March, April, May of next year for fiscal year 21. Uh, so what I would suspect is that, um, it's a good question, it would be great to open the pool in spring or summer of 2020, but it's gonna be right before the budget cycle, so we'd have to reconcile that timing. Thank you. And I'll just, one last question before we open it up to public comment. My understanding is option three could be an element that's explored in option one. It doesn't necessarily, it, it could be a component of that, really, mm -hmm. those types of sub, okay. So I'm just saying, I think it's the other one's more encompassing, which I actually, I really like the idea mm -hmm. of every kid being able to learn how to swim for free in our community. Mm -hmm. But that could also incorporate a partnership as it is further fleshed out yep. in the future. Okay. One detail that uh, the park superintendent mentioned to me is our lease with uh, Jim Booth Swim School as well. So we'd, similar to the uh, operator discussion at the golf course, we'd wanna be sensitive to that existing lease. Okay, makes sense. Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Those here who want to address us on this item, please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes to speak to us on this item. I've been here for almost three hours. Two minutes seems kind of stingy, but <laughs> I'm a swimmer. I lap swim. I have two great grandchildren. I have brought them to the pool all summer long this year. Uh, I bring the kids on Monday and Friday. I swim Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. There are not only children in this community. There are adults and there are elders who would like lap swimming programs, who would like to have some water aerobics, and I want that pool open all year round. It is a gem in this community, and it has been wasted for years. And I want that pool open all year round for everybody, for the entire community. And um, as far as Jim Booth is concerned, um, I don't know, you know, having free swimming would certainly conflict with his program, but um, I definitely would like to see some programs for adults, for seniors in particular. Um, I have a daughter who has a disability. Swimming is the one exercise she can do. I have you no know, cartilage in my knees and my shoulders. Swimming is the one exercise that I can do. It is so conveniently located for West Side residents, and I would really, truly like to see it open. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Evening, Council. I want to uh, echo the previous uh, previous commenters' comments. Um, I lap swim as well at UCSC and Simpkins. Uh, they both have issues. UCSC has access issues as well as closure issues. When um, it's been closed all summer. It closes during school uh, breaks, and uh, just, you know, if you wanna go up there at night, which people who work usually do, sometimes um, it's just, it'd be great to have a pool in town. I think it's a basic expectation of a city of our size and wealth, <coughs> and um, it's, it's crazy that it hasn't been open in it. Most parks programs are subsidized, as the director mentioned at the beginning of the golf course presentation. I think this was, aside from, 
public safety, water, public works, I think the pool is sort of a basic, the most basic city function, and I think it's a disgrace that we haven't had it. Um, also in the, the, the report, you mentioned, I think it was under option three, under the longer discussion, you said keeping it open until six, that's not sufficient. If you're a working person and you want to lapse when you need it to be open at least until seven. Um, there's another way as well. San Lorenzo Valley residents can use the uh, SLV high school pool for a very nominal fee. Now, I'm, this is my property tax uh, assessment. There's 10 separate special assessments that I'm paying for the city schools. We paid one of the bonds, there's, there's six bonds and four special assessments. One of the bonds was to, to build the high school pool. Why can't you guys talk to the, the city, the school board, and get them to do what San Lorenzo Valley High does and open up the pool at night for the community? It only seems fair. They ask us as a community to support them, and we do. I'm happy to. I'm not begrudging them this, um, but they should give back to us as well. So I'd like you to maybe Parks can look into that as another synergy with with Simpkins, but I really, it's always irked me that, you know, and it'd be so great, it's a great location. So, thank you. thank you. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address this on that item, on this item? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back to, uh, to the council, I'll just honor the input that we received, particularly that it is a resource for people of all ages, and just really hearing you in, in that regard, for elders, for the lack of, um, options for low impact and for those who may have disabilities. So the pool for everybody. So really just want to acknowledge that. Um, we'll go ahead and bring it back for action, uh, Councilmember Brown, and uh, we'll see where we can go. Thank you for uh, the report and thank you for giving us some options here, um, which I think um, are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I think we've kind of, that's been corroborated um, and so I want to try I have a motion that I'm prepared to make um, and I but I do want to um, I'll put it out there and see if I can do that in the spirit of um, kind of supporting what has been recommended what the Parks and Rec Commission is suggesting as um, you know possibilities to explore and also um, not interfering with our lease agreement with uh, the swim school, but with the intention of uh, moving forward uh, in uh, being more ex expansive in um, the pool and access to the pool. So my motion is, and I don't know, can you, is it possible to put it up, Bonnie, from the email? It's very, um, it's very simple. Succinct. So I'll just say it, and Bonnie can put it up if people want to look at it and try to wordsmith it. Um, but I'm trying to be succinct. Um, so my, the motion would be that the council one express its intention to op open the Harvey West pool to the public for as much of the year as feasibly possible. Um, two, appoint a subcommittee, and I'm going to just go out on a limb because the two council members that I have talked m about this with and who have brought forward with me in past years. Um, uh, are um, also interested, I think, in, in working on this in a more concerted way. Um, appoint a subcommittee comprised of council members Brown and Myers and Mayor Watkins to work with the Parks and Recreation Department staff uh, to develop options for funding pool operations. I would add here, if the Parks and Rec Commission is interested, it would be great if there are members of that commission who would be interested in kind of signing on to work with us. So um, I'm not sure if that would need to be official or if we could just kind of, if we do go in this direction, just invite them. Um, but I just want to express that interest. And three, return to the council with specific options at the second meeting cross out the in January. Um, this would give us some time to have more of that conversation and um, you know, kind of see, position ourselves to recommend the CIP investment um, for the next fiscal year and try to begin to look at how we might move towards year round um, access beginning sometime, you know, at whatever point in 2020 or, you know, when we can, we can find, kind of fi figure out what other options there are for, for financing. I, know, I mean, it's going to require a subsidy if we want to do this, but um, I'm really excited that 
there may be interest for that and that Parks and Rec um, staff are, and the commission are interested in looking at that with us. I mean, we're subsidizing other functions. We have left, the pool has been sitting there. It's a beautiful pool. It's been sitting there for 15 years um, and with like all kinds of people wanting to use it. And I just feel like um, it is, you know, it, it, it's, I think it's, it's in all of our interest to, to really push um, more aggressively to try to do that. So I'll, sec I'll second the motion. Um, and just thank Councilmember Brown for bringing it forward. Because, I mean, we've, I think this has been, as, as to what was already expressed, this has been something that for years we've shared, I think majority of the council has shared, even the prior council wanting to see movement on, and we have this incredible resource that we need to figure out how to provide access to. The only thing I would say is may, second meeting or near there, for the sure. sake of the mayor who may have uh, constraints with agendizing um, for that sort of practical purpose. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I'm just trying to get us, it's, like, yeah. you know, somewhere in the early in the year so that we can and I'm have time for of that. the budget. Okay, so a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by myself, uh, Councilmember Glover, and then Councilmember Matthews. Thanks, just to get some clarity on the the motion. So, is which option is this that you're? None of the above. None, none of, the, of above. the above. So, express it, its intention and in, to mm -hmm. open the Harvey West pool to the public as much as of the year as feasibly possible. So year round is, is what I'm hoping will be feasible. Uh huh. Right. Well, uh, it doesn't. And yeah. with the the <laughs> second meeting in January, is there a reason you chose those council members? Uh, be, well, the, yeah, I can tell you why. So um, what the, I think one of the first conversations I had with um, Mayor Watkins when we first um, got on the council was about this and we brought an agenda item. And so we kind of at that time expressed the intention of you know wanting to move in this direction. And we've um, not been, um, we, we've not had the follow up that you know we, we could have. And then at budget time, um, council member Myers approached me because she knew that I was interested. <laughs> and so I felt like just having heard that and that there was an interest from these, um, these two council members to, um, you know, roll up their sleeves and work on it with me. That, uh, but you know, that that's so. That was my thinking. But, you know, we could do that together. Okay. Um. okay. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Crum and then Vice Mayor Cummings. I support this. It's quite open-ended. Uh, feasible will include some kind of fiscal <laughs> um, considerations. And it also leaves open any number of possibilities currently kind of being discussed, which would be sponsorships or um, contract arrangement with the county, et cetera. And it, from what I read, that's, those are still in early stages. So, um, and this really doesn't affect anything for now. We just keep going through end of this swim season. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember Crone and then Vice Mayor Cummings and Councilmember Glover. Then maybe we could take the vote. I really like Tony's idea of getting people to swim in Santa Cruz. I think it's a wonderful um, uh, thought and dream. And and I, but I also the person who came to speak because my mom was the same way. She used the pool to get some exercise because that, you know. So I think we have to make it a, for everyone to swim in Santa Cruz. Um, I wonder if the maker of the motion would entertain putting um, what was the, what was the price of number three. Five hundred thousand. Uh, four four hundred and twenty-seven thousand one hundred. I was wondering if you put, if you'd include that because I think we both know you and I both know that if we don't attach any money to this, it's just going to be another thing that's going out the door, and is going to get lost somewhere, and we're going to be back here a year or two from now talking about the pool again. But I think if we suggest to our um, a city manager that hey, this is important to the council, let's let's find the money. There must be trade-offs. Um. So you're talking about the general, could I, if I could, to clarify, um, the putting the anticipated general fund impact for a city county partnership on the table without. Yeah, and add that, add that to your motion, add the 427,000 as a fiscal impact. 
I, I, I just don't see how it's going to happen. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, I think I, if, I can make, if maybe I could offer a little bit of clarity. I think one of the things is that um, it could be that price or it could be more, depending on what's feasible and, <coughs> and, and, and possible, um, and that this could be a potential element that's explored as a cost, and it, I mean, as a kind of a cost share operations type thing. So I think it could be a both and, but ultimately <coughs> recognizing, I think what your intention is behind the suggestion is that we want to put resources behind this intention. And I think that's something that both Councilmember Myers, uh, Councilmember Brown, and myself share. And so, if, if absent sort of a specific funding amount, the resources and behind it will absolutely be considered. Does that feel yeah. accurate? Yeah. yeah. So, um, can, if you, can we look at the motion, or I can look at the motion? Because so I, I guess, um, it, and then just a follow-up response. I, I'd be a little concerned about attaching a dollar amount that is. Um, specific to an op the county city partnership option. Um, I think may suggesting, you know, if we could and return to the council with specific options um, on or around the second meeting in January. Um, and you, Mayor Watkins, you said something about um, w including um, Inve financial resources the, to be yeah, the you know it, options for investment yeah invest yeah for funding does that capture i think ultimately what i think the intention yeah, is right. okay that feels accurate to me and it could be more or less than that amount but it's essentially it could stating be, that we're going to it could be more put resources behind can it can i just confirm it's now on <coughs> on or around the second meeting not at the second That's meeting right. on or around the second meeting in january with specific options including um Financial funding, you know, yeah, financial resources. Okay. I think we're yeah. Gonna... yeah, I think that sounds good from the staff uh, perspective. I think obviously this uh, affects the general fund. It uh, affects sure. the parks and recreation budget potentially. Um, so as we've thought about that dollar amount, what is that investment? Um, I, I think it's right in line with what we're saying. I think we've thought about that as part of the fiscal year 21 budget process, um, which I think can start certainly in January, February, uh, in, into March. But I want to be sensitive uh, to that in thinking that, you know, if we are um, uh, committing $400,000 uh, to the pool, which I think is great, I'm just, uh, I've got a bit of anxiety of where that comes from because I think ultimately it's from Parks and Rec. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, we understand. Sure. And we'll work yeah. out solutions, I think, as that will hopefully be the work. Yeah. No, actually, we've closed public comment at this time. I was just going to say that in the second meeting in January, what we, ha we have a mid-year budget update schedule, too, so there'll be more up-to-date budget information, and, and you'll have the ability, obviously, to talk about the budget then, too. So Might it, it nice correlates energy. in that way. Yes. Okay, great. Motion to call a question. Okay. Is that appropriate? Or I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Okay, would you want to withdraw your motion to call? Yes, I'll withdraw the motion, okay. excuse me. Councilor McGlover. Thank you. Um, so I just want to make the comment of my disappointment. Um, we had a great opportunity today. Uh, we could have left the meeting with a development of a business plan and revenue analysis for ways to close the deficit on the golf course and incorporated the democratic process of incorporating the Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, we could have walked out of the room right now with a plan for a 24-hour access to a pool and creating a stronger partnership with the county and moving forward towards that solution and all of the other programs and benefits that that would have offered to it. But instead, we have, in my opinion, given no real direction, zero direction on the golf course because of the splitness of this body. But then on this, uh, while I respect the intention of the motion, the it's so open-ended uh, and it gives, is, there's no real pressure except to come back to the second meeting of January, um, which again is in the future, what's gonna happen, when's it gonna happen, is gonna come back more conversation when we could move forward on it. And it's just more talk, which is uh, to me very similar to the issues of homelessness that we're dealing with here in Santa Cruz, as well as a variety of different things. So whether people are having lack of access to a pool or having to sleep under a bridge, we are consistently sending it to commissions or committees or for talking or for analysis, as opposed to taking action, which is what we were elected to do. So I'm really just disappointed in our inability to move forward with seemingly anything uh, that of, of importance. Okay, so will all those in favor of the motion before us, please say, oh, did you have additional comments before we move on? Oh, sorry, no, actually I didn't have Okay, comments. all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, that passes unanimously. So we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting until 7 p.m., at which time we'll have oral communications. I thought I'd write that. <laughs>
remainder of your time. Um, but this is an opportunity, and this is how um, the government uh, op operates in a way that feels uh, safe for all to participate in it. So I will go ahead and invite up anybody who wants to speak to us in uh, one minute briefly during oral communications for items that are not on today's agenda. If not, we'll go ahead and start the two minute time frame. <clears throat> a one minute comment? Okay, well that won't be until after the meeting. Um, well, we'll see when we end. Okay, well we'll go ahead, why don't we go ahead and get started for the um, oral communications items not on today's agenda. Please step forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, my name is Sue Powell. I have been a resident of Wilkes Circle for 36 years. I am here to ask for your support to prevent the demolition of the Circle Church at 111 Eret Circle. I know that you are all familiar with the proposed subdivision and development plans for the property. I have submitted three documents for your review. The first is a statement from Friends of the Circle summarizing our concerns. The second is our Save the Circle Church petition with 871 signatures. We'll be getting more. And the third is an article that describes good city planning with a focus on creating lively and diverse neighborhoods and that provides a model similar to what we have in the Circle's neighborhood with the Circle Church at our center. As you know, the property at 111 Eret Circle has been a spiritual and community center for 130 years. The site and the Circle Church are historically significant, but have been overlooked by the city's historic designation process, perhaps because the church is modest and simple in architecture and in a lower income neighborhood. Younger churches in more affluent neighborhoods are included on the historic building index, but the Circle Church has been ignored. <coughs> if, the, if the Circle Church had been listed by the City of Santa Cruz on the Historic Building Index, normal procedure for the proposed development plan and demolition permit application would include review by the City's Historic Preservation Commission. Because we believe that the Circle Church is historically significant, we would like the Historic Preservation Commission to be allowed to review the proposal. Including the project review as an agenda item at a public meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission would provide an opportunity for community members to voice their concerns for protection of the Circle Church. I have very little time left, but what I'd like to say is the Circle Church and surround that's it. You're welcome to leave your comments with us and we're happy to take a look well, at that. Well, most of it's in what I gave Okay, you. okay there you thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Hi. Uh, my name's John Sears. I've uh, been a resident of the Circles neighborhood since October 1976. And uh, uh, one of the things I like about Santa Cruz is it's a community with a, with a lot of artists. And uh, so people are dedicated to truth and uh, beauty and not just uh, chasing the, the drudgery of money grubbing every square inch of where we live. Um, one of our local writers, Jonathan Franzen, was recently published in the New York Times, or New Yorker magazine in an article with a cheery title, What If We Stop Pretending the Climate Apocalypse is Coming? To prepare for it, we need to admit that we can't prevent it. In it, he says that anyone under the age of 60 will witness the end of civilization or perhaps the human race. I'm almost 72. If it ends, I'd hope to be there. Um, still hoping it can be averted. Why do I passionately advocate for the preservation of the Circle Church as a community asset and not just another disingenuous sacrifice to the but we need more housing mantra of the development interests who are not solving our low and moderate income housing issues? Jonathan Franzen, uh, Franzen said it best, keep doing the right thing for the planet, yes, but also keep trying to save what you love specifically a community, an institution, a wild place, a species that's in trouble, and take heart in your small successes. Any good thing you do now is arguably a hedge against the hotter future, but the real meaningful thing is that it's good today. As long as you have something to love, you have something to hope for. So I'm hoping that you will join with us in preserving this special place. Thank you, and thank you for your community service.
am Jan Harwood of the Raging Grannies. And I'm Kathy Israel of the Raging Grannies. We're connected with Wilp. And we're um, speaking on singing, actually, on behalf of a great many Raging Grannies, past and present. <laughs> Civility, we all want civility. Let's keep it formal. If you feel strongly, you're abnormal. But here in Santa Cruz, we don't recall, cause someone has tons of gall. We need to listen to the plaints of you know who. Those bad, bad boys, Cron and Glover, who care too much for the poor. We just ignore them, but they insist on the floor. They will be heard, won't be deterred. Let's hear them. Don't shut them down. They might say something brilliant, yes siree. We treasure civility, but in a democracy, everyone can have their say. Ole! <laughs> Hi, Bruce Thomas, and I'm here on behalf of Do Four Neighbors. I'm gonna be a regular presence here because um, it's time to really get some follow through on the petition that Do Four Neighbors filed to the city of Santa Cruz one year ago. You've heard me talk about this in the past. Um, there's still some ongoing issues. I'm gonna, there's one in particular I'm gonna bring up tonight, which is that of double parking delivery trucks. And um, it's affecting the health and safety of the street and neighborhood. It came about because um, the city approved building permits allowing a bank building to be converted into two fast food franchises and never allocated or specified a loading zone. So the neighborhood has suffered the consequences of that and we're trying to get it fixed. It's taken a lot of time and energy from a lot of people, so I would hope this problem doesn't happen again in the future. But right now, we have two solutions floating. I, I'm grateful for Council Members Crone and Brown coming out and surveying the situation two Fridays ago. And so we came up with an idea of where the lo loading zone for Blaze Pizza could be. The trick of this property is there's two businesses, so they kind of need different loading zones just because of their loading schedules. And, um, but on, on Friday of this past week, we got a visit from two members of the transportation department and they insist on trying to park the loading zone for both businesses right outside the Starbucks. It's not realistic. I sent an email. And so I'm asking the city council to please help oversee or supervise that we get a solution here that really be long-term and effective. It's been going on for a year. Listen to the neighbors. Maybe we do have some good inputs. And um, I also asked the city council if we could help facilitate a meeting with the new building, the new property owner, because um, he will be part of the long-term solution also. So thank you very much for your help. My name is Lee Brokaw. In the spirit of Mike Gravel, I intend to read the Rose Report into the record. Page 11. Before staff makes his presentation regarding the homeless agenda item, we observe Councilman Crone immediately raise point of order. Quote, we are not done with oral communications yet. We observe Mayor Watkins interrupts Council Member Crone to say, you are not recognized. The video shows Council Member Crone confirms he is addressing Mayor Watkins, repeats he has a point of order, and asks the city attorney to look what point of order means and states his belief he does not need to be recognized by the mayor to raise a point of order. The video shows Council Member Crone then states, I am profoundly saddened and I apologize if there was anything that I did. The video shows Mayor Watkins interrupts Council Member Crone to say, we'll go ahead and pause your comments if we could for a moment to allow the city attorney to respond to the question before you. The video shows city attorney reads the definition of point of order that, among other things, allows for a point of order to be raised immediately, permits a council member raising a point of order to interrupt the speaker. The video shows council member Crone responded, I was actually trying not to, 
try not to interrupt and wait for you to finish. Martin Bernal spent $18,000 of my money on a report, and there are recommendations. And it would be unconscionable of this mayor to not take up those recommendations. All council members should avoid making public accusations of misconduct and bad faith against one another without first privately and internally addressing these concerns and attempting conflict resolution rectifying when possible. Four, all members of city council should immediately participate in professional mediation and conflict resolution. Mayor, has that been scheduled? Next speaker. <coughs> Uh, Garrett Phillip, I, uh, I w oops, need the glasses. Um, I was going to read this, and then I read it over, and it's a little snarky and uh, petty. So I, uh, but it, it meant well, at least in the way I like to mean things, in that it did talk about the false narratives that are so pervasive here that are really a big problem. And uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into the Green New Deal. A lot of people like it, but it is probably the, the biggest false characterization, false narrative ever in our lifetimes. Uh, and it just goes over people's head. They don't question the lies. Um, there's a, uh, like for instance, uh, and it isn't a big deal, but say earlier, there was that speaker uh, that talked about the Marine Sanctuary, whatever that was, and I didn't catch the whole thing, but the part I looked at was her with her picture of the oil derrick in the uh, ocean and talking about, oh, the poor use of SB, UCSB students having to wipe tar and oil off their feet and everything, and uh, you know, kind of implying that that was why that was. But you know, I went to UCSB for two years, and you know, there's a six-mile rift in the Channel Islands that leaks tons of oil for millennia, and will continue to do so. And those beaches there will have oil and tar forever, and uh, those students will be wiping it off forever. And it's not a natural disaster; it's natural. But there was, you know a three million gallon spill in, in the Channel Islands in 1969, which was, uh, you know, uh, the truth. And it, it was an environmental disaster. And it was arguably the single, uh, well, the catalyst that uh, started the entire coastal environmental movement in California and was the basis of every coastal environmental regulation for 50 years. And uh, that would be more like the truth, you know. And so I don't, I don't I kind of like the false narrative approach of, blame and stuff, uh, I'd rather go with the you know, reality and, and truth. And and we hear, uh, okay, that's good. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> My name is Curtis Relaford. Dear God, please give me the words to say up in here right now. Am I going to mess up if I say something about Drew and, and Chris? with my time at the end of the meeting. You could go ahead and pause his comments. This is an opportunity for you to address the council for anything that you want to address us on for two minutes. Well, y'all, this ain't right. I heard about this way back in El Paso, and El Paso got me in touch with how many people are getting killed and shot over trying to do something right. These folks, I see them down there beating the concrete, talking to the public, bringing people together. <coughs> That ain't no easy test. I drive a peace truck saying love, compassion, caring, and sharing. And they calling me, nigga this, nigga that. Go back to Africa. You can't park here. You can't do that. Man, where are the good people at? It's time for a change. The people with guns and weapons, you got permission to do that. And I got permission from God to serve this book of the Constitution. How many of you are in touch with love, compassion, empathy for all people instead of the money? It's a money race hall. Man, I appreciate what y'all been doing. I appreciate all the encouragement you gave me. I appreciate all the work you've been doing out there. I honor what you've been doing, man. And these people who bringing this stuff up, if they ain't got time, if they judging you, they ain't got time to love you. They judging you, they too busy to love you. When they wrote this book, wasn't no black people up in there. So you got something to deal with, Mr. Uh, Gru. You got to deal with all of that. I get criticized left and right, brother, 15 years now. But I ain't letting it stop me, and don't let it stop you all, because you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right 
thing, man. We need people like you. We don't need all these complainers talking about what you can't do and what you can't. Lord, Jesus, come up in this room. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. Tomorrow is the 18th anniversary of 9-11. And, uh, you know, it's okay if we stick to the script. Uh, some crazy Muslims did 9-11. But if we present factual evidence that a certain clique of Jews were primarily responsible for 9-11, whoa, that's hate speech. And it must be censored. The Sentinel censored me for doing that. They banned me from their comments. I didn't make any threats. I didn't use profanity. I didn't use slurs. I didn't spam. I merely stated facts. And I invited anybody to show me where I was wrong. Nobody ever showed me where I was wrong. All they did was say, oh, well, some people said, you're anti-Semitic. I'm reporting you. <laughs> so I got banned. Well, that's kind of the way it's been for 18 years now. There's a lot of evidence that Israel did 9-11. They were primarily responsible. Of course, they had cooperation from others, but it was primarily Israel and its Mossad which engineered 9-11. They, the, they had the means, they had the motive, and uh, nobody else but the CIA had um, both of those. So. If you go to a website, my favorite website, which is, in my opinion, run by an honorable Jew by the name of Ron Unz, U-N-Z, I highly recommend you remember those three letters and look up uh, the Unz report. Simply U-N-Z <laughs> will get you there. Now this guy uh, ran for governor of California at one time. A brilliant guy, highly ethical. He will run everybody from the horrible people on the right to uh, democracy now. UNZ, look him up. Israel did 9-11. Next speaker. Hello, Elise Cosby. I ask that I not be filmed, please. Okay. Um, I'm here to talk about the yellow journalism that has been uh, utilized by the Sentinel and the Good Times. It's been utilized by department heads and our city manager and the police chief. It's true that we're living in times much like the early part of the 20th century. The robber baron period is quite well known. I think it's been referred to a lot these days. Yellow journalism was distinguished or actually discredited by its use of anecdotal information and sensationalist journalism, flat out lies and distortions. It was an era marked by greed, piracy when it came to things like land use and so forth, and we are sitting in the middle of it here in Santa Cruz. It's so disappointing. We have department heads who repeatedly, completely and smugly defy reports by experts and, and uh, you know, pretty much underpaid consultants such as Dave Seppos who are making rec recommendations to try to bring some harmony and some what you might, I don't know, it means lack of bias, but some kind of objectivity to the council that, so that it could work together. And it seems that his recommendations, although in front of the public, the mayor and others pretended to care about his recommendations, they've been flatly ignored. Uh, police chief, uh, uh, the police chief who has directed people to a bigoted film on the homeless is that, I mean, do we have to have a police chief who really only wants to serve a small part of our population? But most of all right now, I just wanna call out the Sentinel. Stop printing the lies. Stop printing misdeeds when in fact they were minor errors. Good evening, council members. My name is Grace Blakesley, and I'm staff to the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Thank you for hearing us this evening. I'm also staff to the Regional Transportation Commission's Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee. 
The Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee is one of two citizen advisory committees to the Regional Transportation Commission. It advises the regional transportation on different transportation policy, planning, and funding programs, and really looks to advocate for the needs of people living with disabilities and seniors. Annually, the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory, Advisory Committee develops an unmet transit needs list. This list is used to advise funding recommendations as well as policy needs for representing the seniors and people living with disabilities. We currently have a number of vacancies on our committee, and I'm here tonight to invite you and the public to contact RTC if you are interested in serving on the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Com Committee. We are conducting a variety of outreach activities. We have flyers on the Santa Cruz Metro as well as paratransit vehicles, and we have newspaper ads running as well as public service announcements. And we also invite um, all those watching, if they are interested in knowing more about our committee, to contact info at sccrtc.org. Thank you very much. Hi, Council Mayor. Brent Adams representing the Warming Center program tonight. Really honored to talk about the Warming Center. And I want to invite you back a little, uh, a little uh, about a year ago uh, to... Uh, shelter plan that was put forth by this council. Two of you weren't here, but what was actually going to happen this time last year was that there was going to be uh, moving towards a navigation center, interim shelters that were uh, never established in five, diff five different neighborhoods were proposed and there was some resistance. What ended up happening was there was no winter shelter proposed at all. This time last year, there wasn't going to be a winter shelter. So the warming center, we, we, we follow in and try to get ready uh, to, to protect anybody else who doesn't make it into the winter shelter. They population capped traditionally at 100 people. Last year there was gonna be, uh, uh, we, they finally uh, the, the, uh, opened for 50 people, but the, the River Street camp closed. So uh, what Warming Center did was prepare to open for twice the number of people on twice the number of nights. That's not, with not one pe penny of city money and a, a little bit of money for Watsonville. I want to invite you in to now is any time you think or talk about winter shelter, you also have to think about warming center. Warming center it opens for everybody else. There's only one uh, city council person or former city council person in this room, Michelle Naroyan, who ever has even visited the warming center program. I invite all of you to, to at least darken our door to see what it's like. It's truly all volunteer, community supported shelter for everybody who doesn't make it in. We keep the door open all night long. We have a hotline that anybody can call and we'll go pick them up at any hour of the night. It's truly the one thing that is, is saving people's lives. Uh, so whatever you think about shelter or whatever machinations around uh, 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 things we're doing around homeless sh uh, sheltering, Warming Center always has to be on the top of your mind and thinking about that. Uh, it's, it's been glorious, thank you. Before we, before you get started, um, Mr. Norris, you're speaking on behalf, of, not on the evening item at this moment for oral communications. Okay, you'll be our last speaker unless Mr. Posner, are you planning to speak? You're speaking in front. Okay. Who's going to speak on? Are that? you speaking on the item, the, on oral communications items, not on tonight's agenda, or are you speaking later for the evening item? The agenda item. Okay, we'll go ahead and have you wait until we have public comment for that. So um, you'll be our last speaker in front, so you'll be our final three. Please, you'll have your full two minutes. Great, yeah, um, you know, I really appreciate- oh, oh, Go ahead, sorry, sorry. pause, okay. forgive me. Why don't we go ahead and, and just chime her in then at this moment? Yeah. So Count, just for, the, for those in the audience or those watching at home, Councilmember Myers is calling in for this evening's session, and I think- She's still sick. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, please, you'll have your full two minutes. Great, yeah, I hope she's enjoying uh, Paris. I like Paris, so maybe she gets to be involved in some of the uh, yellow vest protests. Um, so uh, I really appreciate that the council has decided that they're going to uh, create policies in the event of an economic collapse. As we already know, we are unable to handle the number of people living on the streets currently because there's been a lot of uh, blocking of solutions and denying uh, agenda items to be put forward to try to solve these problems. So your interest in, in actually dealing with the 
huge increase of people moving onto the streets, which is likely to occur um, in the next year or two. I really appreciate that you are p developing these plans already to help um, make it a comfortable transition here in Santa Cruz for those people losing their houses. And your suggestion of having housing in place for people whose homes are being foreclosed on, I think is brilliant. The idea of, of seeking new ways to uh, use the abandoned storefronts on Pacific and then throughout the community, it's just fantastic that you're thinking ahead like that. And um, I really appreciate the idea that you are considering some transition camps that are self-managed with sanitary facilities, unlike the uh, one at 1220, which could use showers and, 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 and drinking water, two things that you would think $20 million could afford, but for some reason is uh, unable to be achieved. Um, and uh, uh, because of the eviction from Ross Camp, we still see many, many people living in doorways and on Water Street and in the bushes and, and so on because it turned out there really wasn't uh, shelter space for those people. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mr. Norris. So oh, the uh, Ninth Circuit Court has ruled that expressive behavior at the microphone, whether singing, cursing, or turning one's back, which I'm doing now, on the mayor and the mayor's agenda is We'll go ahead and pause this time. We're gonna behavior. go ahead and pause this time. People in the audience should so know this. I'm gonna go ahead and um, ask that you please sit down and, and so or you're, want, welcome want, to, you're welcome to face our You're not gonna allow me to, to do my oral communication? I spoke with our city attorney in advance around oral communications and public comment, and it's up to you to address the council, and we welcome I am your addressing feedback. the council. I'm just no, addressing it with my back. I'll continue with what I'm saying. I'm gonna go ahead and pause your time and ask you to sit down, and, and I'll go ahead and ask no, you to I'm leave, Mr. Norris. I'm in the Norris middle of my oral communication. No offense, Matt. We're uh, gonna go ahead and, city council we'll go ahead and take a break. Okay. a nursery school. Is, um, really Mr. Condotti, can I get your in, opinion on this, please? I think it is important the huh? chair not address It seems to me that this is council disruptive. The Brown Act or it allows a member of the, the public audience. to address the council yeah. on any item of business that comes before the council. Okay, so this is not addressing the council. I'm addressing the council. You I don't, I'm addressing, you can okay, hear we're gonna me. Go ahead is there and anyone on the council who can't hear me you can with go my ahead back? No, I don't think so. Okay, Mr. Norris, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to leave. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask our sergeant of arms to leave. I have the right under the Brown Act to be here, you know that. Okay. Well, then um, we're going to go ahead. Since you're unable to allow us to conduct arrest. city business and you're disrupting our, our proceedings, we're going to go ahead and ask you to leave. Simple as that. Madam Mayor, he's refusing to leave unless he's arrested. You have to make a citizen's arrest, and we'll see you in court if that's what you want to do. I was told by our city attorney you can that if then you can take his advice and go to court and meet me there. Good. Okay. We'll go ahead and do that then. We'll go ahead and do that then. If he wants to stand there and put his back towards us. All we are saying, we're going to take a break. We're going to have a five minute break. We're going to go ahead and take a break. We're going to clean this. support free speech. I know. Let me talk to you. I wanted to finish my two minutes, folks. Well, anyway, I guess if we're. Hi, Sherry Cherie Peterson. Well, um, what, when I moved to town, it was a sweeter town. People, people were friendlier, and people walked up to you with food, and they wanted to share their barbecue or their loaf of bread, or you know, we made friends easily. It was much easier to live in the town. You know, I've been in the street that'll be six years here, and another week or so if I make it. Last year, I almost died on December, uh, September 28th, and I lost three and a half quarts of my blood. So I'm glad that I'm still here. It's hard to be here because there's no bus to where I go, and I live in my van. But I'm begging you, I am begging you to get a shelter. We need a shelter. We need. If you can't find a place that people can be, a camp like at the university or somewhere in all of the parks, Harvey West Park, there's a million places that you can think of that are just 
like the vet's hall or whatever in the daytime for people and the permanent people. People need somewhere to be. Everyone needs somewhere to be. I need somewhere to be. I have to get up at dawn and wait for the first bus, which is like five hours from when I wake up or what, you know? And it's ridiculous. The bus system needs to be 24 seven. There'd be a bunch of homeless people on there with, that are scared because we have no shelter. And I think you ought to think of that as an option. I mean, there's a, there's a million options out there. The university land over there at the camp in the village, nothing's happening. There's no carrots, potatoes, nothing. You know, you could have some part over here are the family, over here could be the people that don't want to pay attention. There could be the children over here, the students going to college. You can make use of that land instead of leaving it as the field and the farm or whatever. Every time I hear that, I say, what field and a farm? Your time is Please up. help us. Yay. Okay. okay. So that is going to go ahead and conclude oral communications. I'm going to go ahead and check here with our our clerk to see if our uh, call-in council member is uh, here quite yet. Mayor, could I just? Um, I, uh, I just wanted to direct, if it's appropriate. Uh, there was two issues that came up: the Circle Church. Folks were saying something about the historic preservation. I was wondering if staff could come back to us and see if that's something that could be agendized on the Historic Preservation Commission. And then the do four neighbors uh, sounded like something that could possibly be taken to the Transportation and Public Works Commission for an opinion and a discussion because it, it, I was out there, it's not going away. City Attorney Condotti or City Manager Bernal? Well, the council can't take any action on those items, but we can look into it and report back. Okay. Thank you, thank you, okay. ma'am. Okay, are we good to go or do we? Mm. Yeah, I'm on. Oh, okay. Well, we can hear you. Thank you for calling in, Councilmember Myers. We're just getting started with our 7:30 um, general business item, and I'll go ahead and announce the title at this time. So, um, as I sort of uh, spoke to earlier, but for those who are now just joining us, what the process will, uh, how the process will go, is we'll have a presentation from our staff. Um, we'll allow the staff to present without interruption. At which time, then the council will ask any questions for clarification um, by our staff. Um, once those have been, the questioning has been concluded, then we're gonna go ahead and open it up to public comment. I'll ask that folks um, who want to briefly address the council for one minute, feel free to come forward. Then we'll honor those who reached out in advance for a group presentation um, to come forward and then we'll have the two minute public comments uh, time frame. I'll remind you then and, and I'll reiterate it now, we do want to hear from you. Uh, we value your, your opinions and we hope that you um, have respect for your fellow citizens as they are able to voice their um, opinions to us at the, that time, as well as respect for our staff when they're presenting to us during our time. Um, so there will be a time and place for everybody to weigh in who wants to weigh in. Um, at this point, we'll go ahead and ask that those who are from our staff uh, presenting on this item, please come forward. And this is item, um, the one uh, evening item we have, it's the Main Beach Public Access Policy. And I see Tony Elliott, um, coming forward, so we'll go ahead and invite you up to do the presentation. <laughs> Councilmember Crump, uh, one moment, please. Council I was just Crump. wondering if it would be appropriate if you know how much time your presentation will be, so people in the audience, a lot of times they're frustrated or they, they don't know how, you know, they have to go and they can't stay that long. But Yeah, good question. I would assume uh, maybe 20 minutes or so on the presentation. Great. All right, we'll get going here. Um, 
All right, good evening, good evening, Mayor and uh, City Council members. Uh, for the record, Tony Elliott, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. All right, thanks. Um, all right, over the course uh, of mid-August uh, until the current date, uh, overnight camping, uh, as many know, on Main Beach uh, has increased uh, very rapidly. Uh, the city, over the course of these two or three weeks, has received numerous complaints and requests uh, to address the unmanaged encampments uh, developing at the beach. Uh, city staff has concerns uh, related to the potential for increased litter, waste, syringes, uh, and potential for fire risk at the municipal wharf. Uh, daily maintenance, or I'm sorry, daily beach maintenance and operations have become increasingly challenging for staff as well, um, and at times threatening uh, to staff. Uh, park staff are having to dodge campers uh, currently on the beach to clean the beach each morning. Uh, in order to properly clean, park staff uh, uh, really must be accompanied by a uniformed law enforcement official at the moment. So what that literally looks like in the morning uh, when our team goes out to sift the beach, sift uh, the sand and kind of comb the beach, uh, we're dodging all the camps on the beach in order to have camps move temporarily so that we can sift those areas and clean the area, we ha have to have a uniformed officer out there to accompany us to, to help, that, help through that process essentially. So it's an impact uh, daily on parks and recreation staff. Uh, the recent increase in unmanaged camping uh, is on top of already ongoing challenges at Maine and Cowell beaches uh, related to syringes, litter, and public safety, which we'll talk about here a little bit more. Uh, the city currently has a curfew in place at Cowell Beach, which is effective from midnight until one hour before sunrise. Uh, that includes the area underneath the wharf as well. Uh, currently, Maine Beach, though, does not have a curfew uh, in place, which is uh, what we're here to discuss uh, in part this evening. So what we'll focus on here in the staff presentation uh, is the status of the current beach camping, kind of what's going on. We've got a number of photos that I'll fly through here very quickly. Uh, information and data associated with public safety, um, and I'll ask the police chief and potentially fire chief and others to come up and speak to this item. Uh, and then some of the applicable ordinances and regulations, the beach management plan, and so I'll look toward the, the city attorney to weigh in on some of those details. So the status of current camping, uh, as of Monday, yesterday, there are approximately 40 campsites on Main Beach. Um, and this kind of varies, it's hard to say exactly what a campsite uh, is, but approximately 20 campsites uh, uh, located near the volleyball courts, approximately five underneath the wharf, uh, kind of taking refuge and shelter under the wharf, and about 15 down at the river mouth um, at the San Lorenzo River. So um, this, again, has ballooned from just a couple weeks ago at the Aloha Polynesian Festival. During that event, the Parks and Rec event, uh, there were literally one or two tents on the beach, and this is a matter of two or three weeks ago. Uh, so we've seen that number very quickly increase to this number, somewhere between probably 35 and 40 tents. So just a number of photos, just to kind of provide some context. If you haven't been down at the beach, just um, some of these at the river mouth, some of the uh, debris, I'll just kind of move through these very quickly here. Yeah, and some of the impact here, obviously there are tents on the beach, but we're seeing this expand obviously into our restrooms, into uh, Beach Street and some other areas, shopping carts uh, and so forth. So yeah, we've just got a number of pictures here. I wanna reference this one really quickly. Here's a bag of charcoal. Uh, and I think the fire chief or somebody from the fire department is best equipped to address this, but we have signs at the entry of the beach that um, uh, literally say this is not coal country and that is because what happens with hot coals, they're buried in the sand and they will stay hot for a long time. Um, so if uh, kids or anybody on the beach uh, may step on those, it presents a, a potential hazard. So again, here's some of the tents underneath the wharf. Um, so just a quick uh, snapshot on, on kind of what's going, down, uh, going on at the beach. Some of the community feedback that we have received, and I'm sure this is not all encompassing. I know the city council has received a number of emails and correspondence from the community. Uh, Parks and Rec in particular has heard from the Dream Inn, the Beach Boardwalk, the business community, the Chamber of Commerce, the volleyball players on the beach, the uh, Junior Guard, uh, Santa Cruz Junior Guard and Boosters, numerous residents. So there's all been a lot of community feedback on this, which uh, I think is a big reason why we're here at council to discuss this based on that community feedback. 
So again, I mentioned that the, the growing uh, <clears throat> encampments on the beach are on top of uh, some challenges that we already have at the beach. So just to put some of these numbers out there, um, on an annual basis, the past two years, uh, the uh, city parks and recreation staff, the wharf crew collected 265 needles at Maine and Cowell beaches. In two, uh, 2018, that number increased to 530 syringes at Maine and Cowell Beaches. Uh, the locations of these vary. It's on the beach, it's at the river mouth, some in the restrooms, um, some, some disposed in trash cans, but a lot of these are, are on the beach. Um, there are other organizations that are collecting syringes. We know that Save Our Shores and the Dream In, uh, perhaps among others, uh, have data uh, on syringes as well. In terms of an August comparison, so again, this camp has really uh, developed quickly in the month of August here into September. Uh, for some reference, in August of 17, uh, six needles were collected um, at Maine and Cal Beaches. Last year it was 28, this August was 40 needles at the beach. In terms of the environmental quality, so the city's wastewater um, uh, um, department, the Public Works Department, did water quality testing last week uh, on the 5th of September. And the next two slides, this indicates the water quality on the east side of the municipal wharf. Um, what this is showing is that the bacteria levels, so this is fecal coliforms, um, the bacteria is a thousand times higher than what essentially what it typically is and beyond the standard. The dashed line that you can see um, is the, uh, is the how do they have it labeled? The sample single ma single sample max here. And I'll uh, lean on the Public Works Department to speak to this exactly what this means uh, and so forth. But their chemists um, uh, shared this data with us in terms of uh, the bacteria levels just uh, from the, I'm trying to look at the dates here, uh, nine, six, and then the week prior to that. So in a matter of a week, um, our bacteria levels on the east side of the wharf where the camps are have dramatically dramatically increased. And so this is a, a year long horizon that you're seeing. So the, at, the, at the very front of the graph, you're seeing what it was at this time uh, last year. So a drastic increase um, in bacteria in the water. So we'll go ahead and ask that you, you'll have an opportunity as community members who want to speak to the council on, on this at, at public comment. At this time, we're having a presentation um, from our staff. So I'd ask that you please uh, remain quiet so that our staff member is able to present to us and we'll have an opportunity to hear from you later. Please continue. Thanks. All right, from a staff perspective, um, again, just wanted to articulate a little bit what the park staff is dealing with. Uh, again, we are having difficulty, frankly, doing our job on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we're weaving in and out of tents, just trying to sift the beach and trying to keep it clean. So that's a major operational challenge literally every morning. Uh, we do have a, and share a concern of fire. Uh, we have a wooden wharf. Um, and there are camps under the wharf, there are potential for fire, so we've got a major concern with fire under the wharf, um, especially with one point of uh, ingress and egress on and off the wharf, um, that, that's a lot of concern. Uh, we do have concerns also with uh, retaliation. Uh, so our park staff have experienced cases uh, where um, citations uh, on the beach uh, due to, to various violations have led toward retaliatory behavior, ranging from vandalism of facilities and restrooms uh, to threatening behavior to, um, to human waste uh, outside of, of restrooms. Uh, we've uh, also recently experienced um, unmanaged camps, um, as we all know, including Gateway Plaza and the Ross Camp. Um, and we've seen how conditions can quickly evolve to be unsanitary and, and unsafe, which causes us uh, concern uh, at these camps. Uh, and I would say with respect to managed encampments or transitional encampments, uh, City Council and staff reviewed several options in the spring for potential sites for future managed camps and the beaches were not on that on that list for consideration. Um, so we would not recommend the beach as a location for a managed camp, um, let alone in this case an unmanaged uh, camp. So I think um, that's a broader discussion on where camps can go, a transitional camp, but in this case an unmanaged camp at the beach um, is not recommended by staff. I'd like to uh, send it over to the police chief, uh, Chief Mills, uh, to talk about calls for service.
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Andy Mills, Police Chief, and uh, we're going to take you through some slides to, uh, as best we can, articulate the calls for service that we're seeing on the beach and in the beach area. So uh, this year, um, in 2019, we've had 261 uh, calls for service as opposed to the same time last year, which was 254. And you can see previous years, there was a little bit more. It certainly depends on some of the events that are taking place in the beach area. However, um, as you can see in the, in the future slides, that uh, the time of day when these calls are coming in is mostly during the middle of the afternoon and the day. That's when alcohol gets a little bit more uh, heavy and, and uh, there's a, a lot more people at the beach. So when people leave the beach, there's not as many people to call in complaints. And so therefore we have to proactively go and check some of those things. So, so you can see it tails off pretty quickly uh, after, uh, after the heat of the day is done. Types of calls for service I think is where the details are. So 261 calls that we've received were for camping. Uh, another 109 for medical emergencies and 91 for being drunk in public, and, uh, and then a variety of other ones such as municipal ordinance violations, 80, and uh, disturbances, 69. Missing juveniles at risk, uh, 57, children getting lost on the beach and so forth, and you can read the rest of it yourself. I think what this slide tells me is that the kinds of calls is indicative of some of the calls we saw uh, at, at and near the Ross camp which is what would concern us is if there was uh, additional people down at the beach uh, who are staying there and that could increase the calls for service as well as the types of calls that we don't want to see at that location. Uh, for us to be able to uh, adequately address the issues that are popping up on the beach, in my opinion, before it gets to a point or becomes unmanageable, we need tools to do enforcement. Because of the Boise decision, we can't do just straight camping. We do go down and write as many tickets as we can and warn people and offer assistance to people to go other places as well as housing that's available. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, for those that choose not to go, there does need to be some leverage that we can employ in order to be able to get uh, people off of the beach. And I'll turn it over to, uh, um, I believe Susie is next. You're next. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Thanks. All right, so again, some context on the existing curfew. Cal Beach uh, has an existing curfew that starts at midnight uh, and expires one hour prior to sunrise. Um, a little bit of the nuance here I just wanna uh, explain is that the curfew applies to the dry sand area of the beach um, and not the wet sand. The wet sand area is open 24 hours and really the idea here uh, is that for uh, surfing, for example, or fishing, that people can access the beach. They can walk through the dry sand area to access the wet sand area or access access the water. Um, but the curfew, what it does is um, prohibits essentially setting up shop, um, staying in, in one place during those, uh, during those curfew hours. So this is much more flexible than a lot of the other curfews that we see around the Monterey Bay area. Um, state parks, for example, um, a natural bridges state beach uh, closes at sunset and doesn't open until 8 a.m. Uh, so it's a much longer period of time and during that closure it's closed. Uh, for us, our closure would be much shorter, 12 a.m. to an hour before sunrise. And even during that, people could access the beach uh, to, uh, to paddle out or swim or, or whatever they might be doing. Uh, again, for some context, the beach management plan uh, we enacted in 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 2014, um, the beach management plan guides the activities of uh, public agencies and private property owners. Um, this is the guiding document that we use um, in coordination and association with the California Coastal Commission in terms of what activities we do at the beach. Um, the beach management plan, as it says here, is a means to protect natural resources, provide for public safety, uh, and maximize the extent and quality of the recreational experience uh, for uh, residents of Santa Cruz, residents and visitors of Santa Cruz. So we are going through that process as a department currently to update that. That's a five-year plan. Um, that expires in November of this year. So this discussion of the curfew um, activities at the beach lends right into that process with the beach management plan uh, in our communications uh, with the California Coastal Commission. 
two weeks ago uh, at city council, we worked on a new city council policy regarding park hours. Um, and that uh, was accompanied by this administrative policy order, this APO that, forgive me, is in very small text. But I put this up here not to read through, but just to reference that two weeks ago, the city council um, uh, adopted this and recommended that we move forward with this APO to guide us in these exact type of situations. And so I brought out a couple of those criteria, the environmental criteria that we've referenced already with bacteria in the water and some of those issues, and in the public safety side of it as well in terms of uh, everything from unlawful behavior to vandalism and so forth. So really going through the APO, we've referenced what we discussed two weeks ago and we've gone through that process to come to you tonight uh, with, with our recommendation that we'll discuss momentarily. So I wanted to send it over to the city attorney, Tony Kandati, for um, a general uh, legal review. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Tony. Um, first of all, to back up a little bit, the 2014 beach management plan incorporated a, a beach curfew that restricts access to the dry st sand portions of the beach um, during the hours of midnight to one hour before uh, sunrise. It does not speak to the question of camping on the beach at all. And there's a simple reason for that, and that is that prior to the Martin versus Boise decision, the city had the ability to enforce its camping ordinance, chapter 636, to anyone who set up tam uh, a tent and attempted to, to just camp out on the beach. Sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Could you please repeat it? <laughs> Anybody else have that problem? That was odd. Um, uh, that same applied on Main Beach. Um, we didn't need a curfew on Main Beach to restrict the ability to set up an encampment there because Chapter 636 applied. And when the Martin versus Boise decision uh, was adopted, and as you recall from our discussion back in April, until we amend Chapter 636, to make it consistent with Martin versus Boise, we aren't able to enforce that um, ordinance at this time on Main Beach. That same rule applies to city parks and other city property or, or public property. Um, the exception is, however, if someone is creating a nuisance in a city park, we have the ability to enforce the park after hours ordinance uh, elsewhere but because of the interplay between our police power authority to protect public health and safety and the Coastal Act, which requires a coastal development permit for any um, action or activity that changes the intensity of the use of land, um, these guidelines have been developed in order to give cities the limited ability to restrict access to beach to address specific health and safety concerns. Um, so the resolution that's been prepared is consistent with the Coastal Commission guidelines and, um, and is limited to make it consistent with those guidelines. And so um, this is all based upon a June 1994 uh, beach curfew guidance document issued by the former executive director of the Coastal Commission, Peter Douglas, and, um, and ratified by the Coastal Commission in 1999. And what it requires is before adopting a curfew, the city should make findings of fact sufficient to, uh, to enable a reasonable person to conclude that a public safety problem in fact exists on the beach that warrants the imposition of a curfew. The findings should also include a discussion of what alternatives to the curfew were considered and why their implementation would not effectively address the public safety <coughs> problem. And then it goes on to say that a coastal development permit will not be required so long as the curfew is narrowly tailored in the following respects. First, uh, the geographic area to which the curfew applies should be specifically identified and should be limited to those beach areas with respect to which the city has identified the public safety problem warranting the limited beach closure. Second, the curfew should avoid the prohibition of all public uses of the beach during curfew hours and to that end, it should authorize and make provision for fishing, uh, the use of the wet sand beach area for other purposes typically associated with beaches, um, such as walking, surfing, paddling, swimming, kayaking, sightseeing, and nature observation. Um, and the curfew should allow 
for the possibility of permitted special events on the beach during curfew hours. Um, further, the hours of dry sand beach closure should be minimized so as to assure that the beach is only closed during those hours when it is reasonable to conclude that the public safety problem that the curfew is intended to address is most acute. Um, and generally, the guidance uh, specifies that the hours of midnight to one hour before sunrise are appropriate uh, hours. And lastly, that the curfew should contain a sunset provision. Um, in this case, the proposed sunset pro uh, uh, of the curfew would be six months, which would enable um, city staff with input from the council to bring forward a, an update to the 2014 beach management plan, uh, potentially to address uh, adopting a similar type of curfew as part of that beach management plan or not, depending on whether or not the council believes that adequate findings can be made. Um, so those are the elements, evidentiary record documenting the need for a curfew, uh, a finding that there aren't any reasonable alternatives uh, to address the public safety issues that have been identified, limited geographic area with specifically identification of the area to be, uh, to which it will be applied, um, allowing public uses during curfew hours and um, minimal curfew hours uh, and posting of notice for the public access policy. What this would do, it would enable the city to apply its park after hours regulations on a limit in a limited basis to main beach um, during the, the time that the curfew is in effect for that six month period. I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have. Is that the conclusion of the presentation? I think the city, excuse me, city attorney covered the, the recommendations here, I think relatively well, but yeah, just to recap here, the request for the city council is to implement the main beach public access policy, uh, authorizing the public's use of the dry sand portion of the beach uh, to establish the curfews we discussed, uh, midnight uh, to one hour before sunrise. Um, I don't know if you want me to read through this entire thing. There's the language that the city attorney covered there. Second piece is the uh, directing the main beach public access policy automatically sunset as the city attorney uh, recommended. Um, and then <clears throat> declaring that, a doc that the documented conditions requiring implementation of the policy constitute a public nuisance. So as the city attorney mentioned, that's a key part uh, of that curfew process that the Coastal Commission uh, guides um, cities on from the 1994 document. So those are the three pieces of the recommendation. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your presentation. I'll go ahead and see if there's any uh, council member questions for clarification at this time. Council Member Crum and Vice Mayor Crum. Just a couple. Um, so um, Martin v. Boise is in place. Right. Um, but it says that if there is enough shelter beds or accommodations, then we can ticket um, folks who are camping. So I'm wondering, A, is there enough, do we have sufficient shelter space? And B, how many are we short? And how much more shelter space would we need to accommodate uh, our homeless population on any given night? Uh, Susie. Yeah, yeah, so as you can answer this, we have uh, adopted standard operating procedures, as you'll recall, that the council approved specifically to address encampments like this, and I think Susie can. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Crone. Susie O'Hara, assistant to the city manager. Um, good thing is that we have a lot of experience in this forum, so I'll talk a little bit about what our plan is and how to get to the conversation about what um, what shelter beds are available and how best to outreach folks that are out at the at Main Beach. So the number of shelter beds, unfortunately, is not actually the silver bullet in this equation. It's more of how to develop a robust outreach strategy that gets to the individual needs of the folks that are out there. <clears throat> so for instance, at the Ross camp, um, we had people that entered into detox. We had people that homeward bounded. We had people that went into our shelter bed system both our emergency shelter bed system, but also our mental health bed shelter system as part of the HOPES team. 
um, and we had motel vouchers. So thinking about that entire spectrum of stock that we have in our community, it really is incumbent upon us to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction with folks and understand their needs. Um, we do have available shelter beds. Right now it does fluctuate night by night. Um, the good news is, is that we do have beds now and beds to offer. And um, we do have really strong partnerships with the Salvation Army and our local hotel system that has also offered the motel vouchers as well. So then we can take it because we do have enough shelter space. I think that's the legal part of the question. And um, I don't think that moving forward with a limited curfew on in this particular area implicates our ability to enforce chapter 636, which is the camping ordinance. And so we would not be citing people out on the beach for violating uh, the camping ordinance. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Cumming. Just I have a couple questions and Susie, maybe this one can go to you first. Um, how much time will we need in order to conduct outreach and provide alternatives? Because I would imagine, for example, if we adopt this and, you know, we said effective immediately, that's, you know, pretty much like four hours until people have to get off the beach and it might be a little unreasonable to kick people out in the middle of the night. So I'm just wondering how much time would be um, appropriate in terms of when this should go into effect from your perspective and then other members of staff as well. So there's two sides of that equation. There's the capacity and resources that we have from staff side to do the outreach and go through the standard operating procedures, which requires a 72 hour notice. Um, but there is also the, from my perspective, a need to ensure that we are able to go tent by tent and have those individualized conversations. Um, we have, um, convened an internal uh, encampment assessment team here at the city that is comprised of a multitude of city departments. We met today to kind of talk about strategy should this curfew go through tonight and we're gonna meet again tomorrow morning and kind of come up with that tactical plan. But you do need to balance both the capacity and resources that we have from the city staff perspective and also with our partners um, across the county as well as the sheltering partners and motel uh, partners but we are also obligated to give that 72 hour notice. So it, it won't be happening tonight from, from my perspective. Okay, I just wanted that to be clear from the public's perspective and just so we have some clarity on the timeline of when this would take place. Um, I have another question. Um, part of this is a bit, I know that for some folks it might be a bit confusing, you know, the idea that you can use the dry sand to get to the wet sand, but at the same time there's curfew on the dry sand. So can we kind of get a clarification of what that means so like if I'm walking across the dry sand at night to the wet sand, that's okay. And if I'm on the wet sand, that's okay. But if I'm hanging out in the dry sand, that's not. As long as you have a house. We'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and have our staff answer this question and I'll ask our community members to refrain from making comments um, and disrupting the council meeting. We'll have an opportunity to, again to hear from you during public comment. Feel free to respond. The, uh, consistent with the Coastal Commission guidance document, the intent is to allow people to get access to the wet sand portion of the beach to engage in, in whatever beach rate related activities um, uh, are available. And so yes, it's essentially, it leaves the dry sand portion of the beach open as a means of accessing the wet sand, but not as a means of just remaining in place on the dry sand portion of the beach. Councilmember Clever. Thank you. <coughs> So thanks for the presentation and all the different staff that went into making it happen. Um, so the wet sand, a little confused, maybe you could explain that to me. Um, I sent you an email day before yesterday or some, something like that with regards to a map or some kind of visual representation onto where that line lands. Because <clears throat> I was just looking up the language for the Coastal Commission uh, and it talks about 20 feet inland of the wet sand area, but it has to be within the mean high tide. So do you know where that falls on the beach that would constitute the wet sand area for people to be uh, uh, not allowed to be on it? That's a good question. I think, it, and city attorney, please chime in here. When we're thinking of the wet sand uh, portion of the beach, it's literally where the tide is at that moment, literally the, literally the wet sand. I think in terms of the mean high tide, um, 
I think identifying that is gonna vary by season. It's gonna vary by weather. There's gonna be a lot of factors there. Um, and I believe right before this meeting, we got information back from Tiffany Wise West um, and USGS uh, with some of the feedback on that response. So in terms of the mean high tide and some of that discussion, we'll prov uh, provide that information as a follow-up. But when we're talking about the wet sand portion of the beach, it's literally wherever that wet sand is, I think, it, at the moment. And, and would that City Attorney Condotti correlate with the Coastal Commission's policy language on action 4.3.6 of the public beach closures and curfew? I'm not sure what directly, what specifically you're pointing to. Yeah, it's from um, the Coastal Commission's policies on uh, public beach closure and curfews. It's their, it's their language in their policy packet. Um, I would have to locate the specific language. Okay, here. Mr. Here. Mr. McHenry, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to please lower your sign. I uh, believe that the sign is obstructing the view of the person behind you, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to please lower your sign to respect your fellow citizens in the audience. So, could you just say that again? Looks like the document you're referring to um, indicates that at least 20 feet in from the wet area of the beach would be considered um, the wet sand portion of the beach. Wet sand portion. And then with the mean high tide, as uh, um, Director Elliott mentioned, it fluctuates throughout the season. But I looked on the Monterey Bay average tide charts from the national or the federal government and it says it's about a 4.6 with regards to the mean high tide. So is that suggesting that the enforcement of this curfew would be from the 4.6 mean high tide level of the beach plus 20 feet? I believe the document that you just showed me referred to 20 feet inland from the wet, actual wet sand, wet area of the beach. Yeah, it just says uh, public or closure to public use of any portion of the beach inland of the mean high tide line is not encouraged and requires a coastal development permit, which must maintain the public's right to gain access to state tidelands. So I don't know, I just wondering if you're, I, I, I came across this language rather recently, so I just wanted to get your. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to look at that and report back, but um, uh, yeah, I'm not prepared. Okay, to I just wanna make sure we don't uh, open ourselves up to litigation or issues with the Coastal Commission by violating their policy on curfews. I, I don't. I don't anticipate that that's going to occur. Okay, good. Yeah. We've um, been in consultation with Coastal Commission staff. And then I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the council at this time? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'll go ahead and orient us to where we are at this point in um, this evening's item. We're gonna go ahead and open it up for public comment. So any member of the community who would like to address the council on this item is welcome to. I will ask that if somebody wants to just briefly speak to the council in one minute, um, that you come forward and that could be, we support the staff, we don't support the staff, but just briefly wanting to share your insights, you're welcome to come forward at this time. Is there anybody who wants to briefly speak to the council in one minute? Okay, please step forward and we'll go ahead. Hi, um, I, I went with my son to Hawaii to three different islands and over there you're allowed to sleep on the beach and, and supposedly you get a five, you get a, you get a $5 ticket if you don't get a, a permit, but people live there as big families and they all get along and they have, a, a usual dugout, and I've been asking you for fire pits for years and years and years. Like I've been asking you for shelters. The back 40 was one of the best things we had in this town, and now like it's all divided up and there's hardly any people that can fit over there. You can't fit all of the people like used to fit over there that we camped out, and you know, I felt comfortable over there. I spent the night there. I, I, had a, I knew a family with eight children that lived there People got along there. People volunteered to watch the bathroom day and night. We had bathrooms galore. We didn't have to stiff through the sand for nothing. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Please. Hi there. I'm uh, one of the board members of the Junior Guards Boosters Club. And uh, as you know, our children go down there, especially during the summer for the guards program. It's a great program. As a matter of fact, a lot of the guards uh, um, members the other day helped out a, 
um, life-saving technique of toilet bowls where there was an incident where a young boy hit his head, was unconscious. Uh, it was the junior lifeguards um, that actually pulled him out of the water. Anyways, there's always been a worry, a concern about the cleanliness of the beach down there, the uh, needles, um, and just the sanitary conditions and trying to get our children there on a daily basis. The guards program is not just a great teaching tool, but a lot of the uh, people that live in the city depend on that almost as a quasi childcare during the summer. Thank you. I would just like to uh, make sure that uh, if there were any sort of curfew that get, got passed, that the public would be made absolutely crystal clear where the boundary lines would be uh, and and what behavior would be uh, allowable. Like, uh, how do you define walking towards the wet sand? How do you define where the wet sand is? I think that needs to be crystal clear. Um, I also think um, we really need to establish that there truly is a, uh, a public nuisance with data. Uh, I, we've seen some tonight, uh, the fecal coliform just went back a year. I believe last year was one of the lowest levels we've ever had uh, fecal coliform counts on, on Cowell Beach. So I would like to look at more data beyond that. I'd like to look at more uh, like the calls for service for last year to compare those to this year and uh, just more data uh, to really establish that there is a nuisance. Good evening, I'm Brent Garrett, and I just have this feeling that this situation is occurring because Ross Camp was closed before there was an adequate place for the people at Ross Camp to go. Um, I really appreciate the council members who tried to make sure that there was an adequate plan in place before closing Ross Camp. Thank you. Okay, so I'm seeing no others that want to uh, speak to us briefly within the one minute. Oh, please come forward. Hi, uh, I'm Robin Bloomy. I just want to say that I oppose this curfew. Um, I view it as another means of criminalizing homelessness. Well, go ahead and pause. I'm sorry. Go ahead and pause. I'll just want to, this is, uh, we're going to allow this person to speak and uh, without disruption, if we agree or disagree. So please continue without disruption. Uh, this is uh, a matter, that, an issue that matters a lot to me, extending compassion to our fellow humans. Uh, it seems inhumane to me to institute a curfew that is deliberately intended to displace people who are there because they have no place else to go right now. And that's all. One minute, please. Hi. Um, yeah, so what I just see it as, as Ross Camp 2.0, and uh, it's a big concern. It's right there on the beach. And, and I'm just wondering, like, uh, like we, here we go again, right? Like, this is the same thing that happened last year. And, and it's like, I wonder how much city council time, police time, planning staff, how much money as a city we're actually spending dealing with this issue and not like, and research it the same way we're, that you're researching uh, what, um, what it's costing to live here also. This is a, it's just, you know, it seems like we're focusing a lot of energy on a very small portion of our population. And so, um, it's just, it's just, it's just overwhelming, and I guess, I guess my biggest concern is, um, um, let me think, uh, is, uh, <laughs> I guess, if doing nothing and allowing this go to go on will definitely ensure that there will be a recall election. So, good luck. Next speaker, and you'll have one. So, a lot of the people who uh, support this are the same people who oppose rent control. And let's just be clear, we live in a town where average people just can't afford to live here. I'm semi-homeless right now, and I have a professional job of 15 years, and my family is dual income. And like the cheapest one-bedroom home is, would put me in the category of being rent burdened. So then like people can't afford to live here, and then we go, oh my gosh, there's all these tents on the beach. Where did those come from? So, you know, like I, I think, Obviously, there's a problem camping on the main beach if we have the fecal coliform bacteria spiking. That's a real problem. But 
we need some solutions for people to be able to live in the city. You know, of course single mothers are living in their RVs, and of course, like, poor and working people are camping on the beach. We can't afford to live in this town. We need rent control, and we need a managed encampment where people can go and be safe. Yeah. Hey guys, super stoked to be here. Nice to meet you. Um, having fun. So, unhappy users equal addicts. I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks to Drew and Chris for being an inspiration to me. Like, you have support, okay, from young people. I'm the chair of the Youth, Advi of the youth Advisory Board, so right now I'm creating um, homeless services for young people because I was homeless as a youth. I was homeless as, like, an underage youth, so is that my fault? Some people might think so. I don't think so. It's really personal to me, and I'm so glad to, like, see some of these, like, like good people here, you know, like, showing compassion. And it's actually not surprising to see some like really hateful comments from people as well, but yeah, I just wanted to say something. Mostly give you guys props, so. Hi, I'm Jane Mew, and I wanna bring another aspect into this. The, um, the river mouth and the beach is a area where the migratory birds come in and rest. Unfortunately, due to all the camping that is happening so close to the river, the migratory birds aren't able to land. You see them circling and then heading back out. They are protected. So that to be considered as well and maybe have a biologist look at that. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Corbett Wright. I own and operate the West Cliff Inn at 174 West Cliff. Um, I'm a law-abiding citizen who invests in and gives back to our community by supporting the arts, Second Harvest, and our schools. Increasingly, I, I feel like we're under attack by lawlessness. We have always had a homeless community, which I've ende endeavored to help through my church, um, but this is different. The, the drug use and the related crime is seemingly out of control from a business perspective. I live there. At the West Cliff Inn, our occupancy is down this year. It's been up every single year since 2007, which since we opened. It's down this year. We have had employees threatened. We have had homeless sleep on the front porch. We have had homeless enter the hotel and try to use the microwave in the bathroom. Our complimentary guest breaks have been stolen multiple times. Vehicles have been broken into, needles on the sidewalk, our landscape and has been damaged. And right. you're welcome to email your comments. I'll, I'll like send you my time. comments, thank sure. you so much. Any last uh, one minute speakers here? No, one minute, okay. I would just like to implore city council to limit my children's uh, exposure to human feces and needles, which have been a regular part of their childhood. Uh, and I like to imagine that my children who don't feel safe in city parks might still feel safe going to the beach. Um, I'm Sean Davis. I'm uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz. I'm 51 years old. Um, I'm also a recovered drug addict for 11 years. I've been homeless in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm a renter. I vote. I'm an African American. And I think I'm for this curfew. Um, I think it's completely, I, I agree that we need a solution. Um, camping on the beach is not a solution to homelessness and it's not where people uh, need to set up shop. Um, you know, we need to take care of our people and that this is, you know, it's all people. It's people that vote, it's people that use the beach, it's homeless people, it's drug addicts, it's all of us. We all need to take care of each other and this is not the solution. So that's what I got. Uh, Mr. McHenry, are you speaking for one minute? No. Okay, we'll go ahead and have uh, any last people who want to speak for one minute to come forward. Okay, if not, we're going to go ahead and honor our presentations. I don't have a request from you, so we'll no, have I that mean. open up later. Well, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and invite up Mr. Norris. You're welcome to speak on behalf of Huff for your four minutes, if you'd like. Yeah, but we're going to go ahead and start your first on my list. You were the first to request, so you're welcome to come forward. I prefer it if you'd like to come up now would be the time. I'd rather. Well, now's the time to come up if you want your presentation. If not, we're happy to have you come a different time. 
This is your four minute presentation on behalf of Huff and I do it chronologically. Well, you requested a presentation on behalf of Huff. I do. City of you are uh, required under the Brown Act to give members of the public the opportunity to address the council, um, but not at the moment of their choosing. Okay, so now would be the time if you'd like to address the city council for your uh, four minutes. Thank you for the clarification. Not that I respect the city attorney's opinion, but nonetheless. All right, so I'm speaking on behalf of Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, but I think it also concerns the entire community. and. Um, I, the reason I asked whether can't you can't hear me. Can't hear me. How's that? Probably speaking to the microphone will help. Oh, good. That way we'll go ahead. Can... We'll go ahead and allow. I, I was. We'll go ahead. You can pause the time. The thought, go ahead. But I prefer to speak this way because people can hear me. I know I've observed it from. from home. So homeless people who might otherwise be here are faced with a conflict because the catch presentation just let out, and so this has kind of been organized so that. People who are most impacted by it can't be here. So we have this business of a drug war paranoia and anti-homeless hysteria where various members of the audience before me, I don't know whether you spoke or not, um, are expressing things vaguely, but we don't have the documentation that really shows a public safety menace. So needles on the street is, of course, an important issue, no question. But the issue is, is there is, is that a problem specifically related to these campsites? There's been no one, you claim, now you feel there is. It is when and I, hear, I hear that from the audience and I appreciate that. Yeah. But, but I think that you have to show, do you have any evidence of that? I mean, that's- Well, go ahead, this is not, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the uh, time here. This is an opportunity for you to address the council. It's brought to my attention. You can address the council with your back tor toward back turn to good us. Good point. Good point. I, and, I, and we're going to not understand. open up a dialogue between you and I the agree. community. So we'll go ahead and listen. And I, and I, I apologize to the audience for that. You can start the time back up. All right. Thank you. Um, so this matter has not gone through the public safety committee. It hasn't gone through the Parks and Rec Commission, which met yesterday. It hasn't gone through the Catch Commission or the Police Chief's Advisory Body, which met last week. So it hasn't gone through any of these bodies. It's just here, it's slam bam, the uh, Lynn Renshaw special, right through. And I understand some people feel very strongly about it. But nonetheless, it's important that there be a process where this happens because the same people that want to stop encampments, generally in the city, anywhere, and I think that probably includes people in this audience, perhaps not, uh, want this process for what they're concerned about. So this needs to be care carefully considered. It needs time. You don't, really, you don't really have that situation now. And that needs to be sent back to one of these commissions to examine it. Particularly, I mean, the fact that you have calls for service is not, is not a crime. There's no indication of the number of citations or the number of convictions, or what exactly are the crimes. And if you talk to people who are on the beach, you find this is the cleanest campground area that actually, it, it's no Ross camp, let's put it that way, to use that kind of a metaphor. Um, you need, obviously, more open bathrooms. You don't need the horror stories of Isaac Ray or Reed Galagli, which we got rolling at us from the staff here, from, from uh, Tony Elliott and, and Chief Mills without really a lot of particulars. There were no particulars in the staff report. The only thing we finally got was this sudden presentation here at city council. I requested of council member Glover that he send me this information in advance, but apparently he didn't get it either. So, you know, it's, it's one of these done deal things where Justin Cummings is essentially roped into a council majority and rolls right along with the assurance that everything will be okay because uh, the data will come in later. Um, I, I think that that's really sad and it's something the community has to respond to. Um, this APO that's being used to close this down is a new excuse or what Chief Mills perhaps calls tools, the tools to go after homeless people that they don't want on the beach, whether they're committing any crimes or not. And camping is not a crime but it is in essence being treated as one here, and this is a sneaky way to try to do that. Thank you.
The next yeah. person, no, we're still on, we're, if you're interested in the two minutes, you're welcome to get in line. We're still on uh, presentations. So the next person who reached out was um, a Phil Posner on behalf of Conscious in Action. And you're welcome to come forward and you'll have four minutes. Thank you. <laughs> My cons first of all, did you receive what I ha handed out yesterday? Okay, and can we put that up for the public to see? Why don't you go ahead and pause the time? In, in this document, I tried to deal with the issue of the ethics that we're faced with regarding homelessness. So I have two columns. On the left is a situation as described by a couple who's experiencing homelessness. And on the opposite side is a couple that just got a new mattress and their dog gets to sleep on the mattress. And I try to create a tension between the homeless people who are, are accused of trespassing on Coral Street and therefore are looking for another place to sleep so they go to the beach. Whereas the other, the couple that just got the mattress, they, they have a, a dog that has a peaceful shelter place. Dogs and human beings. I just heard, and I, I like animals too, but I just heard a comparison about birds, a concern for birds on the beach. What about human beings who have no place to go and who are getting citations at Coral Street for trespassing? I suggest to you that the real issue is the lack of communication between the city council and its agencies and close quote homeless people. And this doc, this, this whole new thing exactly reflects that. It, it suggests that the public and the homeless are adversaries that there's an adversarial relationship, and therefore we have to protect the public as if homeless people are not part of the public. The solution, I think, is to create a, com a, a committee of people, people like me, people from Parks and Rec, from the police department, who, and I think, I do think that the city manager has tried to do this to a degree, to meet with some of the homeless people right now at the beach and say, look, we have a problem. We, we know that there are drugs and their situation and evidently there's a rise in bacteria. There, there is a legitimate problem, homeless people who are living here. But we also want you to have a place where you can sleep. So, Let's get together and see how we can resolve the differences and make the, the and, and arrive at a solution so that there can be beaches for the public and beaches for the homeless people. Lastly, I want to suggest that this issue, this ethical issue reflects this whole thing about, my God, the public gets the parks and the homeless people get Coral Street or the River Street camp if, it's, if there's enough people. Why can't we use parks in an organized way or beaches in an organized way with enforcement nece necessary when, when it's required and at the same time create a situation where homeless people don't feel like they are the adversaries as I think Chris said, or Drew, at a recent meeting, why can't we think outside of the box? San Francisco, LA, some of the other major cities are doing that with some, suggest with some successful opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then our last group presentation is on behalf of Stepping Up Santa Cruz, and we have Serge here, go ahead. Stepping up Santa Cruz. Hey, uh, my name's Serge, and for Stepping Up Santa Cruz, for anybody who doesn't know me, um, I made a website with immediate resources and stuff. So um, I do a lot of stuff with the homeless, but I really um, like what the council does sometimes about uh, wanting data and wanting to understand a problem. Um, 
So uh, as Rabbi Posner was just talking about, about negotiating, communicating, I wish that, there were, that the conversation was different about each group making demands and opinions about other groups, and it was more about the needs. That absolutely, I'm gonna agree that no child should be stepping on used needles, and no, but no child should be stepping on fecal metal. Absolutely agreed. That doesn't mean that the city doesn't have the option to continue doing the, the straining of the sand thing that they've already set up. Um, so it seems to me that these are mitigatable factors to keep people safe. We couldn't find a place in any community that was willing to accept these people, and they found a place where there's no homes. Yes, there are absolutely issues about cleanliness and making sure the beach is safe and stuff like that, super true. So the question to me is, is that possible? Not, I assume it's not possible. Um, the, the question on public safety and accountability versus social services and, and compassion, there has to be a balance there because three strikes, zero tolerance, capital punishment, these don't change people's behavior. Homeless people will be sleeping outside. They will be defecating. They will be peeing. People who are addicted will be dropping needles. We're just moving them closer to people's houses again, which is not solving the problem. Um, trying to get the social services in there and trying to get them to move forward and be engaged in the system in different services like Ross Camp, that was a place that a lot of people actually got signed up for CalFresh and food stamps who hadn't been before because they just weren't accessible. Um, there, were, Tony uh, was talking about the potential of needs in trash, but it actually hasn't even come up yet. Like it, the numbers were not data significant. So it's, can these things be managed? Is there somewhere we can help them put needles or have trash cans? The fecal matter is up, the bathrooms are closed. You could open the bathrooms. And, um, so for me, um, those are absolute issues, but it's how do you deal with these different things? Employees being unsafe? Absolutely, employees should be safe. Um, Susie and you guys, when you guys were talking about the Depot Park idea, was just a nighttime thing. It was gonna be completely managed. Well, maybe that's a possibility for the beach, as long as, depending on how much beach is available in the winter and stuff. But that idea of it's just a night thing and it's managed for the things that haven't even been problems yet. I just wanna really be clear, there was no data on actual problems. On having calls for service, again, the police chief definitely knows also that calls for service doesn't equal arrestable offenses. Like there's a super high percentage of calls as opposed to arrests. Um, so the health and safety concerns is a potential if it was not managed. Ross Camp was not managed. It was managed later when it was already spiraling out, but managing things early, I think is something that we should think about. F somebody said something about focusing a lot, of, a lot of energy on a very small problem. I think that uh, we're focusing on moving them and not moving them forward. I think that's sort of a difference. Um, drug use out of control in that area. There weren't more needles in that area particularly found. There's a lot on the national level, there's a lot of stuff about the opi opioid epidemic and pharmaceutical companies paying billions of dollars because of what they knowingly started and a lot of empathy for that. But opioids got more and more, I'll stop. Okay. Thanks guys. So now it's the time for um, members of the community who want to address us in two minutes. And if you could please line up to my left and we'll. I, email, uh, yesterday to ask for four minutes. I didn't receive your email. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I, yeah, I apologize. You're welcome to do two minutes though, if you like. Okay, you're welcome to come forward. I do have a, a thing to say real quick. On photographic images, uh, I, I would like to do uh, uh, Be quick though. Yeah, you have your two minutes, yes. go ahead. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, do a Facebook page called Homeless Outside in Santa Cruz. Obviously I uh, administer the Warming Center Program and Coalition on Homelessness. And really I'm uh, focused on, on basic <coughs> hopes. I'm not an act activist, I'm not a protester, but I'm trying to build things and try to bring the floor of our community up. I'm trying to find ways to work together with the entire community. Uh, I understand the fears of the community around poop and needles, uh, but I decided to go camp there. That's my camp, uh, tent right there at the lower left or uh, and 
and I stayed there for two nights and three days. Uh, what I found was starkly different than what we're hearing. Uh, there were no, uh, uh, there was no crime that I discovered. I, uh, overnight it was pretty uh, peaceful. There were no needles. In fact, people got up and cleaned. I didn't see any police uh, helping with the sifter for the three mornings I was there, not, not one cop. The sifter uh, uh, waited for people to move their tent over. We moved our tent over, we moved it back. It actually worked perfectly. This is an easily manageable thing. Uh, there's, there are many spaces in between this, the, these poles that we're talking about here. Uh, fecal matter, I understand uh, this, the, the cows, we shouldn't even be talking about fecal matter because E. coli goes up and down. We understand we've been talking about this for many years. Uh, Cynthia Matthew, Matthews can uh, attest. We, at first there was a leaking pipe, then it was a bird and uh, uh, seals, and then it was homeless people. That's why you put the curfew on cows. Uh, so it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, what we have here is just a lack of planning. We're not getting out of head of this. Uh, I stayed uh, also at the Benchlands and I spent a lot of time at the Ross Camp. We're not getting ahead with transitional encampments that show promise all over the Northwest. This is our, our fault as a city. Uh, um, let's not blame it on those people down there. They're actually behaving amazingly well. Let me just assert, this does not qualify for Coastal Commission alarm. It's, this doesn't warrant it at all. In fact, there's no reason for a curfew. Let's get out with some of these nonprofits and work with the people. Let's, let's find manageable ways instead of extreme uh, circumstances. Thanks. Okay, Garrett Phillip. Uh, I kind of think a curfew applies to everybody, seems fair to me. It seems like, uh, you know, it applies to all. Anyway, some time ago I sarcastically suggested if we really wanted to advertise Santa Cruz as a place where homeless would migrate, would be by having food not bombs locate to in front of the boardwalk. Maybe you remember that. That does not now seem like an unimaginable degenerative fantasy I engaged in. It is happening with a new Ross camp emerging on the main beach. You can call it main camp, boardwalk camp, it doesn't matter. It will be an unimaginable decline of public morals and sacred places into a morass of people behaving badly, defiant homeless on parade, and an economic short circuit of a hallmark institution that defines the city. There appears to be no boundary between the public good and total disregard for it. It matters what our public spaces degenerate into, whether they are preserved for all or allowed to become militant expressions of individual failure and self-reliance. Is there no place in the city whatsoever off limits to the spoil of public spaces with blight and those that cannot function with respect for societal norms? Let's get real. Santa Cruz has 560% more homeless than the state average per population. No one wants to ask if that's too many except for me. It is. No one truthfully wants to answer why. It is because they come or stay for the free stuff, be it a concentration of government subsidy, subsidy, really mostly just here, or a multitude of some nonprofits, that's some nonprofits who do nothing but attract and subsidize homeless here in an orgy of back padding virtuosity. For instance, the militant, demeaning public sidewalk feedings in front of major institutions. Bleeding heart other Blaming liberals abound, but that hasn't made it better, has it? Really only worse. And they actually need to accept some blame for these numbers. I know compassion is not genuine when it is accompanied by self-interest, assertiveness, rudeness, militancy, and disrespect. There may not be an immediate solution. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Dan Smart, Director at Dream In. Been working on Cal's Beach for seven years and we are very pro the curfew that is currently in place at Cal Beach and as well as looking into this to come onto Main Beach. A Couple of things I wanted to look at and listening to some of the other folks that have been speaking tonight, I personally have picked up over 15 needles on Cal Beach in the past three months. Two of those needles directly at the entrance to my pool deck where many and most of my guests and children go to enjoy the fruits of what we offer here as our beaches in Santa Cruz. Within my two minutes, I wanted to read a few comments just with some of my guests and our guests that have brought over $10 million of TOT tax revenue to this area. Not sure what you can do, but the homeless on the beach with their tents is awful. We, want, we went for a walk on the beach and had to turn around to come back. Not a good look for Santa Cruz. Overall comment card. When you pay to stay at a lovely hotel, you don't want to see homeless people having intercourse on the beach. It was quite disturbing, and especially if children were to witness this display. We will not be back next year. 
overall guest comment card. Great stay overall. The second day, homeless were shooting up and camping on the beach right below us. They also peeped, pooped below our balcony. Been coming for years, however, may not return. Stay improvements. Fewer homeless in close proximity to the hotel. It makes walking around the beach and the boardwalk not an enjoyable experience for my young children and family. Overall guest card comment. I realize the difficulty of the homeless situation in Santa Cruz. However, we would have liked to see a little more urgency and resolution regarding the couple sorting trash all over the beach and staying overnight in their tents while we were here. We could have been a very dangerous situation for our children playing in the area. So this is something that we see a lot of. I personally work with Save Our Shores to do many area beach cleanups, collecting over 450 pounds of trash, half of that. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Watkins, Council Members. I'm Maggie with Ivy with Visit Santa Cruz County. We are the tourism marketing agency for our community. I'm here to support the ordinance for a curfew on Main Beach. The recent occurrence of camping on Main Beach is causing concern that there's another Ross camp in the making, causing incompatible conditions for our visitors serving Main Beach and Wharf area. Behaviors such as hostile behavior, littering, including syringes, are examples of prog problems that have been talked about tonight by the public and staff. Also of concern is that regional and statewide media have seized on the opportunity to tell this story, identifying our community and the main beach as a homeless encampment. The main beach is clearly not equipped to deal with overnight camping for the homeless or anyone else for that matter. In terms of facilities, or environmental impacts. From an economic standpoint, as Northern California residents consider their next vacation, a community that's featuring a main area as a homeless encampment, inebriated individuals, threats of contact with syringes, human feces, will not, this community will not be on the top of their list. We will not be on their list. The city, our locally owned businesses, their employees depend on this $1 billion industry every year for survival. Whether you like tourism or the tourists or not, we depend on the tourism industry and we can expect devastating impacts if a curfew is not enacted immediately. Council members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. My name is Chris Reyes. I'm from the Santa Cruz Seaside Company. Uh, I want to share our perspective on this. We obviously support the curfew. Uh, we've heard from quite a few guests over the last few weeks, from clients, customers, uh, parents of employees, very concerned about the situation, expressing a lot of reservation, hesitation about having young people work there. Uh, visiting, things like that. So uh, it is a real impact. We've heard concerns from our own employees. As many of you know, we clean the beach as part of a decades long agreement with the city. Um, our employees that are out there cleaning the beach daily during the summer and on a limited uh, basis this time of year have expressed a lot of concerns about the conditions they face out there and the harassment they face from time to time. Uh, so I wanna share that with you so you know that perspective. I suspect that uh, that's not much of a needle mover though. Uh, really what we're talking about tonight is setting limits. And sometimes as elected officials, y'all have to set limits. And what the staff has brought to you, I think is a modest limit to address some issues that are happening on Main Beach. Uh, and so you have to decide what those limits are gonna be. Uh, you have an overwhelming number of letters in support of the curfew, people asking you to set that limit. And so tonight we hope that's what you'll do. Uh, but I wanna address something real quickly, uh, that's solutions. Every time we have a meeting like this, we're not really able to talk about solutions. We spend an exorbitant amount of staff time, public time, council time, working on these limits. And we never get to really discuss the solutions. So what I suggest is tonight let's set a limit, the limit that's before you by staff. And let's have a broader conversation about how to really solve these problems. Everybody here wants to solve these problems, even though we might differ on the way to do it. I work for the largest private employer in Santa Cruz, locally owned family business, been here since 1907. I'm happy to participate in any meaningful dialogue about solutions, but first we need limits. So please vote to enact the curfew. Thank you.
Good evening, I'm Nancy Crusoe. And mm, let me move this down. What I want to say is that I would like all of us to question our premises about people who sleep outside. We have some knee-jerk responses that there will always be sub a mess and there will always be criminal activity. Now, I have not seen enough data to support that. I know some has been presented tonight, but I also know that firsthand data has shown that the extreme mess and debris that was expected isn't there. There is some cooperation. There is cleanliness. I think sometimes we have to rethink our own premises in order to allow any change at all because we talk a lot about transition for homeless people. You can't transition without change. And change probably starts at the top because we can re-see we're not separate people, we're not separate groups of people. Housed people leave needles. Housed people leave messes. We never look to see who did it. We just see the needle and automatically go, homeless person. And I question those assumptions, and I would like my city government to as well. Thank you. Thank you. Many groups in this room, so I'd rather not people know my face since I've had that happen. My name is Elise Casby, and I'm here to discuss the fact that I really suspect this is kind of an underhanded ploy by Bernal City staff on one hand, the authorities such as our police chief who clearly hates the homeless and the fire marshal who is very concerned for a lot of people's health and safety, but not the health and safety of homeless people or poor people, and Mayor Watkins, Matthews, Myers, and the minority on the council. So first of all, it was really interesting how quickly this issue got on the agenda. I have council members who are telling me they are absolutely having a difficult time getting anything on the agenda. They are not included in discussions. They have barely met with the mayor at all for anything. Communication here is clearly favored towards certain business entities. So let's start with the Sentinel. The Sentinel comes in with its usual splash, yellow journalism. Oh, no, homeless people on the beach. We quickly see an item put on the city council agenda. And now we're hearing about what? Blood and feces, poop, blood and feces, poop. All the anecdotal information. This is really kind of sad that a city of the quality of Santa Cruz comes up with such lurid anecdotal information all the time by department heads. Um, so, <laughs> uh, this has not gone through any committees. Staff are being quite selected and their data is highly questionable. The APO is flawed. The California collusion, co Constitution, by the way, uh, uh, City Attorney uh, Mr. Condati allows and requires for maximum public access to the beach. Drew's question to you was quite civil and appropriate, so I found the faces you made a little difficult to swallow. And I'm tired of the faces being made to our public servants who are trying to protect all people and not just the wealthy. I think the Dream Win is squatting on that territory. How cheap is the cheapest room? And let's look into their environmental uh, degradations. Yeah. Right, next speaker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. My name is Curtis Rutherford again, and I'm here. And this this is not the solution, y'all. First of all, I thank the Native Americans for having this here. I think we should give this back to the Native Americans and follow their lead. We done took everything. The rich, they own the dry land, the wet land, and they out there digging 365 days a year in that oil, digging in the ground. These plants are miles in big cities, huge. And we talking about this little speck in Santa Cruz, the homeless. The homeless is going to bring this to a fold. I love you. I love this community. This is where I found myself 33 years clean and sober. 
33 years of counseling and groups and therapies and help that I got. But what they taught me to go out here and do something about love, express love, be the only person downtown and expressing it to the top of your voice. Can you feel that? Can anybody feel that? Do you have compassion, sir? Do you have some compassion, ma'am? You talk about it, you look like lambs, but I say I hear a bunch of wolves up in here. There's no love here. But you can shoot me, kill me, knock me down. I am expressing it and I'm expressing it loud. Give me as many tickets as you want. This guy approached me as soon as I got out of my truck, talking about the law. Those Rosie Parr laws. Rosie Parr laws, talking about the dry land, the wet land, the get to, to fishes. Those are Rosie Parr laws. If you pay attention, these folks talking about helping people and y'all ain't paying attention to that. Your time is up. My, see, your time is up. Time is up for what? For your time for public comment. We have other members of the public. Ain't nobody talking about nothing. This okay. ain't no solution. Okay, Curtis. You I'd rather be I'm put go out. Ahead and ask you. Okay. Yeah, handcuff me, shoot oh, me, kill me. To. Because this ain't right, y'all. All the okay. rich just takes over everything. You sit out there like a whole bunch of. Okay, we're going to go ahead and ask you to either sit down or to uh, go ahead and, and go outside if you'd like. But we have still members of the community who have their two minutes to address the Can council. Can I use your point. two minutes? No, that's not how it goes. Okay, you're welcome to come forward. I think an esteemed person like Curtis should be allowed to speak four minutes. Um, now, homeless people are not going to just die or disappear by moving them from what uh, the, oh, it'll be from Ross Camp, and then it's gonna be, oh, now they're at the, the people at Ross Camp move to the beach, oh, now let's move the people from the beach to where your doorways even these so then if a transition camp is determined like at davenport the same individuals here against there being people camping on the beach or at ross camp or there's going to be a drug rehabilitation facility place somewhere or a, a navigation center, they'll be out here in force against that as well. The reality is homelessness is not only gonna not go away, it is clearly going to increase dramatically. And so we need to be getting ahead of that rather than pushing people around the neighborhoods. It is not to the people here who want to defend the beach, and I agree. The beach should be clean. It shouldn't be a campground. But the reality is there is no place for people to even be in our community unless they have the money to get a hotel room or buy a house or rent some uh, outrageously expensive place. You have to make $35 an hour to rent a one bedroom apartment in Santa Cruz. That is, is, is extreme. So today we're having this debate and it's, I find it very interesting because who else spoke nationally about getting rid of the homeless today and getting rid of the camps? And that was Donald Trump and his administration has got plans that are very similar to these plans that we're hearing here. So uh, if you wanna vote for uh, Trump's proposal, I uh, you, go ahead, thank you. Bye. Here we go again. So I have two things in my hand. One of them belongs on the beach. One of them does not. All of us are well aware of this. It's become normal in Santa Cruz and I'm so sick and tired of it. I shouldn't have to carry this with my seven-year-old when I go to my beaches. I shouldn't. Whether you're a parent or not, there's no excuse for it. Go pay $6. Keith, okay. excuse me. <laughs> Can you stop my time for that? I think we just did. That would yeah. be great. Are you finished? Not yet, I gotta pick everything up. You got to talk and nobody interrupted yeah, well, you. If you guys, if we can have you all bring the attention back towards the city council. And once, sir, you're in the front, once you're done, if we can please, thank you. So we hear always the same people up here, Norris and all his crew, homeless, 
wannabe activists for the past 30 years not offering any solutions, can't even point a homeless person to a shelter or a place that actually serves them. We have open beds, we have rehabs, we have motel vouchers, we have all of these things. <coughs> Ask any public servant who actually treats the people, the population that you guys are trying to solve this homelessness, this crisis, okay? You don't ask. You don't ask the nurses who actually save lives, administer the Narcan. You don't ask the police officers. You don't listen to your city park staff. The reason those beach sites right now at Main Beach are clean is because your workers are cleaning them. Did you hear what your director said? They're going down there at risk of violence to themselves and their families to deal with people who are heavily like loaded, right? and are gonna OD right there on the beach in front of the boardwalk where our tourism dollars rely on that. People come to have an experience, okay? It's unacceptable. It doesn't need to become normal in Santa Cruz when we have solutions. You've already been brought those solutions and you remain silent on doing any of them. And Crone, to deny mental health housing in your neighborhood, and think that that's okay, that's one part of this piece. So you need to get on board too. That's why people are not supportive of you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, before we get started, um, I'm gonna get a sense of how many more members of the community want to address the council on this item. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we'll have the gentleman in front be our last speaker. Um, I want to remind the community, you don't have to agree with what your uh, fellow citizens are saying, but you um, should give them the respect as we all want to be heard when we have our two minutes. So I'll ask that you um, uh, not disrupt the speaker as they have their two minutes for public comment, please. Honorable Senior Council Member, uh, my name is Pedro Castillo. Um, you know, I just wanna say that, and I don't wanna repeat the same thing, we know there is a, a uh, issue with the homeless, uh, I mean, everywhere on the, on the, on, on the county. Um, I work for the, for Caltrans, and we see it all the time, uh, cleaning um, encampments, you know, by the, by the freeway, everywhere. So there's something that it needs to be addressed, it needs to be uh, taken care of. I just wanna say that I, I really appreciate the, the work that you guys are doing. And it's a tough uh, job to do. There's tough decisions to make. So I just wanted to say that I really appreciate it and I, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. And then um, let's keep working together on how to solve this issue. Thank you. Hi, good evening, council members. My name is Rochelle Naroyan. Um, I sat in your seats not too long ago, and so I appreciate you being here and staying attentive as we all get up here and give our opinions. It's really important to remember what your decision is about tonight. Your decision isn't about solving homelessness. It isn't about providing more space for people to go. What it's about is... I'm gonna go ahead and pause your comments. Oh. Mr. McHenry, I'm gonna ask you one last time to please lower your sign below your shoulders. If I see you do, raising it again, I'll ask you to stand in the back if you want to stand, if you want to hold that up without obstructing the view of those behind you. Okay, go right ahead. So your decision is whether or not you impose a curfew on the main beach. That's really what your decision is. And you're and, and imposing the curfew, you are, um, like an earlier speaker said, setting standards for the level of cleanliness that we expect to have on our beach, the type of behavior on our beach, and the proper use of our beach. I have to say, when I was in high school, I would go down to the beach and at around 10 o'clock, and we weren't really doing anything but just hanging out, usually a police officer would come along and say, <clears throat> time to get out of here. Um, and, and so, I don't think it's a oppressive idea to um, have standards down on our beach. Uh, we need them because if you've seen the local media has picked up on the story that we do have people camping at the beach and thousands of people in our city and our county rely on the tourist industry to earn their income to be able to live here. And a lot of these folks are not our biggest income earners in the state, but they're working hard and they wanna make a life in Santa Cruz. And by allowing camping on the beach, we're not being very respectful of that. And it's also an industry that creates revenue that we use as a city to not only spend on 
your typical city services, but we also give money to homeless services. If we don't have the revenue, we can't support some of the causes that we all believe in here locally. So I really hope that you make a good common sense decision and support the curfew. It's worked very well at Cal Beach. Um, it's been effective. We still see needles there, but it's a whole heck of a lot less. And I remember quite a few years ago, we heard about people stepping on needles, both children and adults. We haven't heard that recently. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alethea Soares or Alley Cat, and I am a homeless woman in Santa Cruz in transitional housing. It's really important to me and I get really fired up. Can we put the human back into homelessness? Because I did everything I was supposed to. I was an independent, hardworking mom and wife, lost everything. I don't have a raving drug problem. I'm not an alcoholic. Um, I could be if that means I get help, but that's not the issue. There's not enough shelter beds in this county. I live on Coral Street. You can't, where do you want these people to go? There's wide open spaces. Granted, it may not be aesthetically pleasing to everybody, but you're forgetting that homeless, homeless people are human beings, just like every single one of you on the council, just like people behind me, everybody struggles. So remember that when you're trying to remove these people from someplace, when they have no place to go. I have no place to go, nobody to call. There's nobody to call if I lose where I'm, where I'm currently sheltered. So remember that when you're trying to kick these people off the beach for just trying to survive. And there aren't shelter beds. Serge was saying something to me right before I walked up, but I don't really remember. Um, <laughs> just keep the human in it. You, can't, you can dehumanize us all you want, but we're still human beings. We all have feelings. Not all of us put ourselves in the situation we found ourselves in. You know, you can all be one pitch check away from being homeless. I was, <laughs> and a disability. So do you fault me if the beach is the only place I have to, to lay down safely? So yeah, I'm in favor of seeing more data. I'm in favor of, of outreach to these people. Have you spoken to them? Thank you. Good evening. Before you, before you get started, Mr. McHenry, I, I have to say, I've heard um, a number of comments. The last comment was directed towards our staff member. I've asked you numerous times to um, lower your sign this evening. I'm gonna go ahead and give you an official warning. If there is a further disruption, I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you please leave. It's, it's distracting and it's intimidating to have folks come up and try to speak and address the council when you're making comments the entire time behind them and intimidating them and not allowing their two minutes with respect to be heard. Whether or not you agree with them or not. So I respectfully ask that you refrain from making the comments. We've had your two minutes. We've respectfully acknowledged and listened to those. And I'm going to go ahead and ask that you now do so for their, your fellow citizens. Um, if you don't, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to leave as I feel I've given ample opportunity for you to switch gears, if you will. So we'll go ahead and have you address the council. As my understanding, you'll be the last member, or unless we have any others of the community who want to address the council for two minutes. Seeing none, any other members of the community wanting to address the council? Okay, oh, we have one final. You'll be our last speaker. Why don't you go ahead? You'll have your two minutes. You'll be our last speaker and then we'll return back for action, please. Uh, good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, it's uh, disconcerting that there is no map that shows where the mean high tide is. And I believe that the reason there isn't one is because the Ninth Circuit Court uh, a few years back made a ruling that the mean high tide is not where the tide ends, but where it may end. If there's a seawall or some, uh, you know, riprap or some obstruction to keep the tide away, that where it would go to. So actually the mean high tide is probably somewhere past Beach Street. It's out there, you know, right in front of the La Bahia sidewalk or something. And so, you can't restrict that area. Everything below the mean high tide and 20 feet opposite the mean high tide is open to the public 24 hours a day. 
So I think that you need, really need a map to show you where it is. And like I said, the Ninth Circuit Court has ruled on this and they said that it's where the tide would go, not where it stops at a seawall. Um, the other issue is needles. The reason people drop their needles is because they can get arrested for having a dirty needle. They don't drop clean needles everywhere. They drop dirty ones because that's an arrestable thing. If the chief of police would order his police to stop arresting people, I don't think, you know, and, and it got known around town that they're not gonna be arrested for it, they wouldn't be dropping them everywhere. The second thing, if there is actually uh, fecal matter in the beach, open the damn restrooms at the end of the wharf so people can use them all night long and try to get volunteers from the campers to clean the restrooms. I'm sure that could all happen. Thank you. Um, hi, Pat Malo. Um, I've lived in Santa Cruz my entire life and I'm planning to do it for the rest of time if I'm able. Um, so I, you know, I think that we should remind ourselves that either way this vote goes, it's not gonna fix the issue. Um, at best, it's gonna push you know, the issue to other places. And that seems like the cycle we've been in for my entire lifetime really here. Um, I agree with, you know, I grew up in the junior guard program. I was a junior guard instructor. I was a, you know, lifeguard and you know, still use that beach on a regular basis. And um, so I agree that Maybe it should go somewhere else, but we need to locate that somewhere else on the double. And I've watched for the last six months, you know, conversations, really good ideas on all sides come up and we have been unable to do really anything because we're fighting about the problem instead of fighting to solve the problem. And, you know, I think that's for everyone in the room is guilty of that to one degree or another. And, you know, if we, we all agree this is some sort of crisis, either a public health crisis or a humanitarian crisis. And I think we just need to, you know, get together on the 90% of this stuff that we all agree on and do something fast. Because if it can't be there, it's gotta be somewhere else, you know? And I've heard a lot of good ideas, again, transitional camping, um, figuring out ways to stop criminalizing and start like moving to stabilize folks. And you know, it's a huge drug epidemic, it's a mental health crisis, it's all of these things true, but it's you know, a problem that it's on us to fix. So thank you, um, I, you know, being the last speaker, it's a pleasure and the seats outside are very nice. So thank you. We're gonna, no, I'm sorry, Brent, we're done with coordination. No, we're done with public, I'm gonna go ahead, please, please, I, I, please, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and take a seat. We've heard your public comment. All right, you can go, that's, you've been warned as well. Okay, um, we've had a, a chance for public comment. I appreciate those who are able to come and speak to us on this item. We're gonna go ahead and return back to council action and deliberation, Vice Mayor Cummings. So I just wanna thank everybody for sending in their emails and everybody who attended tonight to make their comments. Um, I think that you know one of the things that we've all heard tonight and that we all agree on is that we have a homelessness crisis in our community. We have a housing crisis in our community, um, but um, of all the places in our community where we could have um, people who are homeless um, dwelling and sleeping, I think we can. I think many of us can agree that our main beach is not the most appropriate place for that to happen. Um, <laughs> we really need to think about solutions, and we have um, a group right now who is from our community who's supposed to be going over what are potential solutions and bring back recommendations to our city council. I just wanted to ask very quickly before making a motion: Can we? Susie, if it's possible, um, can you provide any kind of update on when we might be receiving recommendations? Because it sounds like um, if we continue to just push people out of these places, uh, we're just gonna have the same situation happening. Sure, thank you, Vice Mayor Cummings. So the CATCH, um, the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness has met three or four times. They met again this evening and we we did convene until 7.15 so the CATCH members could be over here and, and, and a lot of them are here. So they are in the process of developing their, what we're calling phase one work plan. And there is a strong intentionality to bring recommendations to you even in advance of the winter shelter season. Um, 
those those recommendations are likely going to be around hygiene, sheltering, and the siting of encampments, and, tr and also including the program modalities that we would expect um, for that. So. I think that the intention is to come back as quick as we possibly can with recommendations on that, and then come back again likely in January, and then again um, ahead of your budget um, sessions in, in May. Thank you. So um, i just also like to say we, we can't wait until we have a public health and environmental emergency on one of our main beaches. I think that we need to actually deal with the situation currently and you know, just thinking about what could potentially happen in the winter months if we had um, a homeless encampment on our main beach. We've had storm surges that goes far up to the boardwalk and if we weren't prepared for that to happen, we could see many people potentially lose their lives while sleeping on the main beach. We could also see a lot of debris and materials from the tents going into our oceans. And one of the things we really pride ourselves on is trying to protect, protect our oceans, beaches, and waterways and our environment as a whole. So I'm, propose, I'm uh, proposing to uh, adopt the city's recommendation. And one small adjustment would be also to include prohibiting unpermitted temporary storage structures from the hours of midnight to one hour before sunrise. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by uh, Councilmember Matthews. Um, I got notice from uh, Councilmember Myers that she would like to um, uh, weigh in here. Uh, if we can, uh, she, okay, could, please. Could I ask for Councilman. clarification just in the meantime? The recommended action was to adopt the resolution, but with that added clarification from uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. That's right. Go ahead, Councilmember Myers. Yeah, I just have a question. I didn't catch the last part of the, um, the motion uh, from Vice Mayor um, Cummings. Did you want to repeat your motion? Sure. It's, it's um, to include in the motion prohibit unpermitted temporary storage structures from midnight to one hour before sunrise. Thank you, Councilmember Myers. Uh, Councilmember Glover, and then Councilmember Brown. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Me, yeah. Okay. So I um, I want to appreciate the staff uh, for putting this report together so quickly and bringing this to our agenda. Um, it is miraculous how quickly something can get onto the agenda when um, we feel the need to act quickly. So I'm I appreciate that. Appreciate. All the people who came out tonight to, and the people who have communicated to us. Um, I just want to preface my comment with the um, with another comment, which uh, is related. I mean, I think we're here tonight because of a re serious collective failure. Um, in the past three decades that I have lived in Santa Cruz, 
we have failed. We have failed to have th this body in all of its different iterations has failed to muster the political will to adequately address this problem. We are never going to solve this problem. Um, but we have not done that. We as a community have, um, as uh, several people, uh, commenters suggested, have continued to come and talk about what we can't do, what limits need to be set. We are here tonight to talk about setting another limit. Um, and I appreciate that there are folks in the audience who have asked us to, um, to do that and be honest about that. Um, so I, I am going to support the motion, but I'm going to do that with the full knowledge that we are not doing this because there is a public, I, I do not believe, I have not seen evidence that there is an existing um, public safety hazard. I understand that this, it, there is a potential for this to grow, and this is about setting limits about how we manage this resource and, and provide access for all users, because providing access for some can limit it for others, and we have to acknowledge that. So, um, but I also think we have to acknowledge our collective failure, and I'm doing that right here, and I'm hoping that we can get serious about the conversation about, um, and, and get the political will together to find safe spaces for people to be, to sleep. If we had the votes, I feel like we could, we could actually do that. And I'm very heartened that uh, there are folks in the community, thank you Mr. Reyes for stepping up and saying you would be part of that conversation. And thank you for being realistic in saying this is about setting limits, that's what we're doing. So I, I think I'll leave it there. Um, and I, um, you know, I, well I do wanna say one other thing. It, this is not about, for me at least, this is not about um, dehumanizing people. I, I have been, to the beach, I have, I mean, I engage with people, I am not afraid to do that. I, these are, I, I easily understand that many of us could be in this same situation uh, were it for, you know, a, a turn in our luck or, you know, some kind of crisis in our lives. So I am not othering the people who are sleeping on the beach or who have, are unhoused in our community. I am not thinking about them as the other. I am thinking about them as needing to be part of the solution. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel like we have a lot more work to do in that regard. Um, tonight we're here to talk about this particular space and setting that limit, which I um, am going to support. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. So many places to start. Um, okay. So um, first, I guess, uh, I will ask the question of the motion maker. I appreciate your, your concern about the environment and also the concern about the potential safety of people, especially over winter months with the, the so storm surges. That all really makes a lot of sense. Where, uh, where do you suggest the folks that are on the beach now go and what is that relocation plan? Um, I know that we heard briefly from a staff member about the proposed need to go one by one tent by tent, uh, potentially starting tomorrow based off of their staff plans, but uh, how do you propose that that happen? What's the timeline? And uh, people that don't get seen tomorrow for whatever reason, maybe it's a lack of staff time or too many tents, what happens to them uh, in your motion? To, to, to address that, that situation. Maybe I'll just interject if I could briefly, is that my understanding is that that's not necessarily a component of the motion, that within the motion by accepting the recommendation, you're accepting that we would follow the standard operating procedure policy, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Oh, absolutely, no, I understand that, but uh, it would be enacting the standard operating procedures but without a plan of implementation except for the ones, like how, can, can someone explain it to me? Maybe the staff can explain it to me and it'll make it a lot easier to make the vote. Because just, I'm just really curious because as um, Alley Cat said, where do you want the people to go? And I totally want to, uh, I want to communicate to the public that's come to speak and that have sent the emails and posted things online about the concern. Because I totally agree that the, the content of fecal matter in the ocean is terrible. Uh, the possibility of people stepping on needles is abhorrent and unconscionable. The issue of, Trash getting into our ecosystem is terrible. The, the vandalism of bathrooms or the feeling of threatening natures from the staff is totally un-okay. So what are we gonna do to avoid 
displacing people even further, or where are we gonna ask them to go? And then could you, do you have a number of available shelter beds as of tonight with regards to asking people to go somewhere? So the available shelter beds for tonight is actually not what we would be going off of. It would be when we would be actually moving folks. Um, so uh, what I do want to express is that the standard operating procedures are very explicit in terms of what type of outreach we perform. So um, the intention, and, and we also have the county who's interested in doing smart path assessments um, from the human services department. Um, they are waiting upon me and upon this council's direction to figure out how best to move forward with that. But with regard to the SOPs, it is very explicit around the outreach and the availability of alternative locations for folks to be, and that will be something that we follow. Um, it's also explicit around the noticing time, the 72 hours, and it's explicit about how we handle the personal property of folks. Um, back in April, when this council body did approve the SOPs, you added language um, with a friendly amendment to really consider folks' um, possessions in a more explicit way, and that was added as well. So with regard to where people will go, I don't have an answer to that until we do the outreach and engagement, so it really is hypothetical hypothetical at this point. However, as I mentioned earlier, we have really strong partnerships with the Salvation Army. There are beds available currently at the River Street Camp. Um, in addition to, um, even though the last experience at Motel Santa Cruz was very challenging, um, they had um, a complete destruction of their hotel rooms um, by virtue of that process, they're still willing to step up and help us um, and have provided an opportunity for us to purchase um, motel vouchers as well for this period of time. So it really um, is incumbent upon staff to develop that process, but um, back in April when you approve the SOPs, it really does provide that explicit direction. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in February, as we all know, I came forward with a bunch of suggestions about camps and safe parking locations and all that kind of stuff. And it, all of that's been pushed into the catch, which has the work plan timeline of hopefully, potentially January is coming forward with some, some suggestions. At least that's the reports that I've gotten from members on the body. Uh, so we have three, four, about three months or so between now and when those recommendations come forward. So I'm just curious because uh, another community member <clears throat> mentioned, here we go again, just like Ross Camp 2.0. How much money are we spending on the issue? Uh, this seems like we're doing the same thing all over again. We're closing the beach, we're gonna put a curfew, we are gonna potentially do some kind of outreach to move them around and put them somewhere else, and then in a month, they're gonna be somewhere else, and we're going to have to be having this exact same conversation. Some of you I saw a couple months ago saying like literally the exact same things about Ross Camp. Um, now, not to, not to say that Ross Camp was good in any way, except for the fact that it had the potential for us to retrofit the site and turn into something that was healthier than what was already there. Unfortunately, we didn't take that stance. I voted against the closure of the camp specifically because of what we're dealing with right now, because of the reports that we hear in the Harvey West and the businesses, because of the issues that we see downtown on Front Street, because of now the encampment on Main Beach, which has been exacerbated by the coverage in the press, which I think was rather irresponsible. But what are we going to do to alleviate having to have this conversation again in two months? Because I love seeing all of you, but I think we could be talking about much more productive things, and we could be using money in a much more productive way to offer much more productive services. So uh, yeah, I'm really torn on this decision, because if I vote no, then people are gonna say that I am for trashing beaches and that I don't care about kids' safety. If I vote yes, then I'm going to displace or be a, a company to displacing people without any guarantee of shelter or without any knowledgeable place of where they're going to go because as the staff member just said, everything is completely hypothetical at the moment. So I'm at a moral crossroads as we all are on this dais and I'm really concerned about the direction that this is going because the people that I would have assumed would put up at least more of a conversation around what we're going to do, uh, made one comment and then opened up into a motion. So that's really disconcerting um, as far as the way that we move forward. Uh, it's the fault of our city. I totally agree with you, Councilmember Brown. Um, I, uh, to another m uh, member said that they were on the beach when they were in high school. Uh, I also had that same experience, except when I was in high school, I thought it was because they didn't want us to be unsafe. But in, now in retrospect, I realize that it's probably an anti-camping policy 
that was there. So what are we gonna do and how are we gonna move forward? I'd love uh, for us to be able to say that we're going to establish safe parking programs and camps, but I can't for at least another three months because of the resistance that we received initially when I brought this forward. So I don't know what I'm gonna do, uh, but I do just wanna put that out there because uh, there's so much going out there that people say, I just don't care, and that is not true. I care about the people that live in homes, but just as much as I care about you that live in homes, I care about the people that don't have homes. And right now, we're about to pass a piece of policy that is going to criminalize their existence in a certain area because they have nowhere else to go. And I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, I guess I'll just I'll just say I, I think you know I think we all share that it is it's absolutely a struggle it's absolutely a challenge there aren't clear solutions there isn't a pathway that feels like just the sole solution which I think we all want to get it to that place and so um, I recognize that how complicated this is and how there's areas of policy that don't necessarily feel. Um, like the best things that were best decisions that we're making at the time, but uh, but here we are and we have an uh, issue right before us that is impacting our community that for me feels like the right decision to make in terms of the curfew. I know that we've been through this before with the closure of the camp and then um, the different sort of uh, realities that we want to ensure take place based on the standard operating procedure. So given what we know with what we have, you know, this feels to me like the right decision to make. This is also an opportunity though for other council members to share other policy solutions or other proposals or amendments to the to the motion before us. But before us now is the, a motion to pursue the staff recommendation with the addition that Vice Mayor Cummings added. Um, that motion was seconded by council member Matthews. So unless there aren't any other policy solutions or further uh, discussion around that, then we'll go ahead and make the the call for the decision, if, if that feels accurate. Councilmember Crone. I had a question for um, Ms. O'Hara. Uh, just wondering, we can, is it possible, is it very difficult to get the council counts of all of the various shelters each, you know, the, the day after and give us those numbers? Because I, I'm, I'm really curious, I've, I've never seen them necessarily, but like what's VFW, 1220 River Street, uh, the Laurel Street, and anywhere else that we have either people staying in motels or, 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 or I would just really appreciate that information. Is, is that possible to get or? You mean on an on ongoing basis? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Would you take that as a friendly amendment that 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 be part of, uh, we get, the council gets counts every, um, each, each morning or when, when possible the day after? Uh, every morning I feel like is a, maybe a bit excessive. Um, maybe before the city council meetings. Or weekly, would that be would that be okay? If if you, sorry. Sure. Well, do you okay. want to specify <laughs> yeah, what's sure. possible? Sure, you know, I, I would like to talk to the county who holds the contracts for the winter shelter programs. I think that they do get um, the daily count, but I'm not entirely certain. So I do think that there, that information is accessible and I certainly could provide that for the, the city council in, in terms of how often they get it. It could be weekly. Um, I don't think it's daily, but it might be. That'd, that'd be helpful just because we hear a lot of just different noises um, sure. about what's available and what's not. And um, yeah, you said that maybe most people uh, aren't in favor of folks sleeping on the main beach. I, I, I would just pretty much think that everyone up here does not think the main beach is an adequate place for people to camp. I mean, that's just, um, you know, that's that would be a non-starter. Uh, but I'm, I'm gonna be very brief here. I, I would just go with um, some of the comments of, of uh, Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Brown and add myself to those comments too. I don't think we're, we're doing enough and I, I think that we're still sort of just, you know, listing, you know, uh, during this uh, huge crisis and it is a crisis, not just in Santa Cruz, it's across California, but we're, we're doing something tonight, but we're not um, leaving ourselves an out to say, okay, where are those, you know, I was on the beach today with Councilmember Brown, we counted 18 tents. Where are those 18 uh, folks gonna go um, when they leave the, the beach? They're gonna be in, in the, the Pogo Nip, they're gonna be in the Green Belt somewhere, or uh, so maybe some of them will avail themselves of, uh, of the shelter if, if, it, if, if it exists. Um, what Mr. Malo said, um, 
I think that uh, we need to locate places on the double, you know, and I'm just gonna end there and say we need to locate places for um, our folks who are the most vulnerable on the double. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, I will be supporting the motion. Um, uh, clearly, the camping on the beach uh, has arisen and is a growing problem. I've been um, uh, thoroughly satisfied by the testimony that it's not appropriate for a whole lot of reasons. Um, I am encouraged by what we know, not just from tonight, but ongoing um, conversation with staff that the county is much more is interested in becoming much more engaged with us on uh, solutions as well. And um, this is, is obviously a path. Um, I want to acknowledge the good faith effort of many, many community people over the years to grapple with this. It is a problem that has grown uh, remarkably in um, breadth and intensity in recent years. I think we all know that. Um, so the challenge is more than it's ever been. Um, uh, having said that, uh, I'm comfortable with the motion as is. I think we can give um, additional direction uh, to staff to come back with some accounting for availability and use of beds working with the county um, in a in a time frame that's not burdensome on a daily basis. Does that sound good to you? Okay. Okay, so unless there's any further uh, action or uh, direction, we'll go ahead and take Read the, the motion. motion again. Go ahead and re want to restate the motion. Okay. So the motion is to adopt the city's recommendation and also include prohibit unpermitted temporary storage structures from the hours of midnight to one hour before sunrise. And um, have the staff bring us an adequate time of report backs. You get the language from the tape. On Regarding, that. I got it. Yeah. Regarding available shelter space. Availability and use of shelter space in collaboration with the county. And how often was that again? At, at, a, at a frequency that is doable for them without being burdensome on a daily basis. That's what. Well, can we do weekly? Well, they'll we'll come go ahead. back. I know. think it was left that they're gonna try to. Serge, I'm going to go ahead and I've, I've noticed you. I know we're going to, this is not your opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go ahead and acknowledge the fact that the staff said that they're going to look into what would be feasible based on the partner's information. Okay. And we heard from Susie that they do, she thinks they do take account every night and somebody just said that too. So I just hope we get them. Okay. 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 Is there clarity on the motion? Is there any further direction or additions or discussion at this time? Councilmember Glover. Um, you, <laughs> I, there's a there's a lot to say, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go long. I'm just trying to think of the best way to surmise these thoughts in like two sentences. I find it difficult that we're choosing environment and economics over people. Um, I find it difficult to hear someone that represents as they put it, the largest employer in the community, uh, many of which are people from out of the area, international students that don't pay living wages for people to be able to stay in their houses. Uh, also uh, claiming that we need to set limits like the curfew on the beach, which is amazing at the speed that this came forward to the city council, as we mentioned before, and how long it takes for us to look at the actual solutions that y'all are calling for, but so quickly that we can use these tools to criminalize people that are poor. Uh, also with the concept of limits, we seem to have a really hard time limiting things like the cost of rent or arbitrary evictions, but we're really good at limiting access to public spaces for people that can't afford either of those things, housing or even potentially a car to live in. Uh, when we have places where people park in their cars and I suggest things like providing resources so they don't dump things in our ecosystem, I met with resistance talking about how it will destroy the ecosystem and then we don't take any action and now those cars are still parked there dumping into our ecosystem because we haven't taken any action because we can't enforce them because of laws that are not in our control to enact. Like, it blows my mind with regards to what we're doing and I'm at this, this 
precipice, this crossroads of do I fall in line with everyone else because it's the politically safe thing for me to do? There are people in this audience right now that if I vote on this will go and spread, in my opinion, a, a false narrative because I am here to support the community. Now, is removing people forcefully from a beach without any guaranteed place for shelter supporting the community? It's supporting a portion of the community. It's supporting maybe your interests, but it's not supporting the community as a whole because we found through science that the larger the economic divide, the less beneficial a community is. So what are we doing to deal with our wealth gaps? What are we doing to deal with our housing crisis? What are we doing to deal with our exorbitant rents or our lack of living wages or all of these other issues that are compounding and impacting homelessness? So we'll see what happens when the vote comes, but I really hate that A, we've created the situation, that B, we've put ourselves in this position, and that C, that there are people on this body that are so ready to move to criminalize uh, poverty. So, thank you. Okay, unless I see any other additional comments, I guess I'll just conclude by saying these are always difficult topics. This is always a difficult topic to have agendized. These are complicated issues, as Councilmember Glover um, brought up, just the, the compounding social constraints that are happening within our city and within our nation and beyond. And um, at times we're stuck in really difficult decisions and um, we want to be in a proactive space and at times we also have to enact um, policy that's going to to uh, respect and respond to some of the issues that are before us at this time right now. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just go ahead and call the vote and we'll vote as we see appropriate as individuals. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, that, and Councilmember Myers, if I can't get your vote, I heard earlier that you supported the motion. Oh, she, she said yes, she supported, okay. Okay, so we have Councilmember Myers, Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself um, voting in support, and Councilmember Crone voting in support, with Councilmember Glover voting against. Um, that will conclude our evening agenda, and we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time.